the season premiere of Ice Pilots NWT. I don't even remember being there that day. Joe fights the feds. It's total intimidation. Justin and his crew are stranded in the high Arctic. All our circuit breakers blew last night. With the plane frozen solid. Minus 90. Can the crew stave off disaster? It's gonna get worse when there's a blizzard coming. In the vast Canadian north, tiny settlements are scattered across the Barrens, isolated, cut off. Up here, many rely on one man to deliver their food and supplies. So you to get home? Can, can I go slow? Joe McBrien. Airman and chairman of Buffalo Airways, based in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Now in its 40th year, Joe's company flies planes from a bygone era. Powered by piston-driven engines, these planes were built before the jet age. Made to fight in World War II. Heavy. Powerful. Overbuilt. Designed to withstand shrapnel. They're the tanks of aviation. Now, their battlefield is the Arctic. This is no place for the faint-hearted. Uh, a little bit of smoke uh, popping out of the exhaust, black smoke. We are having an uh, engine issue. Joe's young pilots face dangers they never dreamed of in flight school. Boy, Icy airstrips. Blinding weather. Terrain, terrain, pull up. And insane cold. Joe's mechanics tackle impossible repairs in the harshest conditions. The temperature out here, Gord? Minus 38. Rocks doing oils like a minus 30. I can't feel my feet. But they keep the Buffalo fleet in top shape, no matter what. Well, you don't have to join the Army or the Navy to get an experience like this. You just got to join Buffalo Airways. Yeah. Protection, no. There's no other airline on Earth like Joe's. Buffalo is as original as this 65-year-old former Bush pilot who calls the shots. Buffalo would not exist without my father. And there's no one, no one in the six billion other people out there that could run it. But it's a family business. In the Yellowknife hangar, Joe's sons Mikey and Rod scramble to keep up with their maverick dad. It's these great, big, crazy ideas, and they we all help them to make them happen, you know, just like we're following our leader. He's the general. We can't dispatch an airplane until we get this sorted out. Somebody's got to be charged from start to finish. And they've got to show me they know how to do it. I'm going to smear my personality around a little bit, and I'm going to take the rest of the day off. Those that don't like it can go on the bus. Can I see both of you guys? This is a lot of stress for one man. He's just, just keeping it all together. Just just keeping the company flying. And in the frigid Arctic, the odds are stacked against him. It's before dawn on the tarmac. One of Joe's DC-4 crews preps for an urgent mission. The captain for this run is Justin Simley. At 29, Justin already has thousands of hours of stick time. 
This is fun flying. Eh? He flies nearly every plane in the Buffalo fleet. Hey, Justin. Yes, sir. Justin's become Joe's go-to pilot for the toughest jobs. And this is one of them. With a severe recession, Buffalo had to bid low to clinch this contract. We had to jump on this one at a cost that we really had to look at. So it was a skinny margin for profit. So skinny that if Justin can't complete the 2,900 kilometer trip in one day, the job will cost Buffalo money. They'll burn almost $40,000 of fuel alone. The mission calls for Justin and his crew to pick up an 8,000-pound generator in the hamlet of Joe Haven on the Arctic coast. All night radio, good morning, it's Buffalo 5 -7. And deliver it to Whale Cove on the shore of Hudson Bay. All set. All set. In the Arctic, there's no electrical grid linking settlements. The villages rely on big local generators to keep them alive. If the generators fail, a blackout can mean no heat and no light in the long, cold Arctic night. What if I can get the airplane around and get it home and do the job safely? I'm happy. It's 1,100 kilometers from Yellowknife to Joe Haven to pick up the generator, 700 kilometers from there to Whale Cove to deliver it, and 1,100 kilometers back home. That's a lot of flying in a single day. By the time the sun comes up, the DC-4 is well on the way to its first stop, Joe Haven. Justin's co-pilot today is Sean Barry, in his sixth year at Buffalo. The engineer on board is Adam Smith. He grew up at Buffalo. His late father was chief pilot. Grabbing a quick nap, the fourth member of the crew is ramp hand, Andrew Veit. It's been three hours since takeoff, and they're flying problem free. But just outside Joe Haven, Look at that, 16 miles out of Joe, just outside of there. The crew hits low lying ice fog, a dense layer of ice crystals that completely obscures the Joe Haven airstrip. When we reached the coast, we saw some fog, and at uh, which time we called and uh, got the weather from Arctic Radio. Buffalo 5718, Arctic Radio, Joe Haven, 100 foot ceiling. They advised us uh, Joe Haven was uh, severely reduced visibility. Although they have instruments to guide them, they can't land unless they can see the runway from a minimum of 300 feet above. Justin lowers the DC-4 into the fog to see if they can break through. One and a half miles to the runway. They're flying blind as they descend, hoping to get close enough to the ground for a clear view of the runway. One mile. That is a terrible fog, man. At 300 feet, Justin still can't break through the whiteout. It's too risky to try to land. Justin throttles the DC-4 back up above the fog. All right, well, let's start looking for an alternate, boys. Let's get on the horn. Arctic radio, Arctic radio, level 5718. Justin needs to find a nearby airstrip with clear visibility where he can land his big DC-4, and fast, before this mission becomes a bust. Whale Cove was once a self-sufficient Inuit community that lived off the land around Hudson Bay. Today, it depends on a steady supply of electricity. And now, it needs a backup generator to help it survive the brutal Arctic winter. But Buffalo Airways' mission to pick up the power unit and deliver it to Whale Cove has hit a major obstacle. That is a terrible fog, man. Thick ice fog, preventing the crew from landing at Joe Haven, where the generator awaits. Well, that sucks. 
DC-4 Captain Justin Simley could turn around and head back to Buffalo HQ, but that would mean giving up. So he scrambles for a plan B. Well, let's start looking for an alternate place. An alternate landing strip. With their limited fuel, they'll need to find somewhere close by. Let's get on the horn. Let's get to Loyola, Cambridge. Arctic Radio, Arctic Radio, Buffalo 5718. Tolujuak, also known as Toloyuak, is 140 kilometers east of Joe Haven. Cambridge Bay is 370 kilometers away. But if the whole coast is socked in, Justin may have to abort this mission and head home. 17 Zulu, Toloyuak. They receive a weather report for Toloyuak. Visibility 1-5. Clear skies. Okay, let's go to Toloyuak, okay boys? Unable to pick up the generator, they head empty-handed for Toloyuak and cross their fingers the delay will be short. Here down before landing check this place. Here's Noyuak. Landing checks for completion. Alright, thank you. Full flat. Flat set. Final checks. Toloyuak, population 800, is above the 69th parallel. It's the northernmost community on the Canadian mainland. Up here, in minus 30, the engines will freeze solid in an hour, so the crew gets busy. Um, plug in the engines, uh, ceramic heaters, and uh, basically you can get a, a ceramic heater when you have for your house. This is a little thing. Uh, and you basically just put it inside the engine by the uh, cylinders and uh, they'll keep them at uh, you know 20 degrees or so and then plug in the oils as well little pin heaters in the oil tanks uh, keep the oil nice and liquid now all Justin and the crew can do is wait and hope the fog over Joe Haven just a half hour away clears very soon It's very important that we get it done in a timely fashion because that's what our customers are going to expect. This unscheduled pit stop has compromised the entire plan. They missed Joe Haven on their first leg, and uh, that right there put them behind. You burn a little extra fuel. Inside the Toloyoak Airport terminal, Justin and co-pilot Sean recalculate the fuel needs for the next legs of the mission. 120 miles is what we need. Powered by piston engines, the DC-4 runs only on aviation gas, or avgas, unlike modern turbine-powered aircraft, which run on jet fuel. 20 drums it is. You cool with that? Yep. Okay. Their diversion has used up precious fuel, and there's no avgas available at Toloyuak. Avgas for a DC-4 is uh, always challenging to find in the north, especially as time goes on. It seems there's less and less of it shipped in. Luckily, Justin has come prepared. I chose to take 15 drums of uh, aviation fuel with us in the aircraft. The crew begins pumping avgas into the DC-4 wing tanks one drum at a time. It's a reality of flying vintage planes that use nearly obsolete gas. Pilots often carry extra drums of highly combustible fuel in the cargo hold. plan to uh, go back to Joe Haven when the weather's good, load a generator, go to Whale Cove, drop it off, and that's if everything works out. Soon, a lucky break. <laughs> the fog has lifted over Joe Haven. They still have a good chance of getting the generator to Whale Cove by end of day, if nothing else goes wrong. Back in Yellowknife, boss Joe McBrien has a legal battle on his hands. The hard part of dealing with, with transport is you deal at different levels. He's been fined by government regulator Transport Canada and is meeting with his lawyer about fighting it. But so we got 27 passengers. Leaving the 28 for the flight attack. Yes, That's the actual day that it occurred. Buffalo has been charged with operating its scheduled DC-3 flight with too many passengers on board. Joe's daughter Kathy has come up from Hay River to help. Transfer Canada and our battles with them are always stressful. Really, it would seem if you count souls on board, it'd be 28. But the plus one, the infant, yeah. isn't, doesn't take a seat. Well, I don't even remember being there that day, so I can't even help you. I mean, it's a really yeah. odd mm -hmm. system. 
They, yeah. They, yeah. they investigate, they, they make a decision, and then they impose a sentence with incomplete evidence, in my view, because they're judge and jury. Maverick Joe thinks the feds look for reasons to come down hard on Buffalo. It's an intimidation, a total intimidation. They do not treat us as working together. They treat us as if we're in a lockup and they're wearing the uniform. What you're telling me what is that a group of people were out to get you, and, and I think you've got a reasonable set of facts that would support that contention. Joe's independent northern style has clashed with the southern bureaucracy for years, but he's developed a unique way of handling his frustrations. People go out for therapy, they run or they swim or they crochet. I clean up cat shit. Especially, I like cleaning cat shit and germ transport Canada safety audits. They send me all this hate mail about all the things I'm doing wrong. And I scoop it all up and I read through it and I sort out the good and I sort out the bad and I try and keep some of the old. Meanwhile, Justin and his crew have left Toloyuak and land as originally intended in Joe Haven to pick up the 8,000-pound generator. Back up. But with less than an hour of true daylight so far north this time of year, it's dark by early afternoon. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? That's the question. A long day? Yeah, it's turning into one, but, you know. They're four hours behind schedule. The crew will have to rush to get the generator on board if there's any hope of completing their delivery today. The pressure is on Justin to come through for Joe. Moving these generators around, you know, I've been doing it for almost 10 years. Uh, it's not easy. Just last winter, when the power went out at Rankin Inlet, Justin tried to fly an emergency generator to the community. Whoa. But he and his crew couldn't fit it on the DC-4. This ain't gonna fly, boys. We can't get her in the floor here. And the mission was scuttled. I'm done with this generator tonight. Justin is determined not to have that happen again. It always works. It's intense. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So uh, your eyes have to be everywhere. You got to trust your crew, and uh, and uh, and everything's got to be right. But everything is not right. They can't find a way to get it through the door. How's that door now? Just missing. Are we gonna miss it? Okay. The clock is ticking, and the generator is stuck halfway inside the plane. No, no, work. Yeah, it can be pretty tricky for sure. It's inches and angles, man. But Justin doesn't have an inch to spare. He's gotta come in straighter. This angle thing isn't working. They back out the generator again and line it up for a third try. This time, Adam uses the pallet jack to slide the generator on board. This pallet jack may be at the end of this. The crew ratchets the 8,000-pound generator into position in the cargo hold with the winch, chains, and rollers. After hours of effort in the freezing cold, it's securely in place. But now, it's too late to travel. We were coming to the end of our duty day, and, uh, and we were going to call her quits for the night. The generator won't get to Whale Cove today as planned, leaving the community without a backup power supply. It's the only decision Justin can make. But Joe just wants it delivered on time. On, on a trip like that, I, I'm not uh, I'm not counting the margin. I'm counting the it's a time sensitive article that we're moving. Justin and the crew put the DC-4 to bed. In minus 40, it's vital to keep the plane's four engines warm overnight. We tested the heaters. The heaters had been working for three hours. Uh, we had the oil heaters plugged in the 30 amp breakers. We had the ceramic heaters for the front plugged in the 20 amp breakers and uh, everything was working fine. 
But when Justin wakes up the next morning, his nightmare continues. Everything's frozen. <laughs> Engines, batteries inside. Morning in Joe Haven in the high Arctic. A tiny settlement on King William Island in the middle of endless ice and pounding winds. At breakfast, Buffalo Airways Captain Justin Simley has just dropped a bombshell on his DC-4 crew. Our heaters seem to have uh, stopped working last night on the airplane, so the airplane is frozen. Their mission yesterday was to deliver an 8,000-pound generator to Whale Cove, 700 kilometers away, and be back in Yellowknife last night. But weather scuttled that plan. Now this. Everything's frozen. <laughs> Engines, batteries inside. Everything's frozen. Basically, now you got a uh, 70,000 pound ice cube. They thought they had it covered. Last night, the crew placed electric ceramic heaters in each engine compartment and plugged in electric probes in the oil tanks to keep the oil above zero degrees. But overnight, the circuit breaker for the oil probes blew. Of course, if you're going to plug in a four-engine airplane to a chintzy old circuit breaker, of course it's going to blow. So uh, you're going to have to go gather some heaters and get the airplane on the line. It won't be easy warming over 300 liters of frigid oil so that it flows properly in the DC-4's four engines. I'm out here on this trip. Today is 30, 40 below, and coming out here with the wind chill, this is a new experience, and it's freaking cold. <laughs> The crew springs into action. They manage to borrow two frost fighters, heaters usually used to warm up the plane's interior, not defrost engines that are frozen solid. The crew will blow heat on the engine cylinders and oil tanks in an attempt to raise the oil temperature enough to make the oil more fluid. Risking a cold start when engine oil is thick as glue could deprive thousands of moving parts of lubrication, causing the engine to seize up. The cold start has oil starvation. The oil doesn't flow to the main bearings in the engine, and you're just playing with the time bomb now. But there's a snag right off the bat. One of the frost fighters won't start. With only one working heater, Justin doesn't stand a chance. Back in the cozy comfort of the Buffalo hangar, word of Justin's problems hit the floor. I don't think anybody's got any good news. Buffalo's veterans are shaking their heads at this one. I've been working in the Arctic now for over 27 years. And the best friend you have when you go up north is called a Herman Nelson. A Herman Nelson is a diesel-fired heater that blasts air hot enough to bake a cake. Like, there's a difference between a frost fighter and a Herman Nelson. Herman Nelson will put the heat out like 400 degrees if you know what you're doing, eh? Problem is, Justin didn't bring one or a ground power unit to help start the airplane. I didn't take uh, Herman Nelson in a power unit because I had three new engines on the airplane. I didn't know how much fuel they were going to burn. Instead of taking uh, Herman in a power unit, I took five extra drums of aviation fuel in case we needed it. With three new overhauled engines, fuel burn rates can be hard to predict. Still, if I was going, the choice would be the Herman Nelson. You don't want to rely on other people's equipment, but uh, uh, you know, you don't want to run out of gas either. Justin finally gets the frost fighter working, but using a frost fighter to thaw frozen engines is like trying to cook a hot dog with a lighter. Frost fighters are just, they're like a lukewarm heater. Does any pilot ever think he makes a mistake? No. Justin probably wish he would have brought a heater, but he may not think he made a mistake. I'm not sure. You know, we haven't had any good trips in quite a while because the economy's been so slow. The first trip turns into a total disaster. Hey. Justin is stuck in the high Arctic with only two borrowed frost fighters at his disposal. It'll take him and his crew all day to find out whether they can loosen up the engines enough to start. Wait, wait, wait. Later in Yellowknife, word of the problem reaches Joe. My father, growing up in the north, uh, 
basically was a one-man show when it came to aircraft, so he was fully responsible. Um, he wasn't too happy that the airplane froze up. No, I've never frozen up an airplane because it's like a farm. What you do at night is what you get in the morning. So I make sure the cows are all inside the fence before I go to sleep. The golden rule of the Arctic, they broke it. They didn't take their backup system. I wouldn't have left the ground without it myself. I was appalled to find out they didn't have it on board. If you don't have a backup, you don't have a plan. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a sacrilege. That's like peeing in the church or, or swearing at the mass. Uh, you don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, you don't go to the Arctic without your winter gear. He just can't stand the fact that we said we are going to do something, and for no real good reason did uh, we get it done properly. I mean, that's kind of a joke. I mean, the amount of experience we have, it's, it's like a um, polar bear that can't swim. So cigarettes, you smoke them when you need them, eh? Only when pilots piss me off. But there's little Joe can do, and things are getting even worse for Justin. Uh, looks like it's gonna get worse before it gets better. There's a blizzard coming from the Cambridge area. It's coming at us at about 30 knots, so we're gonna get some high winds tonight. We're gonna have to leave the heaters on all night, and then we'll just uh, cycle the heaters through each engine, uh, like one heater for one hour on each engine. Justin wrangles a small generator and fuels it up to get some power to the plane and charge its onboard batteries. The heating pad right there, get nice and warm. I'm gonna keep the side of the batteries all toasty warm. That Christ. Damn. What we did is we took our time. We thawed the engines and made sure we weren't going to damage them in starting because the last thing you want to do is take off out of Joe Haven and have an engine failure on rotation or something like that. After hours of pumping lukewarm air into the engines, a sign of progress. <laughs> yeah, it's warm enough. Justin is able to move one of the propellers. But taking off to Whale Cove tonight is still out of the question. Any chance of making a profit on this charter is now officially dead. Justin and the crew will have to keep heating the plane through the night. But can they stay awake to make sure the engines don't freeze again? It's 40 below in the middle of the night on the Arctic coast. Buffalo Airways DC-4 Captain Justin Simley catches a few minutes of shut-eye in the airport lounge while the other crew members babysit the airplane. We'll have to get a little closer. To keep it from turning into a giant icicle like it did last night. They can't afford to have that happen again. We all decided to uh, stay at the terminal and, uh, and just alternate in shifts. Have a good night. And monitoring engine temperatures. Number three is about zero. Number two is about minus 10 now, and uh, one is just a dip below zero. So we're trying to keep them at zero or above it right now. The crew must keep the oil in all four engines above zero degrees Celsius to have any hope of starting their frozen DC-4. Adam and Sean borrow a local truck to get food. I spent $119 on groceries to last me in the night because we're in the middle of nowhere called Joe Haven. This is where the Franklin Expedition wintered, though. Joe Haven was the last known location of the lost Franklin Expedition. In 1850, Franklin and his men sailed on to their deaths from starvation and possible lead poisoning. And 50 years later, Norwegian polar explorer Roald Amundsen wintered in his ship, the Joe, in this harbor for almost two years, just before he navigated what Franklin was looking for, the elusive Northwest Passage. When Adam and Sean return to keep watch, Andrew finishes his shift and heads back to the terminal with a report for Justin. Justin, what's that? Uh, all, the, all the engines, they're holding their heat above zero, yeah. the oils, except for number two. When you get on these jobs, it's just you and your crew and your airplane, and that's all you got. That's brisk, baby. Once we got the engines warmed up, then the uh, trick overnight was to keep them warm enough to start in the morning by maintaining their heat. If Justin tries to start the four engines when they're below zero degrees Celsius and the oil is thick, he could wreck them in an instant. Just checking to see if the 
cylinder heads are warm or not. Number one is uh, is still pretty good, still pretty loose, but uh, number two is uh, starting to cool down on us. So Justin and the crew move a frost fighter heater from the number four engine that's holding temperature to the number two engine that needs to be brought back up. They've been doing this dance all night. Hurry the f up, it's like minus 90. We took turns swapping the heaters around and monitoring the temperatures and pulling the tents in the Arctic and uh, in those temperatures and that wind is tough work. And risky. At minus 40, exposed skin freezes in seconds. But to have any chance of delivering their cargo, an 8,000 pound generator, in the morning, they've got to keep the engines above freezing. We'll run it on two for an hour and then switch it over to one. That's good, Ed. Okay. The DC-4 crew never expected to see one morning here, let alone two. They've made it through the bitter winter night of blowing winds and minus 40 temperatures, but have the engines. Number one first. We'll start number one, then we'll go to... Holy f You got frostbite yet? Once we have all engines started, somebody's gonna have to pull the tail post. I'll do it. Ready? could be a lot worse. <laughs> we survived the night, 30 knot winds, Arctic blizzard, not a lot of fun. Managed to keep the airplane warm enough to start, so still blowing like a bastard out there, but this is gonna work. It better. If the engines don't start, Justin will be out of options. Next comes engine three. It starts no problem. We're in good shape. Cylinder head temperatures, we've got one, three, and four started. We're waiting on two. Engine number two is the coldest engine. Kicks in. Justin has all four engines roaring. An amazing recovery from 24 hours ago. Justin had to make sure that those engines were warm enough to start. I mean, they wouldn't have been coming home. They wouldn't have finished the trip. It would have went from bad to really, really bad. Really bad, as in four seized up engines on a crippled plane a thousand kilometers from home. But Justin was careful. Okie dokie. Hard break set line up there. Now the DC-4 is ready to roll. Stay on the top. Okay. At last, they leave Joe Haven on their way to the waiting community of Whale Cove. DC rotate. I was just holding on for a second. Oh, this wants to go. Gear up. But their mission to deliver the generator isn't over yet. Really? I've been here since 20 to 12. Still upset at Justin for the DC-4 freeze-up in the Arctic, Joe's in a prickly mood in the Yellowknife hangar. No man came in today and it wasn't a good scene. That was pretty rough. What are they doing in LFR? Since Justin's charter is still not back, Joe's directing his frustration at Mikey about a maintenance mix-up in the hangar. Can you quit screaming in your phones? I can hear you. 
flips right out because with the 15 minutes I was gone, they took PNR and they're going to put WZS in. PNR and WZS are the call numbers for two of Buffalo's DC-3s. WZS is in the hangar, PNR is not in the hangar. Have you been to work today? He came in all guns a-blazing, accusing me of uh, not being at work and not knowing what was going on. And who makes that decision? Mikey rushes back to the hangar to sort things out and gets in the line of fire. Joe is tough to please, but that's how he's kept Buffalo flying safely for 40 years. He's got such a reputation for being so volatile and so mean and stuff like that. And I've seen him make grown men cry. It's how it is here. It's just the slightest thing will set him off. With the economy in the doldrums and his business down, Joe's stress level is high. Um, I believe it's uh, a whole thing about it being slow right now. There's no real work. It's his, his planes, his company, and when I mean, you think about the stress that he'd be under, how many aircraft flying around the Arctic, how many young pilots, and then he's got, you know, 200 employees. He's worried about the jobs, worried that he's going to find work for them, worried about their families. And having a charter that's now costing him money by running two days behind schedule isn't helping. It's all on Joe's shoulders. I think that uh, the wrong name for Buffalo is Buffalo. I think it should be called Joe and then people would understand a little bit better. Meanwhile, further north, the waylaid DC-4 charter seems to be back on course. Joe Haven at 1745, question the latest Whale Cove weather. It's headed for Whale Cove on the western shore of Hudson Bay with a new generator for the settlement. Frostbitten and exhausted, the pilots finally have the Whale Cove runway in sight. On the end, on the deck. My throttles now, it's all the mixtures. My own are good. Mixtures cut. Two and three back up now. Two and three back up. Well done, Shine. Five seven two zero. Check you down at two zero zero three. Welcome to Whale Cove. The crew wastes no time tenting the engines, but there's nowhere to plug them in, so they're going to cool down quickly. By the time the engines are covered, dusk descends over the tarmac and the temperature plunges. The tired crew has no more than one hour to get the 8,000-pound generator off the plane before the engines freeze up again. It's a race against time and the cold. Okay. But Justin needs to keep his head. He directs two loaders simultaneously to ease out the generator. It's a tight squeeze, and there is no room for error. Came in uh, lengthwise, picked it up, uh, positioned the other loader to uh, suspend the piece when it came out. You hook the generator up to the first loader that's going to pull it out the door on an angle, and you position the second loader uh, to catch it as it comes out the door. A fumble in the transfer from one forklift to the other could send the 8,000-pound generator crashing to the ground. Because you're putting uh, cold steel onto cold steel, um, there's always the potential to have the generator slide off the forks. You, you can damage the airplane pretty badly if you screw this up, so it's got to be right. It's a slow, careful process. But with the engines getting colder by the minute, there's no time to waste. Finally, mission accomplished. The people of Whale Cove have a backup generator to keep the lights burning. We had a few uh, bumps along the road, but uh, at the end of the day, the job got done, and it got done safely. And uh, that's what we're all about. But Justin's problems are far from over. He's about to go head to head with Buffalo Joe. There's no defense. It's the day of reckoning for the DC-4 crew just back from delivering a generator two days late. We planned for one day. It took three days. You can imagine that's a lot more overhead than we planned. Pilots Justin Simley and Sean Barry have been called into a meeting with Buffalo Joe, and everyone expects sparks to fly. I get paid to make tough decisions, 
Uh, sometimes the guy that signs my paycheck isn't happy with him. He went down his street, now I get to go down mine. And we're both one-way streets. We're all present. We got everybody into the room. Everyone was kind of tense, waiting for the old man to flip out. You cannot, at this time of year, go in the Arctic without a plan, then the backup plan. It's like me saying, OK, did you got your parka, you got your boots, you got your mitts? You got your ear flaps, you got dry ones, you got an extra change of clothes when you get wet, you got some dry socks. But you got to think about this, you're going to get yourself killed out there, froze to death. I'm not very happy when that kind of thing happens with my airplane and our name on it, sitting on, a, on an Arctic airport, frozen. How did the decision come not to take Herman Nelson to GPU? The airplane's got to have it. The word I get on the phone is we couldn't take it because of our landing weight at Wilco. You want to take 180 pound Herman Nelson, throw the, throw Francis overboard, whatever his name is, Andrew. He's 180 pounds. There's your Herman Nelson. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I respect Joe's opinion. Like, okay, he spent yeah. 40 years building this company, and it hasn't been from sitting on his hands. Justin's strategy of just no staying quiet no and listening no um, is the only way you can get through the meeting. Like, I mean, there was no other option. How? Can you make good decisions when the shit's against the wall? When you're 24 hours late, you're cold, you're tired, fatigued from trying to keep that airplane warm, you can't make good decisions in a cold airplane. Instead of him yelling and screaming like usual, I think he said, hey, how can we make this better? That next day, it did a great job of getting the airplane out of there, and getting over there and getting the job done. But it's not under the conditions you should be flying under, right? I relied on them to do it. I, I didn't personally go out and walk on board the airplane and, and count the ABCs to see if they had everything. But ultimately, I'm responsible. Joe knows what it's like on the front lines and how pilots can get into trouble. You, gotta, you guys got to guarantee me yeah, that you will not leave Yellowknife after September without Herman Nelson and GPU. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I'll probably be more aware and, and be more more involved in, in when they put all the equipment together to go and do a job. Yeah, I know. Can't it all. Joe's flown the Arctic for almost yeah, half a century, and he wants his pilots to fly that long, too. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, a fire alarm on the C-46 4,000 feet up and no way out. It's only a matter of time. Metal, magnesium, everything burns. So how many buildings have burnt down? A Christmas disaster sends Kelly into action. Welcome back to holy <laughs> And a high altitude emergency. Engine failure in midair. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Fire alarm on the C-46. 4,000 feet up and nowhere to go. We got the fire warning light. So how many buildings have burnt down? A remote town explodes into flames. And high altitude emergency. An engine fails in midair. Welcome back to holy <laughs> This is what pilots in the far north do for fun in the dead of winter. Buffalo Airways Captain A.J. DeCoast fights low temperatures with high adrenaline. I don't know, I'm not as haywire as you might think on the sled. I like to play around a little bit. AJ loves his sled. But he's a fiend for the thing. I mean, he burned through a track in a year. I think he'll do about 120 miles an hour, or how fast it'll go. Those are ideal conditions and stuff like that. So it rips pretty good. 
Just nine months ago, AJ and Candace were married in Yellowknife's landmark ice castle. And in the fall, Ooh, you're going wild for us. their daughter Amanda was born. The first time I held my baby daughter, it was just a feeling that I can't even describe with words. It was I wept when I saw when she was born. He's enjoying being a dad, that's for sure. Did you discover anything new? But marriage and fatherhood haven't tamed AJ's passion for powerful machinery. It's what pulls him to Buffalo Airways' vintage fleet of World War II piston pounders. For anyone who likes uh, Harley Davidson's as far as the, the sound that they make. We're going to, you know, stock car races, just the sound of the power. Sound goes right through your chest, eh? Yeah, it's an amazing feeling. I feel privileged to be able to do what I'm doing. AJ loves the thrill of being a pilot. I mean, what better airplanes to fly on than old World War II airplanes that may or may not make it to their destination. But on this December morning, a week before Christmas, AJ has to decide if it's even worth the risk to head out. He's got an urgent delivery, and the weather looks like it's taking a turn for the worse. The wind's blowing out of the northwest at 53 knots, so that's pretty quick. At 6,000, it's 57 knots. The mission? Head 500 kilometers southwest to the First Nations community of Nahanni Butte, home to only about 100 people. The town needs a new floor for their community gym. And they need it in time for their Christmas celebrations. The only way to get them that much wood is by air. The only plane that can tackle the job? The Douglas DC-3. While it's smaller than Buffalo's other planes, the DC-3 is just right for this job. Its big wings give it great lift, allowing for slow approach speeds. That means it needs a lot less runway to land on than most planes, as little as 800 meters, exactly the length of the airstrip in Nahani Butte. It's the only way to get that much wood to the community in the narrow window before Christmas. But the DC-3 isn't pressurized, so it can't fly as high as a modern plane. If a weather system is too low, AJ will be flying right in it. Today, there's some big, low clouds moving toward his destination. I don't think that it's going to be, the conditions up there would be that bad. I think we'd probably climb up above it and be fine. AJ decides he can make it. But as the crew preps his plane, the bad weather hits Yellowknife. Yeah, the weather here is not actually that great. Uh, well, it's just uh, heavy snow right now. Yeah, this is definitely, I'd say, the beginning of the winter. But conditions still look good at his destination, so AJ's going ahead. Check 3007, taxi. AJ and co-pilot Ian Bottomley want to leave the bad weather behind them. Just gonna start easing her down. She kind of wants to kind of ease down a little bit. But the storm clouds are following them, which could make landing this plane impossible. Meanwhile, over at Buffalo Cargo, manager Kelly Jurasevich has her own loads to get airborne. Well, we got two planes coming to you, my honey. You have frozen and then all your non-food mail and your chips. Okay, okay, bye, buddy. My love, I'm in the good books. And Kelly goes the extra mile and, and, and is really customer-based, and which is really good, and that's why people like her all through the Mackenzie Valley. Go into the plane, 
to help push. But going that extra mile, whether it's being den mother to Buffalo staff, or getting food and essential supplies to her remote customers, Kelly takes it all on, and the stress is killing her. After her husband quit Buffalo in the spring, Kelly considered following him out the door. Yeah, I want to get somewhere where we can have our farm again, because Juan and I were really happy when we did that. But she finally decided to stay with the company. I like the people up north, so I wasn't going to stay, but I changed my mind because I just couldn't quit. Now Christmas is coming up fast. Kate, you're good, Jeff. And the workload is overwhelming. This and that, the phone's ringing off the hook, people missing this, that shit, and I get stressed out, the first thing I do is start smoking. A pack and a half a day habit that recently sent her straight to the emergency room. They took chest x-rays right away. They found out that I have second stage emphysema. If I go into third stage, that's oxygen. I'm on a tank right away. My lungs can't heal. They will never get better. Seeing Kelly like this is, is very hard. She is a real mother to a lot of people. And to see her mom sick at any point is very hard. Good afternoon, Buffalo. And Kelly has even more on her mind. I can't believe you're going to be a dad any day. Oh, my god. Her son and daughter-in-law in Calgary are about to have a baby, oh. Kelly's second grandchild. I thought she was telling me she was on the way to the hospital, so tell her not to move. She needs to lay down and give me a couple of days here. She needs to deal with today's load fast Hello. so she can fly down to be with her family for the birth. Why does my cell phone die right in the middle of that? This family milestone is making her think hard about her health. I don't want, you know, my grandkids not to have grandma, or my kids not to have a mom, because I know what it's like. She died when I was seven years old, and I don't even remember her. When I think of it like that, then I just want to hit myself for, why am I smoking? Like, because I never want my kids not to have a mom. Back on the DC-3, AJ reaches the last leg of the flight. But there's a problem. Get over the big lawyer. The ice clouds are following them from Yellowknife, bringing low visibility and frosting up the windshield. Yeah, I'm gonna just dip her down a little bit there. Good to you. AJ tries to dip below the clouds. I don't know, my plan, it looked like it was gonna work, but may not, so. And to make it down to the Nahanni airstrip, they have to see exactly where they're going. At a modern airport, navigation aids like lights and electronic beacons would guide a pilot in through bad weather. Onboard computers could sync up and land the plane automatically. Not here. Uh, we're kind of coming in uh, from this direction here, and uh, there's no nav aids in the handy view whatsoever. Uh, the strip's only about, I don't know, 40 to 50 wide, so pretty narrow. That's about half the width of a big city runway, and a quarter the length. It's barely wide or long enough for the DC-3 to land. So AJ has to touch down right on the brink of the strip. He'll have to put it down on a dime. The weather's not super hot. There's uh, no approach in there, no runway lights there, so no approach lights, nothing like that. Hemmed in by mountains, AJ has to get on the perfect vector for the approach, guided only by his own two eyes. Right now, he can't see a thing. And over in the big layer. Surrounded by ice clouds, Buffalo pilot AJ DeCoast is feeling his way down toward a narrow strip of frozen runway somewhere below his DC-3. If AJ can't see his target on approach, there's no way he can land. Yeah, I'm gonna just dip her down a little bit there. Go ahead. Good to you. But just when it seems like there's no chance... Yeah, the sun cut melt off all the ice for us. We uh, got a bit of it off there with the alcohol, but then now uh, the sun will get the rest of it off for us. 
But he still has big challenges below. He has to thread through the valley, then land on an airstrip that is barely long enough for the DC-3's minimum landing specs. Even worse, the strip is only half as wide as any strip where he's put down this plane before. I'm going to hug the hill, and then over the field, and then to do the kind of like an S turn. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Major airports have runways up to 3,000 meters long. This one is only a quarter of that. With zero room for error, AJ weaves around the hill, getting a visual on every inch of ground around the narrow strip. He needs to hit it dead right. You're just wanting to do everything perfect. You're wanting to slow down just at the right time. Uh, you don't want to be at all fast. You don't want to be at all slow. You just want to be right on. So you're just so focused. Like we got the runway in sight. That's it. <laughs> That's where we're landing, man. Well, it looks even smaller than advertised. Now that he knows what he's dealing with, AJ will circle back to try to land. Which way are you going to brute from? I'm just going to make a right turn. You got the runway in sight at all? Uh, just, uh, AJ banks around and lines up, ready for the final descent. Two on final searcher. Coming in at 76, 79. 72, 77. 68. 65. He hits it. Bang on. Any traffic, Buffalo 71 is down and clear. But the thrill of nailing this landing will keep him buzzing long after his wheels hit the ground. You get that adrenaline rush, and when it's all done, you sit there, just kind of vibrate a little bit like that. And uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of jobs that give you that feeling, eh? Nahani Butte has its new flooring and will have its gym repaired in time for Christmas. Yeah. The crew takes off for home. Back in Yellowknife, Kelly is on her way out of town. She's dropped everything to get to Calgary to be with her family for the birth of her second grandchild. It's Henry. Where's Henry? There he is. But right now, her first grandchild, Sophia, has her full attention. Is he hungry? It's so nice to go and be with my family, just for a break, you know, away from here and stuff. And it, like, my little Sophia is so amazing. But there's one person Kelly didn't expect to find at home. Did you get any rest this afternoon? Somewhat. Her daughter-in-law, Carla, has been released from the hospital. Her contractions have stopped, for now. Mama to play. She can play Twinkle Twinkle for me. Away from stress, Kelly hasn't needed a single smoke break. Her daughter, Stacy, wants Kelly to quit for good. She's booked her an acupuncture appointment tomorrow. One of the few quit smoking methods Kelly hasn't tried. Unless she actually does stop smoking, then she probably won't be here for a lot longer. And, you know, she won't be able to watch Sophia grow up, watch her grandkids grow up. But even in her daughter's apartment, Kelly isn't really away from the stress that feeds her habit. Oh, God. Evening, Buffalo. They're just in a hurry, don't give a shit. A crisis at the warehouse sends Kelly straight to her cigarettes. Hopefully tomorrow, for the first time, maybe she can actually have a chance to stop smoking, and that would probably mean everything to me, because to have her here, of course, is the most important thing to me, because she's my mom. Back in Yellowknife, Buffalo General Manager Mikey McBrien gets the call no one there ever wants to get. Uh, we got maintenance code Delta on the left engine, so... Uh... Okay, let me get this straight. You're calling maintenance code Delta on the left-hand engine? Yep. Code Delta, the most serious level of mechanical trouble. The crew on one of Buffalo's trusty 30,000-pound C-46s is trying to make it down with a dead engine. I don't know how long he's been running with a, a bum engine or no engine. Engine failures on the 46 are rare. 
Now, with only the 2,600 horsepower right side engine keeping the big plane in the air, pilot Arnie Schrader and co-pilot Scott Blue have everything riding on a single prop. On a two-engine plane, you know, you don't have any options if the under engine fails. This is a, a test of someone's merit there. This is the extreme. The crew has to steer to compensate for a plane refusing to fly straight and struggling to stay aloft. Imagine blowing a tire at speed on the highway. If you blow a tire, it's going to want to drag to the right. So what you have to do is you steer the airplane three to five degrees into the good engine, and you're going to have to adjust the rudder pedal just ever so slightly as well. Now, they've got three lives riding on getting this 30,000-pound warhorse on the ground with half its power gone. Good. Arnie and Scott guide the wounded bird onto the runway. Crisis averted. Safely on the tarmac, the crew relives the failure. The left engine gave us a couple of backfires. It gave us one, and then about five minutes later, it gave us another one that was a little bit more violent. And then all of a sudden, it just started backfiring continually. This is like a machine gun, coughing, barking, spitting. They're just lucky that their plane wasn't weighed down with freight. Thankfully, we were empty. If we've got a full load, it doesn't really uh, perform all that well. Christmas is less than a week away. Towns up and down the Mackenzie Valley are depending on both the Buffalo C-46s to get their last-minute presents and holiday food. They can't afford to have one become a hangar queen. Well, I'm going to open it up and see how a quick look, yeah? Engineer Adam Smith investigates, searching for a clue to what killed this engine in midair. I think we might have dropped the valve seat. Well, one hell of an intake leak here. They find a massive leak on an intake valve. There's only one solution. They'll have to disconnect and detach the entire engine off the wing and bolt on a new engine and get this plane back in the air to meet the Christmas rush. The next morning in Calgary, Kelly heads to the acupuncture clinic. The hardest part about going out today and doing acupuncture was the unknown. Like, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Acupuncturist Kelly Murphy tries to ease Kelly's worries. I'm just going to, with an alcohol swab, just clean the areas that I'm going to put the needles in. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Acupuncture was bizarre than hell. Dr. Murphy isolates energy points that relieve stress. The other goal, hit energy points that target Kelly's taste buds, make her hate the taste of a smoke. With her face looking like a pin cushion, she tests the theory. Yeah, it tastes a bit different. Not actually horrible, but... I was never a believer in this stuff, but, you know, I can see how it'll work for people. See you, thanks a lot. After removing the needles, Kelly heads home. And in at least one important way, the treatment has helped. I don't know, I just feel different. I feel like a lot of stress is off me. But with work just a phone call away, how long can the new stress-free Kelly really last? Early morning in Yellowknife. And Buffalo owner Joe McBrien is already putting out fires. I got a shitload of freight over there. And we were trying to do it with one airplane. And that other airplane breaks down today, I'm in deep shit. I'm going to have 15 ton of shit sitting over there in the ramp, no airplanes to move it with. Buffalo Joe needs his C-46 in the air, delivering backed up Christmas freight. If not, he's losing money, and the recession is already hurting him. But the new engine isn't ready. Do you want to? Yeah, look here. I see the whole situation kind of sucks. The C-46 engine is designed to power the plane's generator, but for some reason, it's not connecting. So you can put the generator on board. 
they turn to one of their spare engines as a reference. Finally, they narrow it down to a small missing part. This, this coupling. We need that coupling to uh, get the generator to work. They race to install the replacement coupling. This plane is half of Buffalo's C-46 fleet. But it's not ready to fly cargo until Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader takes it for a test flight and pronounces it fit for service. Facing the holiday onslaught, they need that to happen now. 2,000 kilometers south in Calgary. <laughs> what the hell happened? The Fort Good Hope Northern Store is a blaze of fire. <gasps> That's just savage. Fort Good Hope, a regular stop on Buffalo's Valley Run. A suspicious fire fueled by exploding propane tanks is consuming the town's main store, the major source of food and supplies for an isolated population of 600. Buffalo flies vital cargo there every week under Kelly's watch to people she considers close friends. Buffalo's first concern is the massive load in the Yellowknife warehouse. 2,000 pounds of it destined for the northern store tomorrow morning. Now there's nowhere for it to go. OK, I'm going to tell you what you have coming then. Kelly has to jump back into work mode, diverting the load to other towns. Can you take the capacity of their produce and things? You can't, eh? Kelly has made friends with all her far-flung clients up north, and she pleads with them to take the orphan goods. You know what? You guys are so amazing, Lindsay. I'm going to call you right back and find out what the hell we can do. OK, I'll call you guys back. Kelly so makes it fun. work, but there's a deeper problem. There's no food in the community. This is a very, very bad thing. She fears the town's smaller remaining store isn't enough to keep the people fed. We need somebody to organize this and get their asses up there to help this community out. And I don't know who the hell it's going to be, but something has to happen, and something has to happen fast. The next morning on the Buffalo Ram, Kelly's rejig load is ready to go up the Mackenzie Valley. And finally, there's a plane to take it. Hey, Jake, pull him down, rock and roll. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna go for it today. The weather's looking a lot better up at that end of things, so. After a successful test flight yesterday, Arnie has decreed the C-46 is back in action. Today, its final stop will be an emergency delivery of groceries to Fort Good Hope. We were the only source of, you know, supplies going in and out of any size. And obviously a lot of the town supplies and food and household items burnt up and were non-existent anymore. AJ, along with his co-pilot Scott Blue, and Adam as the flight engineer will fly it up the valley. Check mark, clear to take off, calling up Vincent Airborne, Buffalo 327. Filled with holiday freight, the 46 is loaded to its maximum capacity. First delivery stop on the Valley Run is Delaney, about 500 kilometers northwest. For 400 kilometers, it's a smooth flight. But as they prepare for the descent into Delaney, there's low cloud over the entire region. The crew will need to approach low, under the clouds. Then, a bigger problem. We got the fire warning light flickering on number one engine. All of a sudden, everybody's wide awake trying to see why this big buzzer's going off. 
There are two massive tanks of aviation fuel in each wing. And with engines suspended on each wing, an engine fire is as serious as it gets. If it gets into the fuel system, then I mean, there's, you know, about 4,000 pounds of fuel on each side of, uh, of the airplane. So if it can get past that far, well, if you allow it to advance that far, then you haven't really got too much of a, of a chance. If you let the fire get away from yourself, you're going to burn the wing off. And while well, you're flying around, you know, you're 4,000 feet up, and you've now lost one of your wings, uh, that could be a bad day. AJ and the crew know exactly what they're supposed to do. Cut off fuel to the specified engine and isolate any fire before it can spread back to the fuel tanks. If a fire is allowed to spread and those tanks ignite, the explosion could blow the 46 right out of the sky. You have to react quickly. If it was an, if it's an actual fire, it may be a matter of seconds before you have the, uh, the chance to, to stop the fuel to that, to that engine. This is the same plane that landed with the dead engine. This time, it's fully loaded, and the low cloud means they'll be coming in close to the ground. I was concerned that with the weather being as low as it was, if we had shut down that engine, that we might not have been able to go around. If the initial approach isn't perfect, the power of one engine won't be enough to lift this plane back up for a second attempt. We really don't want to shut down that left engine. But can a pilot afford to ignore a fire alarm? Hey, today. On the first leg of a mercy mission, no, no, we got the fire warning light flickering on number one engine. Captain and new father A.J. DeCoast is racing against a possible fire in the engine of the C-46. Well, I'm just having a look here, and I don't see a fire yet. That's what right. I'm, but I'm having, uh, just to like, double check, make sure we don't have anything. I'm confirming, eh? With no visual sign of flames or smoke, A.J. is betting on a false alarm. Possibly an electrical short in the engine. If it was a very light load, then we may have just shut it down right away and taken zero chance that it was a false indication or, or a real indication. With the C-46 fully loaded with Christmas care packages, AJ would rather not risk landing on just one engine. But if there is a fire, things can go bad fast. It's only a matter of time. I mean, metal, magnesium, everything burns. Once you get the oil tank burning or hydraulics, you may lose the ability to control the airplane. No, just be watching out for any developments there. AJ performs like a machine in that kind of situation. He knows the drills. He doesn't even really think about what he's doing. Do you want the lights, or you just call for it with you? I'll call for it. Understood. He just played it cool, and I played it cool with him, and you know, put your fears aside and deal with the situation at hand. AJ and Scott guide the 46 into their low approach to the Delaney Strip. They've got to put it down right on the button. I was relieved step one, I guess, was when we landed the airplane and it was on the ramp, we were shut down. I thought that we did quite well. No fire in the engine, a false alarm, just as AJ suspected. Engineer Adam Smith gets to work looking for the source. See that? It doesn't take long to find. This uh, piece of lock wire right here was grounding from the top of the fire probe all the way over to the firewall, causing our light to go on and our bell to go off and make all kinds of noise, make us think we had a fire. And all it was was a little piece of lock wire. It's good news. The problem was rectified, and we could continue on and, uh, you know, finish our mission for the day. Their next stop, Fort Good Hope. Uh, good morning. We're inbound from Delaney. We're 20 back through 2,100, anticipating landing in six minutes. The crew is bringing vital food and supplies to the fire-ravaged community. Then, as they fly over the town, they see the charred remains of the store, smoke still rising into the air. 
it leaves only one thought on their minds. You know, what can we do to help, you know? Relieve some of the stress on the community and make sure that they had everything they needed. Heavy. On the ground, the rubble of the store still smolders. Just days before Christmas, all the store's employees have lost their jobs. You know, it's been, uh, it's been a difficult week for, for everyone. And the Northern store was much more than just a place to buy groceries. It was home to the community's only postal outlet. So yeah, they lost all their, they lost all their presents that they were getting and that they were gonna get in. That goes back a long ways. It's really quite a loss, you know, and even people from other communities feel it. Like many isolated northern communities, Good Hope was established as part of the fur trade by the Northwest Company in 1805. I mean, that's where the name Fort comes from. And they are a fort, and, and, and these stores were, were all came in the north as a, as a trading post. So you'll hear the old timers say, I got to go into the post which really means town or I got to go to the fort. The Northwest Company merged with the Hudson's Bay Company in 1821. That original trading post evolved into the modern Northern store. Today, once again, under the banner of the Northwest Company. As AJC 46 leaves the smoking remains behind, it's clear that the town will need more than one delivery of groceries to salvage its Christmas. I was up there, I just talked to the people who, who uh, I met up with and, uh, you know, uh, showed my sympathy for them and, you know, offered a helping hand. But uh, they're strong people up there and they seem to manage through it quite well. But right now, AJ's just ready for his long, draining day to be over and to be home with his family. Home sweet home. Is that baby? How are you? There hasn't been an instance yet that has made me think about what it is I'm doing, you know, with respect to having a new baby. And uh, I'm not saying that that couldn't happen, you know, one day at a time. Early the next morning at the hangar, Mikey gets an urgent call. Hey, Kelly. Worried about her friends in Fort Good Hope, Kelly wants Buffalo to step up. I just kind of took it upon myself to ask Joe and ask if people would help them out in the community. I want to give these guys a deal because this is really sad what happened. Although the recession has forced Buffalo to cut every needless expense, Mikey and Joe are ready to donate space on their planes to help. You don't want to make money off somebody else's back when you're down. You can give a lot because they've given you a lot. There's a lot to give back. They decide the first step is sending the person who deals with the locals every day. Our main priority was to get Kelly up there because Buffalo will be a big part of their rebuilding. That's good to see you. Huh? You too, sweetheart. That means Kelly has to head back up north. Well, when I left Calgary, it was very difficult. And I knew I had to come back. But, and of course, the baby wasn't born yet, so that really stressed me out. I love you. But my kids are so understanding and caring that they make it easier for me. Kelly wants to come to the rescue of Fort Good Hope in time to save their Christmas. But the question is, how? Buffalo cargo manager Kelly Jurasevich is heading off to help a town in need. She's made a tough decision, leaving her family in Calgary with her new grandchild yet to be born. It was really difficult to leave my family. But Kelly's compelled to help a community in crisis. The remote Northwest Territories town of Fort Good Hope is devastated by the loss of its main store. Hey. Kelly is here to find out how Buffalo can help. You guys doing okay? Uh, it's coming down a little bit. It's yeah. Darcy Ryan, the Northern Store's manager, and his wife, Kim, are two of Kelly's closest friends out of all her Northern clients. 
They're hit hard by the destruction of their store. Unbelievable. Yeah. A store Darcy had spent over a year renovating and rebuilding. Over here was the post office and our tills. You can sort of see the remnants of our customer service tills. And the blood, sweat, and tears have gone into this store over the past 13 months. Yeah. It's, uh, it's heartfelt to see that gone, right? A lot of hard work. It's freaking horrible. You can still smell it, eh? Yeah. That smell. Next door, at Darcy's house, they relive the night of the fire. Holy look at the freaking, look at the bellow of smoke. Like, it's huge. It's almost like the freaking nuclear bomb went off, for it crying out loud. It went up forever. The cause is still under investigation, but there's no question about the impact. Kelly is more determined than ever to help. By the time Kelly lands in Yellowknife, she has a plan. The owners of the Northern store have donated toys for the kids in Good Hope, but they need help flying the presents up from Yellowknife in time for Christmas, a chance for Buffalo to step up. If you've got something, you can well afford to share. You don't need to keep it all to yourself. We supplied space on the aircraft for donations to go up there, and we donated ourselves some uh, turkeys to go up there. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes we are the turkeys, sometimes we give turkeys. And that sends Kelly on another mission. Turkey's aisle 10. Along with AJ and her brother Jack, she's on a turkey hunt for Fort Good Hope. Six, seven. The care package will provide Christmas dinners to the neediest families. Turkey, so. Oh. Kelly plans to head to Good Hope to help deliver the Christmas load in person. Okay, AJ, thanks, buddy. See you later, Kelly. But before she can head there, she'll have to return to her most stressful place. So welcome back to work. Yeah, welcome back to holy The next morning, she's back at the warehouse. This one, that one, and that one, we're done. Okay, perfect. Prepping for the first of two C-46 runs up the Mackenzie Valley. This is just ridiculous. Why in the do we have 652 and now I'm at 964? The chaos of the cargo bay is driving her back into her old habit. It's just the stress of working here. I mean, holy And stress, they say, triggers my smoking. Well, I guess I better find a new job in order to quit. And today, she's got an extra headache, making room for Buffalo's special delivery to Fort Good Hope. Yeah, and make sure the turkeys and the toys, however you can manage it. A trip that you? Kelly will make in person, if they can fit it all on the plane. What skid are we going to put this on? It's got to be a small skid. Fort Good Hope. 800 kilometers northwest of Yellowknife. A community still reeling from a fire that destroyed their main store, taking away the town's food and toys a week before Christmas. Now, three days ahead of the holiday, help is on the way. Hello, Air Buffalo 522, C-46, we're 17 miles to the east end down from Yellowknife, estimating at five minutes. Two Buffalo Airways C-46s are bringing special Christmas donations. No one is more eager to see the planes land than the store's manager, Darcy Ryan. Two planes coming here today. We look forward to seeing those, getting some of this uh, product off the planes. It's a rare event on this tiny airstrip. Both of Buffalo's massive 46s together. Capable of a combined payload of 27,000 pounds, delivering a huge care package in time for the holiday. Personally, for me to go up to Fort Good Hope and bring the stuff, I felt honored that actually Joe and Mikey chose me to go up there and do this. Like, it was great. But there was a personal sacrifice. Kelly had to miss the birth of her new grandson, Benjamin, to get here. But she's on a rescue operation. Besides another emergency delivery of supplies, there's Christmas dinner for the town's hardest hit families and special treats for kids who lost presents in the fire. 
now we have a lot of toys and groceries since there are some families that are struggling and this will help out. So it's real it's gonna be a real happy Christmas this year. Everyone was so happy. And I think that's important with Buffalo. And Joe, of course, sent it all up for nothing, too. And it's, it's a part of Joe that lots of people don't see. And it's a very good side of Joe. After a very tough week, Kelly and Buffalo are helping Fort Good Hope recover. <laughs> But heading for home, Kelly still has to face her own problems. With her emphysema and trouble quitting smoking, Kelly has to decide, can she really keep both her health and her job? On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Pilots under pressure. At 150. I've never seen oil pressure that high. Have you? Oh. And things are ready to blow. It's gonna blow up. Rookies under pressure. Two young pilots face their first checkouts. <laughs> Cargo under pressure, and Janelle blows up. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT. At 150. I've never seen oil pressure that high. Oh. Pilots under pressure, and things are ready to blow. It's gonna blow up. Rookies under pressure. Two young pilots are tested on the DC-3. Cargo under pressure, and Janelle blows up. Boy. It's cold, man. It's like minus 51 with a wind chill or something. Wow, beautiful this morning or what? It's a little crisp, eh? They call it first 40. A dreaded day for Buffalo Airways when the mercury in Yellowknife plummets to 40 below. Too cold for man or machine. Nothing like to work in this cold. Machines, nothing. Despite the cold, Buffalo C-46 is needed for a mission up the Mackenzie Valley where it's slightly warmer. But if it gets any colder than minus 40, all flights are canceled. Buffalo has learned the hard way that below minus 40, things mechanical tend to fail. 33-year-old co-pilot Scott Blue grew up in the milder temperatures of downtown Toronto. This is his second frigid winter at Buffalo. Did you sit back there? At six foot seven, Scott is known as too tall because he's actually too tall to fit in some cockpits. Somebody said minus 43 a few minutes ago. But he's not flying today. Just helping rookie ramp hands get the plane ready to face the extreme cold. Hooray! Oh, really? Uh, but today, the cold's not the only problem Buffalo faces. The first 40 below, Ian calls in sick, so you know what? Scotty's here, so too tall gets the nod on this one, so. Home, headset, airport. But Scott's not prepared to fly. I'm literally gonna run home, grab my headset, grab my bag, right back. Get in the plane and go. While Scott races to get his gear for this flight, his roommate, 29-year-old C-46 Captain Devin Brooks, checks the weather forecast up the valley. Clear and cold. How's the weather looking? It's cold. It's 40 below at altitude. Oh. But it's 25 below in the well. For now, temperatures up the valley are still above yeah, the minus 40 no-fly threshold. 34. But they're dropping fast. Scott arrives home. 
Oh, where his other roommate, Devin's girlfriend, Janelle Glenn, is studying. What's going on? Last minute change of plans. Cluster f Maybe the third time in my year and a half at Buffalo, I've had to run home. Grab my gear and go. Picked the wrong day to shave. Across town on the tarmac, Devon C-46 is stuffed to the ceiling with a full load of cargo for the valley run. Whoa, 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 whoa. Take it back. We're not gonna have any room. We got 10 pallets to go in here. It's just a lot of physics. You can't fit it in. Devon came to Buffalo three years ago intent on flying the C-46. The heaters conked out on the flight yesterday. So mechanic Chuck Adams is coming along again today, just in case. That's why I nearly froze to death. That's why I gotta go again today. The four remote communities on the Valley Run depend on Buffalo Air. If Buffalo can't fly, their supply line is cut off. The plane, the captain, and the mechanic are ready to go. But still no sign of the co-pilot. There's a good chance that close to finished the loading. And then hopefully the heaters work today. <laughs> My toes are already numb. Scott arrives. They need to get going before the plane freezes up or the air temperature drops into the no-fly range. See ya. With temperatures still above minus 40 up the valley, this flight is good to go. feet, the temperature is right at the threshold of 40 below. We shouldn't even be flying in this weather. No. The cockpit is freezing. Chuck tries to get a bit more out of the heater duct, but it barely makes a difference, and their breath is frosting the windshield. I guess we're gonna have to kill somebody, make them stop breathing so we can land. <laughs> get up. Beautiful day. Then, if the cold wasn't enough... That's quite a bit of oil pressure. The engine is, man. Climbing. The oil pressure on the right engine is alarmingly high. I've never seen oil pressure that high. Have you? No. Oh. Measured in pounds per square inch, oil pressure is a key indication that the oil is flowing properly and the engine is functioning correctly. Oil pressure for the C46 is normal at 80 PSI. Whatever you take off, it'll always go up to 100 sometimes in the extreme cold. But then after you go through your power settings, it'll slowly come back to 80 PSI. If it cruises for 20 minutes, now it's at 150. The oil lines aren't made to withstand such stress. If they rupture, the engine, suddenly without oil, will seize up and stop. Usually if it's 120 PSI, you have a serious problem. We're gonna have 160 PSI here in a minute or two. Yeah, kind of looking like that. Climbing. Do you think it's right? Well, I don't know. Well, tell me now, Chuck, before we get too far out of town, because I don't want to blow up. The oil pressure just kept climbing and climbing. Devin has to decide fast. Keep going or abort this flight and get on the ground. It's like it's slowly rising in pressure until it's gonna pop. Oh, it could be number of things. It's hard to say. Better air on the side of caution, in my opinion. I'm not playing with it. Oh, it's not all right. It's gonna blow up. Do a 180. Left turn, right turn. Whatever. There's only one thing to do. Devin turns around and heads back to Buffalo. Chuck knows more about those engines than myself and Scott put together. We made the decision to come home. But within minutes, the oil pressure changes again. Going down now. 
Oh, yay. You know, the plane's like, I'm going home now. I'm going to be good. Going down even more now. It was sort of playing with us. As soon as we did a U-turn and set course for Yellowknife, it started to go down, and it went down quite a bit. Ah, let's go. What? Go where? Valley. What the f do you want to do that for? Go down now. Well, why the f is it doing that? I think it's all f Chuck knows every quirk of the C-46, but it's still a calculated risk. Okay. Okay. So we spun around again, and we're heading back towards Delaney. Back on course on the coldest day of the year, the C-46 crew pray they've made the right decision and that the oil pressure in the right engine will hold. Buffalo Airways wannabe pilots Andrew Vike and Graham Ferguson are exhausted from slogging it out on the ramp for nine months. It's, you're up here, you're isolated, so you're away from your family and stuff, and some people miss home. And It's like the military only. There's no schedule. You just never stop working. Fresh out of pilot school in British Columbia, the two rampies have worked their way up to flight attending on the daily passenger service. It's just one step from their dream, flying one of these vintage warbirds as a Buffalo co-pilot. Buffalo breeds the best pilots in the world because we demand everything from them. Everything. When you're 25 years old, you don't get exhausted. I mean, there's, there's no such thing as, I mean, they're, they're fireproof and bulletproof and waterproof and non-exhaustible. <laughs> When it's 40 below outside and you got a 70-year-old airplane you got ready, this is tough stuff. And it weeds out 99.9% .9 of everybody. In the last six months, three rampies were weeded out. Mild-mannered Wilf Dar left for another airline. Just another day, uh, more or less. Quebecer Audrey Marchand went home. <sighs> and outspoken Jeremy Dow was oh. laid off. Oh, I love my job, I love my job. Just got to focus on flying, get Joe happy. With those three gone, Andrew and Graham are the most senior rampies at Buffalo. It's the, this Buffalo, you grind it out. Okay, let's go find Andrew. Tell him the good news. But today, they're about to catch their big break. The rumor that I've heard is that Joe wants both Graham and I checked out. After tons of hard work, their chance has come. So I know that you and uh, Graham have been working really hard, and this is a time where it pays out, right? So it basically means me and Graham are getting checked out. Yeah, basically. Awesome. Getting checked out means moving up from flight attendant to co-pilot. The holy grail after months of endless grunt work. I was talking to Mikey. The uh, good news is that I'm getting checked out. The bad news <laughs> is you're getting laid off. Yeah, right. <laughs> pretty sure I'll be getting checked out pretty quick, so that's, like, really, really good news. These flight school graduates are licensed to fly small single-engine aircraft. But Andrew and Graham face a steep learning curve with the much larger twin-engine DC-3. It's probably 10 times bigger than anything we've flown before. It's all based on pilotability. And uh, Joe is going to want us to be perfect off the bat. Well, what do you think? In the C-46, pilots Devin Brooks and Scott Blue and mechanic Chuck Adams are heading north to deliver food and mail to communities up the Mackenzie Valley. Oh, it's nice climbing again. And there's trouble again with the oil pressure. Just after takeoff, it had spiked to almost twice its normal level. Oil lines can explode under pressure this high, destroying the entire engine. There was no change in anything else but the oil pressure. The outside air temperature was consistent. Now the oil pressure is back up even higher. How many PSI does it take to blow those? Well, I've seen them up around 164. In a piston engine, oil pressure is your main gauge. It fluctuates, makes you nervous. Closing in on 180 pounds per square inch, it's more than twice the 80 PSI it should be. We have six hours of steady flying to go, and we didn't know if it would hold. I think we got an old cooler valve closed. Can you fix it? Well, would you like me to crawl outside there right now, little brother, and jump under that oil cooler? 
And in the sparsely populated north, there are few airstrips en route if they need to make an emergency landing. That's the highest it's been so far. I know. It's getting higher and it's going to f up here. So she's close to blowing up, probably. Yeah. It's good to have Chuck there because he has so much expertise. But the ultimate decision rests with the captain. Hell Knife Company and AVO. AVO. Hey, Roxy, we're on our way home. You can let everybody know we'll be down in 25 minutes. Now Devin is faced with another crucial decision. We're going home, but I'm wondering whether to shut the thing down before it does blow. If you shut it down, though, at those temperatures, it freezes up very, very quickly with the airflow over the engine, so you have no chance of restarting it or anything like that. It's a tough call. The C-46 could limp home on one engine, but Devin decides to keep it running. Those lines are probably holding on by a thread. It was getting, you know, prohibitively bad. I don't think the gauge reads after 200. I mean, 10 more PSI, and we weren't even going to be able to know how high it was, just 200 or plus. Buffalo 2 and 1 C46 starting all night and 13 minutes. Minutes later, they begin their approach into Yellowknife. The right engine oil pressure remains extraordinarily high. 311 tower, wind is 330 on 5, clear to land on runway 33. Clear to land on runway 33. Then, the minus 40 curse hits the landing gear. Here down. Check, here she comes. The right side wheel comes down. Right works. But the left one doesn't descend. That happened yesterday? No. Oh. With the runway in sight, Devin keeps his cool and retracts the landing gear. Here, coming up. And tries again. There it goes. Got three green. This time, both sides of the landing gear come down. Without a second to spare. First day at 40 below, so everything's kind of, uh, uh, it's always the worst day. Soon enough, the oil pressure mystery is solved. The cause of the problem is no surprise. Cold? Yeah. Okay. Cold. Gelled cooler? Gelled cooler. When the hot oil from the engine reached the frozen cooler valves, it gelled and clogged the cooler, becoming thick and slow as molasses, and pushing the oil pressure to the breaking point. It doesn't like me. Scott's taking the plane's crankiness personally. I think I dated her sister or something. I don't know what it is. She's mad at me for something. Just seemed to have a bad uh, run of luck with her. But we made the right call. We brought her back home. Everybody's safe. But there's still a problem. The communities on the Valley Run will not get their food shipment today. If it wasn't minus 40, it wouldn't be a big deal. But uh, we're trying to get it all done before it drops another five degrees. That could ground the run indefinitely, which would cut off the supply line to the Valley communities. For now, this C-46 is out of service. To get the food and mail delivered, Buffalo mechanics must race to have the other C-46 ready to fly by morning. Another early winter morning in Yellowknife, not quite as cold as it was yesterday. Scott and Devin aren't flying today. Morning suck, man. I wish I was still asleep. But their roommate, Devin's girlfriend, Janelle Glenn, is returning to fill in at Buffalo for the first time in months. You know, I love Buffalo and whatever, but it's not a lifetime job. I found my toque. <laughs> Last fall, 22-year-old Janelle left her job in Buffalo's cargo terminal to go back to school. Hamlet, horses of the night, streetcar named Desire. The high school equivalency exams that could be her ticket to higher education are just days away. She can handle it. She's just a little grumpy in the morning. It's like we all are, not too much sleep. You know, when you work from 5.30 to 5.30 and you go to school from 7 till 10, that's not a schedule I can handle. Thus, conscious does make cowards of us all. OK. I don't like Shakespeare. I like Newton. Numbers. Shakespeare, as far as I'm concerned, I wish he never wrote a book. 
What? I love Shakespeare. Devin hates him. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take up arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. A sea of troubles is just what Janelle doesn't need right now. We're good. I will. It was in pieces just yesterday undergoing maintenance. But now, the backup C-46 cargo plane emerges from the hangar, ready to fly. Buffalo mechanics raced against the clock and won. Now, the food and mail cargo from the first C-46 that had engine trouble yesterday will be loaded onto this plane. And if all goes well, it will reach the anxious residents of the Mackenzie Valley before the day's over. Across the road, Janelle's first morning back in cargo is off to a bumpy start. I've got shit I've got to do. This is crunch time for me in school. So what the f do you expect me to do? She's covering for cargo manager Kelly Jurasevich, who's away. Okay. Well, I guess I'll see you tomorrow then. And now her co-workers have left her in the lurch. Paul Candace called in sick. Jack didn't show up till just a little while ago, and then he decided that he was just going to leave. So that means I have to stay when I've got school work and shit I gotta do. I mean, I think it's important because, you know, people won't get to eat if you don't, you know, ship their produce and whatever. Like, it's important, but some other people tend to say, you know, whatever, it's just another paycheck or it's just another J-O-B. And for Janelle, this J-O-B is beginning to feel like a T-R-A-P. I don't wanna live my whole life and work at Buffalo. That's why I'm going to school. I've done this a couple times for Kelly, you know, when she leaves, I come in and, you know, help out. But when the cat's away, the mice will play, man. With no choice, Janelle braves the cold to help the crew load the C-46. I wish I could just go home and study, but that's not going to happen today, which sucks. Hey, Have a good day, you guys. The day is still young, and Janelle will use every available minute to cram. Lately, I haven't been able to study for anything because I've been working here. <laughs> Hopefully, the people that didn't show up today will show up on Wednesday. And I've told them, if you don't show up, then that means I have to stay here, and that means that, you know, I won't be able to do the things that I need to do. I'll be right there. There's the license uh, and my passport, and there's a TDG certificate in there in the back somewhere. Rampies Graham and Andrew have an exam coming up, too, an in-flight checkout test. They've lassoed freshly minted Captain Gord Cooling to help them fly the sim. Props, full fine. A PC-based flight simulator. Of the German Rhine, sent it in, a two to five. in the heyday of the DC-3, military pilots trained on simulators like this link trainer. Patented in 1931, it mimicked the pitch, roll, dive, and climb of the DC-3 without actually leaving the ground. Times have changed. Gear up. Takeoff was brutal. With software and a few off-the-shelf peripherals, this ordinary computer becomes a virtual DC-3, complete with simulated wind conditions and the actual coordinates of the Hay River and Yellowknife runways. You have a hydraulic failure. A hydraulic failure. Graham and Andrew will have to face a gauntlet of high-pressure drills and worst-case scenarios in their checkout rides. Minimum snow contact. Minimum snow contact. You don't say that. Overshoot, max power. Overshoot, all I want you to say. max power, that's it. Yeah, that's all I want to say. They need to sharpen their skills quickly. Their future at Buffalo depends on it. Soon, they'll trade this for this. Flying the real thing. All nine tons of it. A new day. Yeah, left ground, uh, Buffalo 406 to DC-3, just southbound to a river. As the sun rises, Andrew Vike clutches the yoke of a DC-3 as it takes off for Hay River. That's awesome. 
Okay. Once again, Gord Cooling is the mentor. Andrew is training for the big day when he flies his checkout ride. The best part of working at Buffalo, I definitely like the long 14-hour shifts. Uh, busting my ass. Oh, the best part is this, flying. This is what we work for. This is all I want to do, all day, every day. Andrew's checkout could come at any time. To get him ready, Gord puts him through his paces. 180 degrees and 30 degrees prior to roll-up. Good, so turn to the left. And uh, it's all clear left. And turn. Andrew has had almost no time on the DC-3. With his limited experience, this is like going from driving a compact car to a big bus. Bigger, heavier, more powerful. Fly the three, and you can just about fly anything. And it feels that way, too. It's one of the best feelings you can have when you're uh, flying just above the clouds there on an early morning, and you got the sunrise shooting over at you. The three, it flies so smoothly and so nice. It's like a sense of freedom that nothing else really provides you there. It's pretty awesome. For landing one three. Cruising is one thing. Landing a DC-3 is another. A pilot suddenly has several things to handle at once. Airspeed, descent rate, flap and power settings, controlling pitch, and yaw. Yeah, they're all plate, Roger. Let me just presume that we're visual now. Yeah. How Andrew does here can make or break his future at Buffalo. Flap three. Flap three, sir. Check your airspeed. Roger. Cross full. And a nose down. Yeah, just make sure your heels on the floor, you don't touch the brakes. Yeah. And yeah, that's that technique down. That was cool. Yeah, that's good, man. Right on. Thanks a lot, Courtney. Yeah. For Andrew, yeah. it's one more logged hour and one step closer to his goal. But until he takes and passes the big test, the dream remains exactly that. It's way too early in the morning for me right now. Janelle's been burning the candle at both ends. I was at school till 10 after 10 came home and, and then went to bed. But after months of studying for her high school equivalency exams, the tests are just 24 hours away. For this exam, I gotta focus on myself and studying, not in Buffalo. But for at least some of the day, she'll be running the show in cargo. I'm only gonna go in for a couple hours today. If we had employees that showed up every day, it wouldn't be too bad. Morning. So far, so good. No one is called in sick. On this with a private on this one. It's pretty small. We're gonna need to wrap this one. Oh, you son of a bitch. I hate this shit sometimes. But with a shortage of rest and only one day left till exams, Janelle's stress level is mounting. I just thought, oh my goodness, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this, you know? But Janelle's made a commitment to Buffalo, and she thinks she can manage it all. Janelle speaking. When I come back here, it's like I have to work hard here, too, and hard there. I don't like failure, so I have to continue. Today, Captain A.J. DeCoast is at the helm of the C-46 going up the valley. All is going well, until... It's a 250-pound pallet of chips, which is about three and a half, four feet high. They had about 200 or 300 pounds of pop on top of it. I explained it to her, we gotta put the pop on the bottom, or it's gonna fall off and get damaged. You freaked out. I went over there to ask him what happened. Like, you know, what's the matter? And he fucking lost it. Why are you Blah, blah, blah. By the end of it, I ended up getting upset and I raised my voice at her, which I regret. But once you say something, you can't take it back. It's done. If 
I had known it was going to escalate into something like that, I, I just would have done it myself and been over with. Uh, I feel bad about it, for sure. Well, I need to get out of here. While the valley run is under control, Janelle is not. Though Graham and Andrew are licensed to fly small single-engine aircraft, they need a checkout in-flight test to fly Buffalo's big DC-3s. Up to now, they've only flown training runs. If they check out, they can co-pilot on regular runs with passengers and freight. It's uh, what you come up here for. What you spend years saving money to do all the training, and then another year or so on the ramp here, working like a... Everything's good to go. Today, Graham could become Buffalo's newest DC-3 co-pilot. But first, he has to pass the checkout. And that's far from guaranteed. You know, it's, it's a little nerve-wracking. It's like, you know, you're kind of your first checkout, it's a big deal. Like, you just don't want to screw it up. How's it going? Graham has just learned who will fly in the captain's seat on the checkout ride. Chief pilot and Buffalo legend, Arnie Schrader. You haven't flown with Arnie yet. No, I don't think I've ever flown with Arnie. And behind him, Captain Justin Simley will be the flight examiner, watching and evaluating. Good. Before they board the DC-3, Graham has to answer a battery of questions. Arnie and Justin drill him on the plane's standard operating procedures. V and O on the DC-3. V and O is 159. Hey, flap extend speed for a quarter. 115 SOPs. Uh, landing gear extend speed. 138. Good. Graham's off to a good start. Right on. But now, he's hit with a blitz of tough questions about what to do in an emergency. OK, let's do uh, engine fire. Uh, engine uh, shutdown drill, uh, or engine fire drill. What is the engine fire drill? Uh, the pressure is on. Pretty much did everything I could to, to make myself most uh, mentally prepared for it. <laughs> you really just work pretty much until you're exhausted and uh, the day's over. And you go home, you get some food in you, and you hit up those books. Prop throttle mixture, better. up and away from the problem. Up and away from the problem at 95 knots. Graham makes it through the oral exam, but the toughest part is yet to come, the flight test. Yeah, it's a two crew ride. So if you fail, that's it, I fail. Yeah, Arnie's been flying for, for 50 years, and if you fail, that's it, I'm <laughs> He's done. He has to retire. Yeah, no pressure. So it's a eh? lot of pressure on him. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> Let's get out of here. They may be joking, but the pressure is real. Yeah, there's a lot on mind right now, that's for sure. Oh, engine failure. If Graham fails in the air, he may not get another chance. A moment, buddy. I hope so. Andrew watches Graham get set for his test ride. He knows he's next. Because Graham had the hours, he ended up getting checked out first, and he's like, as long as Andrew gets checked out right after me. The next 60 minutes will decide Graham's future at Buffalo. Tail wheel is unlocked. Coming off a small single engine plane with limited experience, getting in a big tail wheel radial engine airplane is it's very, very different. And it's not an easy thing to do. And not everybody can do it. After nine months of paying his dues on the ramp, Graham Ferguson is about to get his shot at becoming a Buffalo DC-3 co-pilot. You know what it's for? Uh, that's for uh, when uh, there's, you're on the ground and there's no pressure in the system. They can open it up and it's just it for maintenance. For maintenance. For maintenance. <laughs> Throughout the flight, Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader can assist Graham as right. needed. You have control. I have control. But Captain Justin Simley, the flight examiner, will be evaluating every move the rookie makes. You know, a big airplane compared to a small airplane, that carries a lot more momentum. You have to fly it a little differently. There's quite a few things. Keep straight. A little bit of back pressure, slight or to the right. You Justin will tell Graham immediately after the flight if he's passed or failed. You 
uh, the chief pilot sitting next to you. That was the first time I ever flew with Arnie. So uh, that was pretty cool. That guy, he's got so much experience. You can just tell just by sitting next to him. Like, it's crazy. So it's right. rolling to the right. Usually in the right turn, it'll tend to climb, so just be aware of that. Eh? Okay. Graham's biggest challenge, controlling his nerves. Just relax a little bit. Look at your instruments, scan them. It was probably more obvious that I was nervous than I, I would have liked. I, I think I had a pretty good death grip on the controls. Roll out. Rolling out? Yeah, that's the idea. Like, this is the whole point of me being up north, and uh, you're finally there, and you got that running through your mind, and you're trying to keep it out there. Just, no, no, just fly the plane, just fly the plane, just fly the plane. Okay, you know, that looks like we're going to lose number two, so. But flying the plane is only the beginning. The checkout ride is designed to test the pilot's ability to react appropriately in the most stressful situations. So, uh, engine uh, shutdown checklist. Engine number two is failing and has to be shut down. Luckily, it's only a drill. Security, I'm going to shut it off. Bro. All right. Justin keeps score while Arnie flings challenging situations at Graham. We're giving you your descent checks because you're coming up on that uh, 25. Clearance and safe, right? Uh, clearance not required. We're going yeah, far. Okay. And uh, safe, hey, we're going down to uh, 800. They approach Hay River. Graham prepares for a landing he's never attempted before. Never this is flap, so we got the gear down. He won't be allowed to use the wing flaps to control his descent. Every pilot has to know how to do this in case the flaps fail. Watch your altitude. You're a little bit tight. The wing on the DC-3 is so huge. Uh doesn't really want to stop flying. Graham has to slow down the plane earlier than usual and approach on a more shallow angle with nose up. Keep pushing that rudder, Graham. Keep it straight, we can see. Not on the brake, so good. Now always have that stick ahead a little bit once you touch down. All right. Perfect. The test is over. That was all right, you know. And Graham doesn't have to wait long to find out if he's made the cut. Well, you're a DC-3 pilot now. Congratulations. Now get up there and put that tent on. <laughs> yeah. You spend like so much time trying to get to this point when it's finally here. Like I can't even describe the feeling I have right now. I'm so happy. You know, he's got 250 hours and he's new to the airplane. So uh, when you consider those factors, I think he did a hell of a good job. Now, Graham can co-pilot on DC-3 passenger flights with the boss, Buffalo Joe McBrien, in the seat beside him. Well, I'm pretty stoked. <laughs> Feels pretty good. Be crying tears of joy if my eyeballs weren't frozen. For Janelle, the big day has arrived. She's heading to her final exam. It is exciting in a sense to get it over with. Like, you know, I mean, I've worked hard to this point. Janelle's focus is on the task at hand. She's put yesterday's meltdown behind her. Three hours later, Janelle's exam is over. So it went really good, I think. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to get my marks back. And yeah, like I feel like the door is open. Now I just have to figure out you know, which which way I want to go. But there's always something to ruin the moment. I got a ticket! <laughs> Shit! Loading zone, no permit. 40 bucks? Did I get a dozen mixed donuts? AJ DeCoast has not put yesterday's events behind him. Not yet. Didn't feel right about it all day yesterday or last night. AJ sets up his peace offering as Janelle returns. Yeah. Hey, have a coffee and a donut there, will you? Um... Janelle doesn't make it easy for AJ. Hey, how are you feeling, dude? Yeah. I think I did well, yeah, I think I... Good afternoon, Buffalo. Then he manages to get her attention. Hey, look, sorry about yelling at you yesterday. Uh, I hope we can still be friends. All yeah, right. it's... You know, I mean, I just, I was just kind of shocked is all. It was a very nice gesture that he, you know, recognized 
the the uh, altercation, and uh, it was nice of him definitely to approach me. I think that was a that was a big thing to do. Back as friends again, forgave each other. It's another good day. The time has arrived. With his buddy, Graham Ferguson, already checked out, the pressure's on 24-year-old Andrew Vike to join the ranks of qualified Buffalo Airways DC-3 co-pilots or be left behind on the ramp. I have the logbook signed off. That'll be the point. Justin is captain and flight examiner. Andrew has aced the oral part of the exam. Now, it's time to fly. Tower, Buffalo, trigger one, let's go, Tower. Trigger one, tower, line up runway 27 for now, number one to go. Wits on the right, right. Stay on the center line, 30 and number two to go. Ten throttles. Are you ready, young man? I think so. Are you ready, Andrew? I hope so. It's the moment of truth for rookie pilot Andrew Vike. His checkout flight to become a co-pilot on the 75-year-old DC-3. Yeah, you gotta know where those are in the dark, right? I don't know. Okay, so. Justin Simley is captain and flight examiner. Tower, Buffalo, Trigger 1, let's go on Charlie. A sudden opening in his schedule has them flying at night. This will put all of Andrew's training on the sim to the test. It's all about the instruments. Rotate. Rotate. Back on the stick. Hold back on the stick. On the brake, you're up. You see, you're gonna let it down. Keep it cup. Hold back on the stick. Okay, you're. My mind is all over the place, man. And just relax, okay? You gotta keep on your altitude. It's really black out there. All instruments, okay? You have to be able to do a hold, you have to do a number of different approaches, you do a number of emergency procedures and overshoots. Okay, my man, you ready? Roger. Okay, steep turn to the right. We do steep turns where you put the aircraft into a 45 degree bank. When executing a steep turn, the pilot must maintain airspeed and altitude. Altitude is ascending, pull back, pull back. But gravity has different ideas. You can't go above 100 feet or below 100 feet if you're doing your steep turn. You need to be uh, extremely accurate, precise on every maneuver that they ask you to do. Because as soon as you go above those limits, it's considered a failure and you've basically lost your chance at getting checked out in the aircraft. And try to hold your altitude as you roll around, okay? Yeah. Andrew stays within the limits and pulls off the steep turn. That's looking real nice, Andrew. Okay, 100 gold field in sight. We're landing, okay? Roger, landing. Lights are on, you clear to land. Roger. Okay, bring her down now. Okay. Keep it straight with your feet now. Okay, now we'll start bringing it into that level of attitude. 75, and there. Now, in it. Now. He learns his fate within moments of touching down. Once we finally got down there, Justin's like, all right, good job, yeah, you passed. I was so tired at the time because we had such a, an incredible workload that it didn't hit me for about a week or so when finally I'm like, oh, wow, I'm checked out on an airplane right on. <laughs> With both Andrew and Graham officially checked out, Buffalo has gained two DC-3 co-pilots, and both of them are here to stay. All right, thanks. Thank you. That was fun. They're intelligent. They've got the desire and the will to learn, and, uh, and they want to be here. Now if there's no way in hell I'm leaving. Like uh, I get to fly a get to fly a plane. It's gonna have to be something that physically pushes me to the ground. That's gonna make me leave. Like something like falling off the 46, making me break my leg or something like that. So you have to kill me to get me to quit. I'm grabbing fuel. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Look at the whitest legs in Venezuela. Mikey scours the planet to track down a long lost water bomber. I'll do what I can do. Kelly's health takes a turn for the worse. Might as well smoke. There you go. And a four legged passenger dumps a souvenir in flight. Dog just shit everywhere. 
On this episode of Vice Pilots NWT. Look at the whitest lights in Venezuela. Mikey scours the planet to track down a long lost water bomber. I'll do what I can do. Kelly's health takes a turn for the worse. Might as well smoke. There you go. And a four-legged passenger dumps a souvenir in flight. Dogs is shit everywhere. CL-215 water bomber. A 40-year-old amphibious plane that remains in high demand today. It's designed to skim over 5,000 kilograms of water off lakes in just 10 seconds and dump it over forest fires. The 215, also known as the Scooper, was sold worldwide but went out of production in 1990. It's a pretty rare aircraft. There's only about 125 of them that came off the assembly line. And it's a Canadian airplane, which makes it even more rare. Last year, Buffalo sold two CL-215s to the Turkish government at two and a half million dollars each. Back home to Turkey. Oh. Now, the Turks want to add to their fleet, but less than 80 CL-215s still exist, and very few are on the market. So that started Mikey on a treasure hunt that has so far only yielded one old photograph. This is right here. Uh, what I've been searching for is the only missing 215 in the world. The serial number 1061. The one unaccounted for aircraft of the 125 that were made back in the 60s and 70s has become Mikey's obsession. When I asked people in the industry about it and they told me it's crashed, it's gone, don't even look for it. And then I was thinking, well, why shouldn't I look for it? So I did a bunch of research. And this one, there's no crash record, and there's no pictures or nothing. And it's weird, because if you think of the internet, there's pictures of everything. Why is there no pictures of this airplane? A, it's crashed, like everyone told me. Or B, it's really well hidden. I got a tip uh, from a buddy of mine that works with these aircraft, and he says, no, it's in Venezuela. And that's all he told me. It's kind of like a murder scene. You got 10,000 pieces of evidence, but only one or two are valid. One key clue was the water bomber's call letters, INC1. I randomly put it in. It turned out to be this airplane, which referenced this picture. And this is the first picture I got to see of the thing. An outdated picture of a phantom plane. But Mikey needed more proof that the missing water bomber still exists. So we scoured satellite images of the planet looking for the plane. And then. This is a military air base in Venezuela. Lo and behold, there it is. I used the measuring function, measured the wingtips. It was perfectly to what the manual says. It's an open air hangar in a military air force base. It explains why there's no pictures of it. If this 215 is what I think it is, it constitutes millions of dollars in the Buffalo's bank account. But only if the plane is fit to restore. To find out, Mikey needs to go to Venezuela. I sent him this random email saying, hi, my name's Mikey. I'm in Yellowknife. I see you have serial number 1061. Can I have it? And he also needs his father's approval first. We don't know what their government's like. Is it stable? Is it in a coup? Is it in a dictatorship? Is it an overthrow right now? You know, there's, there's a lot of political problems here. But doesn't it sound fun? It sounds like fun, yeah. And it's something you can do, but you just can't. You got to realize you're not dealing with your neighbor. You're not dealing with the USA. With, with great risks comes great opportunity. This is the last 215 available. Buffalo Aries has been here for 40 years because we are willing to do things that are off the grid. Yeah, 215 in marginally good condition. What do you think the margins are uh, if we spend 250 to bring it home complete? Well, you go to, on, on something like that that's pretty risky, you need a margin of 50%, 25% if you don't have a lot of risk. Okay? But if you have a lot of risk financially, the margin's got to go up, so you got to double your money on it. 
This whole idea of saving the airplane is very up my dad's alley. No, the only original once. Tony together once. You cut it up, you ain't gonna ever put it back together. Once you put the torch to it, she ceases to be an airplane. She just becomes parts. So obviously our preference is to fly at home. Oh yeah, the preference is always to fly at home. That's what, what the airplanes are designed to do, fly not come home in a box. It's a good challenge and everybody needs a challenge. Yeah? He found it good. He found something we can use. Rolled out in 1969, the CL215 is powered by dual 2100 horsepower engines. The plane's high wing position and 90 foot span give it stability at low speeds and in the gusty conditions found over forest fires. The 215's unique design allows it to fill its 5,400 liter reservoirs through two small openings by skimming along the water's surface. Then, over fires, it dumps the water through the belly doors on the underside of the hull. With a green light from Joe, Mikey's itching to assemble his team to locate and eventually restore the mystery water bomber in Venezuela. This mission is like treasure hunting. You heard a rumor that there's a sunken ship, and you just happen to be maybe the only guy in town with a boat. And you got to find the guy that can scuba dive. And you kind of get a little bit of a team together, and you see if there's any treasure. And we got to do it as soon as possible, get it out of there. Because any given time, anything can happen. This airplane may not be available tomorrow. We keep making this bigger. He meets with his older brother, Rod. Buffalo's director of maintenance and ace water bomber mechanic, Corey Dodd. I went to the uh, foreign affairs website and printed out the travel report for Venezuela. Violence against foreigners can occur in all regions in Venezuela, both urban and rural. So not, not really a place you really want to go, is it? Well, all those things are scary. It's like talking to a lawyer, right? Everything is doom and gloom when you talk to a lawyer. Mikey will be bringing Corey with him to Venezuela to inspect the 215. Corey's going to use his knowledge of working on these airplanes for the last 10 years and seeing if we can actually fly this thing home. With less than 80 of the original 125 CL215 still in service, the chance to salvage one that everybody else has forgotten about could be a huge score for Buffalo. But we're going to literally go down there with a bunch of screwdrivers and wrenches, take some key panels off, and see what kind of shape it is. Do not show signs of affluence or display valuables, so you shouldn't have any problem there. <laughs> In 24 hours, Mikey's quest will really begin. Yeah. In the meantime, it's business as usual at Buffalo. On the tarmac, a DC-3 is being prepped for the evening sked the daily scheduled passenger flight to Hay River. Make them shine. Graham Ferguson and Andrew Vike recently passed their proficiency test to become DC-3 co-pilots. Yeah, I'm up here to learn how to fly and to be the best pilot I can be, so. But reaching that goal requires dedication and determination. The test may be behind them, but they need to continue moving forward building their knowledge of these old warbirds. There are some days where I go home and I'm only able to study for 15 minutes before I, I fall asleep. The other day I fell asleep and I had the flight manual right on my chest. I woke up ready to go to work at 5 a.m. the next day. Because the next step in their development is flying with the boss, Buffalo Joe. All right, and you too, because I heard you guys slammed that door before. OK, we'll never do it again. Yeah, okay. And Joe well, expects there. everything from his young co-pilots. I'm just part of the world. Uh... So, uh, you can't be timid, you know, you gotta be aggressive. And they all get good at it because their career depends on it and their life depends on it. For the past three years, Joe's had the same co-pilots on the sked. Now he has to break in these two rookies. What happened is we've got some senior co-pilots that are moving on, and we got the junior co-pilots coming in. Don't slam that door. Prior to their checkout flights, Andrew and Graham completed the required 10 hours of training in the DC-3. That's all. As junior first officers, we have very low hours. It is one of the harder aircrafts to fly, and Joe is going to want us to be perfect off the bat. Oh, hey, sit down there and see if she's clear out there. We 
like the old throw. Andrew and Graham may be hot shots in a certain area, but when they uh, jump in a DC3 with the boss, do the regular sked route, these boys better be ready. This is it, a 50-minute flight with 22 passengers on board. Andrew's chance to impress Joe, a man who demands perfection. Buffalo Airways' daily passenger flight to Hay River cuts through the sky. 24-year-old rookie co-pilot Andrew Vike is flying with the boss, Buffalo Joe McBrien, for the very first time. Yes. Uh, if we switch to the other screen, show the ETA, Joe. Well, you know what time it is. You know how far back you're going. Definitely a lot more nerve-wracking when you're with Joe just because you don't want to make a mistake. It's the nerves. It's the fact that you want to do everything uh, to a T. They shouldn't be intimidated or scared. You know, we got instill in them the airmanship we expect of them. You gotta know when you're making your turn how long it's gonna take you and where you're gonna go to with it. You don't wanna allow them any bad habits at this time that will show up later in your flying career. You gotta try to fix at 2,500 feet. How many miles up, how many minutes from now? Okay, that'll be, no, don't tell me because you're gonna make a mistake. Just work it out in your head and keep working it every day. Joe's methods can be unsettling for a rookie. My mind's set on flying the aircraft well, and he's kind of there distracting me with these other questions, and it really frazzles you, and it makes it hard. If my father can rattle you, you are not ready. If he can rattle you, what happens if you have a real problem in the air? If you have an emergency in an airplane, you're by yourself. You got to know where everything is and how it works. All that stuff you gotta learn, you better know it. You can go to your book and find out. I'll take control here. You have control. I'm trying not to disappoint him. I'm trying to fly as best as I can, and his, uh, you just don't want to upset Joe. You want to make him happy. And nothing makes Joe happier than flying a DC-3. Now you're thinking yourself, I got a nice light airplane. I have a clean wing, I have nice thick air. This airplane's going to float. Nice and clean, nice and light. That's what you think when you're landing. Handling the DC 3 is second nature to Joe. And he wants Andrew to get to that point soon as well. He has to learn uh, the care and control of the airplane. He has to learn the airmanship. He has to learn procedures. He has to learn to fly the airplane. There's a lot to learn to go from a flying school with a small trainer to a big ass tail dragger in the middle of the winter and dark. Tomorrow, I wanted to know three things you didn't know today. Three things, any, any three things. Because there's, there's a thousand things, so if he does three a day to start with, that's very good. Oh, it's 32 below here, eh? Oh, cauliflower all over the place. What happened there? Inexperienced. It's departure day for Mikey. He's headed to Venezuela in search of a rare airplane that was thought to be lost forever. But instead of packing, he's become a rampy this morning, dealing with an unexpected flurry of business. If you plan to leave, it's going to be the day you shouldn't leave, and that's how it is. There's, every day is emergency at Buffalo. Every day there's a problem needs to be solved, so we are just uh, trying to solve problems one at a time. As of tomorrow, Mikey won't be around to problem solve. Oh, oh, tell him to take it easy with that cauliflower. Buffalo's been doing it for 40 years, a lot longer than I've been alive, so they can handle without me. Or can they? <laughs> Later, Mikey sneaks away from Buffalo. Boy, I'm gonna find some stuff. He'll be trading the bitter cold of Yellowknife for the sweltering heat of the Venezuelan jungle. I need something a little bit more breezy. And he doesn't have a thing to wear. <laughs> that's it, that's the, that's the Hawaiian search section right here. We kind of want to look stylish and not so uh, out of place. 
See, this one right here, I wouldn't even need to have my Canadian passport ready. <laughs> this ensemble right here would be, please kidnap me. Well, Mikey purchases his new ensemble. Thanks. Have a good day. Corey Dodd is focused on footwear. Can't go anywhere without these things. I spend more time in these sandals than I do in winter boots. That's the key to the whole operation is sandals. Corey never thought that being a Buffalo water bomber mechanic would involve so much travel. Never really expected it. Like, not as far as going out of Canada was concerned, like South America and Europe and overseas. And, you know, it's been a little more than what I really signed up for, but I like it. It's good. But this mission to locate and evaluate a missing CL-215 presents some definite challenges. At this point, we haven't had any uh, pictures of it or anything. We're, going to, we're really going in blind. But the tickets are booked, so we're going. Shorts. Rookie co-pilot Graham Ferguson knows that he's in the same boat as his buddy Andrew. This is what I want to do. I know this is what I want to do. So you just you take it as a count, you try your hardest, because like, stressing about it's just gonna make it worse. They still have a long way to go as far as Joe's concerned. There's a lot of shit to do in your day here. You need to get it all done and you need to get it done to the satisfaction of Joe. What does Carvey give you for manifold pressure? Uh, and so far, Joe's not satisfied with their knowledge of the DC-3. What 600 horsepower coming over to today at 4,000 feet at 30 below? He wants them to know as much about flying the plane as the more experienced co-pilots they'll be replacing. Do you know how to read a power chart? We actually have one in our manual, yes. It's no good in your manual and your manual's behind you. If you don't know it, you gotta know that shit. Okay. Andrew and Graham waste no time hitting the books. So there you're at 15. It's lunchtime, but uh, we gotta know this stuff, so um, there's no real other time to learn it right now, so Joe's just gonna push us until we know everything. Well, it's gonna take us a little, a little while to do so, but. Look at there. Yeah. The temperature's pretty much always around 26. Gets to... The rookies are determined to show Joe they're ready to fly with him. But can they rise to the challenge? Leaving the boys to their studying. Hey, sir. Park right here, baby. Joe chauffeurs Mikey and his new summer wardrobe to the airport. I, I don't know if they're here yet. With only a few days to find and assess the CL215 in Venezuela, Mikey's added another mechanic to the team, Ian Steves. But given the highly competitive world of airplane salvage, Mikey still hasn't told Ian exactly where in Venezuela they're going. The community of 215s, which is the aircraft we're gonna go get, is a small community. And one word to the wrong person, you could trip someone else to go get the airplane, like treasure hunting. You could tell someone you're out going to go look for the Titanic, but you're not going to show them your treasure map. Okay, should get Bye, Joe. Sorry. As Corey says goodbye to his wife, Sonia, Mikey's girlfriend, Gail, shows up to see him off. The expedition is underway. Mikey, Corey, and Ian are headed halfway around the world hoping to bag an extremely elusive aircraft. But will Mikey's treasure hunt turn into a wild goose chase? Good morning. Look at the whitest legs in Venezuela. <laughs> After flying for 12 hours from Yellowknife to Caracas, Venezuela, Mikey and mechanics Corey and Ian are ready to continue their treasure hunt for a prized CL215 water bomber. Ready? Go. I said, "Can I come to your country and look at this airplane? I'm from the north and it's really cold." The Venezuelan government said yes. So we're on our way right now to the Port Ordaz. Yes. Escorted by Luis Padron, Mikey's contact with the Venezuelan military, the Buffalo team will travel 800 kilometers by road to an Air Force base in Port Ordaz. There, they can assess the value of the CL215 Mikey discovered online. He's prepared to pay up to a quarter million dollars for the plane, 
and could sell it for almost 10 times that price if it's in good enough shape. After a few hours, a pit stop, and there's still a long way to go. 500 kilometers. 500 kilometers. Holy smokes. That's like an early 70s. Yeah, the biggest thing I get a kick of is these vehicles here are amazing. They're all mid-80s boats and, and uh, trucks there. It's uh, just like being home in Hay River. <laughs> it's a Torino. <laughs> Love that, man. Back on the road, they'll soon come face to face with the object of their quest. Or so they hope. <sighs> Mikey's first day in Venezuela is cargo manager Kelly Jarasevich's first day back in Yellowknife after a much needed vacation. Well, I'll do what I can do and try to get everything figured out, squared away, and, and taken care of. Her chance to recover from a stress level that was getting critical God, and come back relaxed, refreshed, and better able to deal with the demands of her job. Oh, God. At least that was the theory. Four cases of tobacco missing. How in the shit does that happen? And they want me to find them. Oh, OK. The f how the f am I supposed to do that? Buffalo is probably the most stressful job I think I've ever had. I was happy to see everyone, but still, it was just like the stress of it brought it all back to me. And you know, what the hell am I doing here? I'm a bit stressed now, as usual. Might as well smoke. Stress, chain smoking. Kelly's been putting her life at risk. She's been diagnosed with stage two emphysema and told by her doctor that if she doesn't quit smoking, she could be on an oxygen tank within months. It's like two packs a day here. Like I could easily smoke three packs, like hands down, easily three packs a day because of the stress level at Buffalo. There has got to be a better life somewhere. Across the road, Joe meets with Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader and Training Captain Justin Simley to discuss the rookie co-pilot's progress. You know, they, I don't know if they come through a college program where they went to a blind school. Andrew went to SFU. They've got an aviation program now. He's got a two-year diploma then. Yeah, at least two years. And then the other ones, uh, Graham's, went through flying school in Victoria. Regardless of their education, Joe's still not sure they're ready to fly passenger flights. They need a little more practice in simulators and stuff. Instrument flying techniques are not very good. So, Joe orders the boys to spend more time practicing on the flight simulator. So we're going to do another 10 hours in the simulator. You guys stay positive. I know it's, I know it's tough. Once you can do it smoothly, he's going to leave you alone. Yeah. Until you can do that, he's not going to leave you alone. Justin's been there. Years ago, he worked hard to become Joe's DC-3 co-pilot. They got a tough job. That's one of the toughest jobs in the company is uh, flying next to the boss, and uh, it's not easy. So I can see it on their faces. I'll fly the set, now I'll keep the slope, and then the throttles. Hope to face the throttles with the button. Andrew and Graham hope practice makes perfect so they can reach Joe's high standard. Back in Venezuela, Mikey, Corey, and Ian are journeying into uncharted territory in search of an airplane thought to have disappeared years ago. Very excited to see the airplane and, and uh, see how it is and see if, uh, if uh, it's, it's, it's feasible to fly away, which is, uh, of course, the main goal. Eight hours of hard driving gets them to an Air Force base in Port Ordaz. I recognize the layout a little bit from uh, Google Earth. There's DC-3. DC-3s. Yeah. Yeah. A familiar sight, but not the plane they're looking for. The 215 in Google Earth was in an open air hangar down there. It doesn't look like it's there anymore. Their guide, Luis, knows what they're after and points it out. See ya. When Lewis turned over and said, oh, there's your Mr. 215, and we looked over and like, uh, no, that's a PBY cancel. <laughs> uh, that's a cancel. 
A Canso is an aircraft that looks very similar to a CL215. But a Canso is definitely not the mystery plane that Mikey is on a quest to find. A quest based on outdated satellite photos and some correspondence with the Venezuelan government that was filtered through a language barrier. But it wouldn't surprise me in the least if the 215 we were supposed to come look at was actually a Canso. <laughs> it wouldn't shock me. I mean, if there's no airplane, there's nothing we can do. I mean, that's the mis miscommunication or whatever. How in the hell are we gonna explain uh, the fact that we traveled thousands of miles to get to the wrong airplane? At this point, we actually don't even know if there's a 215 here now. <laughs> we might be chasing the wrong airplane. So I'm, I'm actually kind of nervous right now. We see a 215 around here? We have it. Uh, yeah. Obey's commander. Okay. Here. Nice. This is a call. This is a mic. Here. Like, okay. We are looking the airplane now. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mikey McBrien and his expert mechanics, Corey Dodd and Ian Steves, flew 7,000 kilometers and drove another 800 to find a long lost CL 215 water bomber. Well, I haven't, st I haven't still seen it yet. It's been elusive this long. What's a few more minutes, I guess. But after being shown the wrong plane, they're anxious for proof of the 215's existence. Oh, there she is. Oh, it's gonna need some paint. It's the CL215 Mikey's been searching for. There it is, Mikey. There she is. But have they found hidden treasure or a pile of scrap metal? The investigation to find out begins. Wow. Now it's up to Corey and Ian to figure out, hey, if this thing's feasible to take home. Pretty complete, eh, Ian? Yes. Yeah. Usually when we encounter airplanes, it's they're usually robbed of all their parts. But this is, uh, it's all here. Have you seen the initial corrosion? Well, it's usually all hidden, right? Oil coolers, I have to change those probably. Yeah. So, Mr. Dodd, the million dollar question. Well, tomorrow I'll give you the million dollar answer. <laughs> and that answer requires a very close look under the hood. I shouldn't be very long, I'll be right back. The next day in Yellowknife, cargo manager Kelly Jurasevich needs to see her doctor. She's been diagnosed with stage two emphysema and is worried about a recurring lung infection. The doctor said I really have to watch for that and go in like immediately if I notice any change in my lungs because it'll turn into pneumonia. Kelly's doctor has warned her repeatedly about the consequences of her smoking, but that didn't stop her on vacation. Smoking, holy old crap. It's nothing like going to a country where the cigarettes are two bucks a pack. Got the old lung infection back, so it's antibiotics again. And he asked me how much I was smoking, and I said the usual pack, so he shook his head, and he says, you gotta quit. I actually didn't smoke that bad in Mexico because I really didn't have any stress. But getting healthy might mean quitting more than just cigarettes. I'm gonna try to stick it out for a bit, but I don't wanna end up on the third floor of the hospital here. But for now, it's back to work. <laughs> 7,000 kilometers south, it's time to get down to business. Put the layer in the old tires here so we can tow it. Crank her up. Determining how badly the plane has deteriorated is Corey's job. The skin of the CL215 water bomber is made up of hundreds of panels held in place by thousands of screws. And the true condition of the plane is hiding behind those panels. Next stop, Yellowknife. 
Oh, right now we're just gonna get it in the hangar there so we can get out of the wind for a bit. Pretty exciting though, seeing it move again. Hopefully if everything works out, we'll bring some life back into it. Fly it out of here in a couple months or something. Corey only has two days to do a full assessment of the plane. This will be exciting. Find anything major in this area it could be the could be Mikey showstopper. So once we open all these panels up, then we will know better. This looks like Indiana Jones Temple of Doom. We're unsealing it after many years. There we go. She came off. It's yeah. exactly like buying a used car. You got to pop the hood and check everything out. There's a bunch of dirt on them and stuff, dust, but like, there's no corrosion in there, Mikey. 100 more panels to go, but <laughs> I guess you got to start somewhere, right? If the 215 structure or systems have eroded, then at best, the plane is nothing more than a pile of parts. There's no real, I don't see any corrosion in here. One thing's for sure. The plane's engines are a complete write-off. These engines are way past due. They've been open for 18 years, birds living in them. The engines could be replaced at a cost of a million dollars if the rest of the plane is in good enough shape to make it worthwhile. Yeah. A few little hydraulic stuff, but I mean, holy crap, things sat in a long time. You kind of expect a little bit of leaks here and there. This airplane is, is good in some areas, and in some areas it's bad. Uh, but so far, the areas that are really bad are just trivial. Uh, I'm kind of scared if Corey opens up a panel and just a big pile of white corrosion, uh, it might not be worth it. Back in Yellowknife, Andrew and Graham are prepping the sked. They've studied hard and spent 10 hours each on the flight simulator. And now, they're getting another chance to fly with the boss. And tonight, the sked has a very special passenger, a Great Dane named Bearpaw. What you got on his leg now? He's got a cat in the cat. What I'll do is I'll take him out. The enormous dog had a vet appointment in Yellowknife to check how his broken leg is healing. He suffered the injury when hit by a car over Christmas. Look at that. You live along here just like you know what you're doing. He's been entrusted to Buffalo for safe transport home to Hay River. An animal lover, Joe is taking a personal interest in bear paw. Get out here. To a point. Yeah, walk him around. Take him shit. Okay. All right, dog. Take a shit. Andrew's the flight attendant tonight. So he deals with the needs of the passengers, even the four legged ones. Poop everywhere. Take a shit, dog. Go poo. Poo, poo, poo. What are you looking for, bud? All right, he wouldn't shit. And we need to board passengers. Graham's got a lot more on his mind than pet sitting. It's his turn as Joe's co-pilot on the 50-minute sked flight. Joe lets dogs fly free on Buffalo sked, but Bear Paw's too big for a kennel, so he's riding up front in the galley right behind the cockpit. Step on the dog. Uh, a few things. Uh, please no smoking at all throughout the flight. If you have any electronic devices, please don't use them during taxi takeoff and landing. to prove to Joe that all his studying and practice on the simulator has paid off. You're 15 dots low, you're 50 degrees off course, 150 feet high. Now you're 200 feet high. When are you gonna settle now? But his nerves are getting the better of him. So sit back, relax, and you can see all the instruments at once. Don't focus on one at a time. Joe's kind of like a grumpy grandpa, I guess. He's only grumpy because he cares. Like, I mean, he wants us to take care of his machine, and he wants us to be damn good pilots, and he doesn't want us to kill ourselves or anybody else. I mean, that's why he's so hard on us, is because he wants us to be the best we can be. But Graham's best might not be enough to make Joe any less grumpy. 
I'll get her over on heading, to leave her on it now, soon as let that speed come up. So I don't want to take another 10 minutes because you're trying to turn out a fly all over again. Just as Joe's patience starts to wear thin, a gag-inducing stink fills the plane. Does it smell pretty bad to you? Yeah, it smells pretty bad. Dog just shit everywhere. How many hours you got in the simulator upstairs there? Uh, 14. Rookie Graham Ferguson is trying to prove to Buffalo Joe that he's got what it takes to co-pilot the DC-3. Why is your airspeed at 85 knots? Do you want to do it to the head temperature? Can you do that? When the flight encounters a problem. Is it smell pretty bad to you? A big, messy, smelly problem. <laughs> the dog had a shit. And that giant gray Dane, he <laughs> just, you shit everywhere, man. It's kind of funny, Joe just opened a window up and he's like, I gotta get some air out of here, <laughs> air this place out. I don't see Joe smile very often, but look, going into the cockpit, I saw Joe and he was laughing pretty good. He wants the dog shit. He, it put him in a really good mood. <laughs> like, you, he, he found it hilarious. Poor Andrew is stuck in the back and uh, had two cups trying to pick it up and dry heaving, and it stunk pretty, pretty wicked. Andrew's flight attendant corps somehow neglected to cover procedures for this kind of onboard emergency. You guys can move to the back if you want to. Yeah, we're out of here. Yeah, yeah move to the back. If you want. It's amazing how one little incident like that completely turned around the mood. I tell you, new experiences every time we take a trip. <laughs> I was expecting plop, plop, that. <laughs> it was like a guy. <laughs> In the cockpit, Graham's caught a break, thanks to a giant dog's nervous bowel. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fortunately, we'll be landing soon. So. Uh, I'll get you out of here as soon as I can. As soon as we're on the ground and the engines have stopped, get out as fast as you can. So sorry, guys, but it made for an interesting flight. The DC-3 touches down. Not a moment too soon for everyone on board. Another day in Yellowknife, and the freight keeps rolling into Buffalo's cargo terminal, with manager Kelly Jurasevich still fighting a lung infection. I've been taking these stupid antibiotics, and it, they're not kicking in this time. It's just we're getting worse and worse and worse, and I can't breathe at night. As soon as I freaking lay down, I just cough and cough and cough, and like I'm gonna freaking die. <coughs> <coughs> but Kelly's prayers have been answered. At least as far as work goes. Jesus. You must spend a fortune on gas. <laughs> Her niece and former assistant, Janelle Glenn, is back. I'm back. I don't know. It feels all right. It's good. Working, so I'm glad. I'm really excited about Janelle coming back because she cares about the position and the job and the customers, and she takes pride in her work. I know that the paperwork's going to be done properly. I know that she's going to make sure that that flight's pulled up properly and nothing's missed, because she gives a shit. So it takes a lot of stress off of me, having her here. We're going to do it uh, sort of four days on, four days off. Kelly and I will probably alternate shifts or whatever. I think it's just too, you know, it's too much for her. And, you know, six days a week sucks. So we're going to try and do it that way, like alternate Sundays and stuff like that, so that we don't have to be here all the time. Want to feel? No. Why? <laughs> I know you do. You're gonna. With Janelle sharing the load, the burden on Kelly's shoulders just got a lot lighter. In Venezuela, the water bomber inspection continues. Structurally, it seems like it's intact. All the cables, everything's there. There's not too many things that are busted on it. But now, Corey has to find out if the plane's electronics have survived after sitting dormant for nearly two decades. This could be the deal breaker. We'll see if we can get some action happening. Voltmeter works. There we go. 
full panel. Beacons on? Oh, he's got beacons. Well, so far, I mean, most of the stuff's working. Seems to be working. Corey's seen enough. Everything we've looked at has been in really good shape. A lot better shape than I anticipated. It's too good of a fuselage and airplane to strip. So I think we're going to make a go at it. This airplane is amazing. I think me, Corey, and Ian fell in love with it. It's uh, very beautiful, and uh, she deserves to be at work. Mikey has hit the jackpot. With new engines, the plane could be made ready to fly. The plane's done its part. It survived for the last 18 years. Now it's, uh, it's up to us to get the plane home. But that might be easier said than done. There's one crucial detail that could scuttle the whole thing. Who would ever thought a perfectly good 215 is sitting in South America? In Venezuela, Mikey McBride is riding high. The CL215 he found is everything he and his team had hoped for. That's a hero shot right there. All that stands in the way of Mikey returning home a hero is paperwork. We're just trying to see if we can find some paperwork uh, for the 215. The paperwork has been sitting here for 18 years, so hopefully it's around. So this is this is all the records you have? Yes. Like this is it. That's all on the But that's it, that's, that's it? How do they track all the components? Track the components? Yeah, like all the stuff on the airplane that needs to be changed when it runs out of time. You have of the avionic and on the Yeah, I know, but there's parts in the airplane that, that are time oh, okay. controlled. I mean after a certain amount of hours and cycles they run out of time. Without records proving when the aircraft was serviced and how many hours each component has been used, the plane would never be allowed to fly. Is, I mean, this is a good logbook, but it doesn't give us a shit. The only way to make the CL215 legal is to rebuild or replace virtually every component on the plane at a prohibitive cost of several million dollars. We have to assume that every part on the airplane is broken and it has to be fixed. Uh, we can't prove it's it's working properly. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, right now the airplane is not worth yes. nothing. I tried, I tried to, to find something. All Mikey can do now is go home and hope the Venezuelans find the missing records, or his quest will have been for nothing. On the next episode of Vice Pilots NWT, Operation Airlift. When the ferry linking north to south is grounded, Buffalo mounts a campaign to move vital goods. But can they keep up? Moving day, is it? A Mountie moves house and home Buffalo style. Bye bye, TV. And the McBrians sneak a peek at an important delivery of their own. On this episode of Vice Pilots NWT, Operation Airlift. When the ferry linking north to south is grounded, Buffalo mounts a campaign to move vital goods. Let me make a call. A Mountie moves house and home, Buffalo style. Bye bye, TV. And the McBrien sneak a peek at an important delivery of their own. In Canada's Northwest Territories, the ferry that crosses the broad Mackenzie River is a crucial link in the chain that keeps food, fuel, and other essentials flowing to the people of the North. But today... I just got a last minute phone call from a trucking company in town. Uh, the ferry that connects Yellowknife to the rest of the world has gone out. Normally, trucks haul basic supplies from the south up the Mackenzie Highway, then cross the Mackenzie River by ferry. That ferry is their only way across until the river freezes and an ice road opens. With the ferry out, the 25,000 people in Yellowknife 
and the remote northern communities beyond are left high and dry. Can't get any freight across the Mackenzie River to Yellowknife and then beyond up to Good Hope, Delny, Toledo, and Norwest. Twice a year, at spring thaw and fall freeze up, Buffalo's plains bridge the gap. But this ferry breakdown catches everyone by surprise. River shuttle. Right now? The solution? An emergency air freight shuttle out of the Hay River Airport, where truckloads of goods are already backing up. We got to the truck company uh, needs the DC-4 to go to Hay River to start river shuttle. Um, but I'm just getting word that it might not have this, the, the proper equipment installed quite yet. The timing is terrible. Buffalo's mighty four-engine DC-4, with its 20,000-pound hauling capacity, is the perfect plane for the job. But as Mikey tells his father, Joe McBrien, it's not going anywhere. Oh, yeah. RTL just called. They want a DC-4. But I guess DC-4 is not ready. What's the matter with it? No TCAS. TCAS stands for Traffic Collision Avoidance System. It's similar to radar used by air traffic controllers. An antenna on the roof and a computer processor and display installed in the cockpit provide a set of electronic eyes so the pilot can see other aircraft up to 64 kilometers away. Joe checks with his son, Rod, Buffalo's director of maintenance. No TCAS. No TCAS. New federal regulations require the DC-4 to have a TCAS installed, but Rod hasn't had a chance to add that technology on the plane yet. Joe's concerned that we don't have a DC-4 ready, um, but what I'll do is I'll get a DC-4, get that TCAS system completed. And Joe's also worried the smaller C-46 won't be able to keep up with the freight until the DC-4 is ready, and that Mikey's making promises he can't keep. You're going to commit yourself with no backup. Can't be relying on 146 that may be ready to be. We can't fight yesterday's fire. If we don't at least try, we don't get any of it. I know, I know, but we got it. it it's going out there with a, instead of a fire hole, you're trying to piss on the fire. Uh, my father's visibly upset because the DC-4 is better for the customer, um, hauls more freight. I wish we had a four, but we got to do what we can. We should have a couple horses and a sleigh and this, I'm doing the best as I, I can. Know, I know, I know you're doing the best you can, but we don't have any airplanes out there. Get her done. The only aircraft available to make shuttle runs throughout the day is one of Buffalo's two Curtis C-46s. The other C-46 will be needed on the regular Mackenzie Valley run. We need 146 to do the first trip in the day, yeah. back and in the valley. Okay. And then this thing, or one of them, just to do shuttles. Possibly, possibly four shuttles. Time's leaving in the morning for the first shuttle. It's going to be in here for six. For six. Maintenance supervisor Cliff Dyson and his team scramble to get the C-46 ready. Oh, we're going to jack up the C-46 and do a gear swing on it. A gear swing tests the landing gear, making sure the hydraulic system is raising, lowering, and locking the wheels properly. Built to survive World War II, the C-46 has no delicate electronics. It's purely mechanical. Okay. And virtually indestructible. Whacking the tire and jumping on the wing actually compresses the wheel strut back to the landing position. may seem like an unconventional way to reset the landing gear, but it works. The next morning, before dawn, the rescue mission kicks into gear. We'll do a run up at the threshold. Captain Devin Brooks, a three year Buffalo veteran, and co pilot Scott Blue, in his second year with the airline, brace themselves for a grueling day. There's a lot of situations at Buffalo where we go from sort of the normal operating 
tempo into a jacked up level. 100,000 pounds of freight need to be moved from Hay River to Yellowknife to ultimately reach more than 25,000 people. Everything looks good. Everything looks good this side. With the C-46's cruising speed of 300 kilometers per hour, they'll be in Hay River in less than 45 minutes. At the Hay River Airport, trucks loaded with freight to be flown to Yellowknife and beyond are already lining up. And already starting his day from hell is cargo coordinator Jack Sim. Keep him coming. We'll keep, keep hauling. I don't give a shit. His job today? To get the freight off the trucks and onto the planes as fast as possible. If you want something done, you got to get Buffalo to do it. Or else you're never going to get your groceries over there. Jack's all set as Devin and Scott land their C-46 in Hay River. I have never seen it this chaotic down here. Buffalo's other C-46 is already here to pick up one load before it's needed on the valley run later today. AJ's going to go home with the load, and then he's going to go up the valley, and we're going to bring all the food up throughout the day today. So yeah, pretty much everything has to be flown over today. A C-46 can carry about 13,000 pounds of freight per trip. AJ, you able to take any of that bread that's sitting on the ground there? Yeah. Buffalo also has a DC-3 here this morning, and it can haul 7,000 pounds. But there are 100,000 pounds of cargo to shuttle to Yellowknife. These first trips will only move a third of that. AJ takes off in his C-46 with the first load. This sled, one more skidoo, and uh, that's it, then we're back to Yellowknife. One, two, three, go. And just a little bit more than we can get it. Perfect, shot. As dawn breaks, the other C-46 is packed to the struts. Reach the maximum amount of stuff that we're all comfortable in taking. We're going to load up and rock and roll. But we'll be back soon. Hello, Jack here. Mikey TXW is loaded. Weighed down with a full load, Devin and Scott's C-46 struggles to get airborne. At the Yellowknife cargo terminal. <clears throat> so bring that other skid over here. Janelle Glenn has a nightmare on her hands. So Fort Good Hope will leave on this pallet. She's just started job sharing with overwhelmed cargo manager Kelly Jurasevich. This morning, Kelly is homesick, and Janelle has arrived to chaos. What is in there, though? Is it frozen or is it general? General. This freaking shit is nuts, man. Yeah. Yes. Freight for the regular valley run is backing up and AJ's already arrived with the first river shuttle load. Today's, today's a very stressful day. We have probably the amount of flights we do today would be equivalent to a week's worth of work in one day. OK, I'm going to move all that shit. Don't move all that shit. Approaching Yellowknife. Devin and Scott have the runway in sight and Scott's getting a chance to land the plane. They're all complete, sir. Thank you. Let it slow down on its own. Let it slow. Keep flying it to the ground. Settle it on. Good. I got it. You got it. Packed to the hilt, their C-46 will have to be quickly offloaded and sent back to Hay River for another load. But as the plane arrives and Janelle heads out to meet it, it's icy. 
she encounters a major snack. Is that stuff, fire? Yes, it is. It's your load of work. I suppose she's not even going. To, they haven't had a going today, have they? You know what? Let me make a call. I'll be right back. Back in there to take freight. I just got stuff. The road to the tarmac is blocked. This river shuttle is already in trouble. Is that stuff, fire? Yes, it is. It's your load of work. You know what? Let me make a call. I'll be right back. On a day that Buffalo can't afford to have anything go wrong, something already has. An 18-wheeler has skidded across the road, blocking the cargo terminal from the tarmac, where a fully packed C-46 needs to be unloaded. Too slow to call. Until the truck is moved, Buffalo's emergency river shuttle is paralyzed. Cargo supervisor Janelle Glenn now has to find a way to get the truck off the road. Can we get the loader? He's stuck in the middle of the road. Sorry, man. It's a little hectic. Trucks get stuck, you know? You just can't, can't predict what's going to happen in a day. But just as Janelle has one obstacle removed... You got to be kidding me. Died on me. Another setback. Never, I've never filled it since I've been here. The forklift has run out of gas. Go run to that auto shop over there yeah. and ask Randy to get you a, a jerry can of diesel. Diesel, eh? Well, you know, you have to be go, go, go in this job, and you really can't just be like, oh, well, that box is 60 pounds. I can't lift that. Because if there's nobody around, then it's not going to get done. With the forklift back to life, Janelle pushes hard to get the freight moving. It's coming right now. The freed truck rolls up, ready to take the supplies into Yellowknife. OK, now back out while you're going down. Watch behind you. This is all ours, so we can go next door. Down. You're good. At last, Janelle gets the final skid away. And with the first load emptied, her boyfriend Devin gets set to head back to Hay River. Oh, Jack Malcolm will be there in 45 minutes. Okay. We'll be there around quarter after 12, 12.30. Okay. I love you too. See you later. See you at Hay River. While Buffalo is throwing all available aircraft at the river shuttle. Okay. Yeah. Mikey's still okay. dealing with a full slate of other contracts. Wow, well, the river shuttle's sure sucking up all the resources, and you got we got actually a lot more to do, too. In Lutzelke, a Chippewayan native community on the east arm of Great Slave Lake, an RCMP corporal is waiting. Corporal Sheldon Robb, uh, personally stationed in Lutzelke, detached commander, and going to be transferring to uh, Delaney Detachment uh, in Delaney. Corporal Rob is carrying on the time-honored RCMP tradition of serving as a northern nomad. It's fun to, uh, to work in here. It's uh, enjoyable. In the 1870s, the newly formed Northwest Mounted Police sent a band of hardy officers to the territories to keep the law in the wild frontier. In 1920, the force became the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. To this day, officers serve far-flung settlements across the north picking up their lives for a new posting every few years. Yeah, I'm sad to go, but it's uh, a new adventure to go to somewhere else here in the north as well. It'll be my uh, fourth posting, so, in the Northwest Territories. Corporal Rob is moving from Lutzelke to Delaney, 700 kilometers northwest. And with no road access, he couldn't just hire a van. He had to book Buffalo Airways. Stay over the lake if we got to do a 360, so be it. Yep. Flying in a DC-3, Captain Justin Simley and co-pilot Ian Bottomley are on their way to pick up his goods. Approach briefing. Picked up a little bit of ice there. That's good. But they're battling unexpected freezing rain, creating visibility problems. Be able to see here. Justin and Ian need a clear view of the terrain below in order to land. So they begin their descent to get beneath the clouds and free themselves of further icing. Hey, keep her coming down, brother. Roger. I got a good run at this one. Uh, what the f have we got here? Distance is nine miles. The 
Mutsil K landing strip is not well marked. Let's go to the other side of this island and we'll come around. As they come around, they finally spot a snow-covered field. All right, I like this. It's the runway. Pull flap. Pull flap. Final check. Clear. 65. And we're there. Time for Justin and Ian to start loading all the worldly possessions of an RCMP corporal on the move. How you doing? Good yourself. Real good today. Doing a good job. It's moving day, is it? Yeah. But the corporal has a major concern about one possession indispensable to surviving the northern winter. That's my big screen TV, though. I don't want to see that broken, though. Well, I bought my big screen TV in 1995 when I was in high level Alberta there. And it's made the move from high level to Nuvik, to Hay River, to Litsuke, and now to Delaney. A good satellite TV is always good to have here in these communities, too, to help pass the time by. So, With the TV and other lesser essentials on board, Justin is ready to head to Delaney. Corporal Rob will fly in later. Have fun, Delaney. Nice meeting you. You Pleasure take care. Fine. You yeah, too. Very eh? good work, you guys. Keep yeah. up the good work, and yeah. uh, we'll see you around. Thanks very much. We yeah, like thanks. working with you. A happy customer, as long as his big screen TV arrives in one piece. Bye bye, TV. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Yellowknife, Buffalo desperately needs to get the DC-4 in the game to help clear the river shuttle backlog. According to new federal regulations, mechanics must install a piece of technology called a TCAS, a traffic collision avoidance system. We're working hard trying to get it installed so the DC-4 can join the 46 down in Hay River during the river shuttle but it may be too late. Technically, we needed that TCAS and that DC-4 yesterday. As Joe warned, Mikey may have promised more than he can deliver. With the ferry linking Yellowknife to the south broken down. That's heavy. Buffalo Airways has a DC-3 and one C-46 airlifting cargo from Hay River. They're shuttling the freight across Great Slave Lake to Yellowknife, where it's being sorted and distributed. But as the trucks keep coming, they're having trouble keeping up with the backlog. We got to go find some tarps or something to get over some of this frozen, or the ravens are going to get into it. And now, cargo coordinator Jack Sim has a new problem. Get out of here! Tin foil, you moron! Oh, it's Kinder Eggs. The one box that had something in it, he figured it out. He didn't want to eat the mops. So Jack's come up with a plan. It's just a waiting game with him now. Eh? It's man versus raven. Man had gun, it wouldn't be a competition. It'd be raven versus ground. But it looks like the scavenger may win this standoff. As a bigger bird arrives to claim Jack's attention. Let's uh, get the produce on his pallet. There's a mountain of cargo still to move. We got to unload them in that bitter cold and get him into a plane immediately before the groceries freeze. We can't have that happen. Actually, the loads are going real well. Then more help arrives. A DC-3 taxis in. Now Jack has two planes on the job. So you're trying to coordinate two or three planes at the same time and load them. Can pop pallet off and just throw it over on the side here? All right. We'll try to grab this one. We'll get a pallet jack in there. It's a lot of running and a lot of phone calls and a lot of screaming and hollering, but you get her done. Oh, the other one's gone. Five zero. Three zero. With the second crew, Jack has some extra hands. Box by box, they give it everything they've got. Ready where you are. But without the biggest plane in the fleet, 
the DC-4, it's an endless task. Basically, the 46 hauls two-thirds of what a DC-4 does. On this trip, because it's a short distance, uh, the DC-4 is more effective and efficient airplane, uh, so we need it on the job as soon as possible. Yeah, basically, if the DC-4 was operational right now, we'd have every pilot and every type of machine except the electro down here. Yeah? Organized chaos. So Organized like chaos. There you go. And during all the chaos, the scavenger returns. Raven going at the food over there. Check it out. The Raven. The Raven. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in the Yellowknife hangar, mechanics are pushing to get the DC-4 airworthy. With its 20,000 pound cargo capacity, the four would be the ideal aircraft for this airlift. In fact, it's the same plane that was used 60 years ago in the most famous airlift ever, the Berlin Airlift back in 1948. After World War II, the Soviets who occupied the east side of Berlin blocked road and railway access to West Berlin controlled by Britain, France, and the United States. In response, the Western Allies organized a massive airlift to get supplies to the innocent Berliners trapped in their own city. The determined spirit of free Berlin, backed by the Allied airlift, keeps the Soviet aggression... It was a 15-month operation. Modified DC-4s and other military aircraft lifted over two million tons of food and supplies. The Hay River airlift is much smaller, but as important for Northerners. Virtually the same distance, same airplane, and uh, for the same reason, keep people going till, till their uh, main supply opens up again. Well, I'm making out OK, you know, they... Uh... But with the DC-4 still in maintenance, the going is slow. And it looks like it won't get any faster. Rod McBrien's wife, Sasha, arrives with a school tour she booked weeks ago. Hey, everybody. What's happening? What do you have lined up for us? We're going to go inside the hangar. For everyone who wants to just follow Mikey. No way. Rod first met Sasha, a farm girl from the south, 10 years ago. I took my first job teaching at Hay River. I came up to Yellowknife on Buffalo, and uh, Joe was excited to meet new teachers from Hay River and didn't charge me. So I don't think I've paid for a Buffalo ticket yet. <laughs> and I met Rod that weekend. So this, uh, this airplane right here is the CL-215. This is the one that does uh, all the water bombing. Curtis. Sasha's class gets up close and personal with living history, planes that first flew long before their parents were even born. How long does it take to get uh, water? It takes about uh, six to 10 seconds to fill the plane. 13, 14,000 pounds a day, it flies 1,000 miles a day, um, five days a week. If you were to go for a ride in the airplane, it's really nice and smooth in the air, but the landing and takeoff is it's quite exciting. I'm not really a big group of kids type person. I guess I've been stuck in the hangar the whole time. I wasn't really exposed to the general public. But he needs to get used to kids fast. Rod and Sasha are expecting their first child. Both Rod and I always knew that we wanted to have kids. Rod's never felt like we needed to be in a rush for anything. He's always told me that we're young. And when things are ready to happen, they'll happen. I have to prepare you know, to become a new father. Unlike preparing for a job with aircraft or preparing an aircraft, I don't know what I'm doing. When I went to school, that's what everybody talked about is World War II. I guess now we talk about Desert Storm and stuff, right? Family guy, eh? The history of The Simpsons. I think Rod's got pretty limited experience with kids, so I think this is a good test for him to see how he can uh, test his patience when uh, once his little one shows up. I had to raise Mikey. I was like 13 years old and I had to change his diapers and make him watch The Simpsons was the only thing that shut him up. These ones are also indicators of direction. I think I'm handling the pregnancy pretty calm. Healthy, not healthy, whatever happens. This is the best, this is my motto. We'll just, we'll just take it one day at a time. And an upcoming ultrasound will give Rod a fuzzy glimpse of his future. 
flying over the Mackenzie Valley. It's a beautiful day. I'm on our way to Delaney. DC-3 Captain Justin Simley is transporting an RCMP corporal's belongings to his new home. Delaney, population 560, is an aboriginal community that has been around for centuries. The lifestyle here is a mix of modern and traditional. At the Delaney airstrip, Justin meets moving man Lindsay Blake. How are you, man? Good, good. Good to see you guys. Long time no see. Yeah, you gotcha. How you been? Sorry we're a little late. How long have oh. you been here? They unload Corporal Rob's stuff. A mishap with one piece in particular could get them arrested. Big screen TV? Yes, sir. Gotta stay busy in Delaney doing something, I oh, guess. Oh, yeah. New sheriff in town. Yeah, we moved him from Anubic uh, several years ago. The North is a small world. Buffalo's work is done here. So Justin heads back to Yellowknife to join the river shuttle. In town, Lindsay sets up Corporal Rob's new home. Seems the two men have some history. I've been in the North 15 years, and the only time I've ever been given a uh, traffic violation was with Sheldon Rob, the guy moving in right now. He gave me a $500 traffic ticket because my registration was two days overdue. Memories like this can turn big screen TVs into broken screen TVs. Meanwhile, Corporal Rob is already on the job. Sheldon Morning. Rob, Chief Raymond Tucho. Raymond Tucho. Nice to meet you. First order of business, meeting with the local band council chief. Good. This is Jim's replacement there, Raymond. With only a two or three person detachment in small settlements, the Mounties must forge strong relationships in the community. Yeah, it's important to become part of the community and, uh, you know, it helps get the respect of the people and uh, if you give it that, you'll get that in return. Having moved four times in the north, Corporal Rob never knows what his accommodations will be like. There, we're home. Oh, nice house. Oh, yeah, these are nice. Oh, I'm very, very happy with this house. All that's left is a bit of unfinished business. It's been a while, but you must remember me from that uh, ticket you gave me, $500 ticket, first time we ever met. For no There's registration, no in my, no registration <laughs> on my uh, Mustang. But no hard feelings. Lindsay's left the TV in one piece. <laughs> All right, we'll, well some paperwork Any consolation, here. Lindsay, I would give my own mama a ticket. <laughs> That's good. That's good to know. <laughs> Excellent. Back at the Yellowknife cargo terminal. Forgot how much energy it takes. <laughs> The stress of handling massive loads from the river shuttle and untangling freight mix-ups for the valley runs is taking its toll on Janelle. I'm a little irritated right now because, like, look at this warehouse. It's a friggin' mess. Is this all Good Hope? Yes. No, this is Delaney here. Oh, and there's a Toledo on there, too. Things were not put in their proper place. Uh, there was no proper paperwork on certain things. Jesus, Janelle calls her colleague Jack in Hay River to vent. What's the matter? It's a goddamn shit show oh, here. That's what I'm, that's what's happening. Okay, there's freaking frozen still sitting here in the truck. What do you mean? In the freaking truck since Sunday. Oh. It's a freaking nightmare here. Oh, I think I got another truck. Okay, bye. With a steady stream of freight rolling into Hay River, it's no picnic for Jack either. What airline's taking your freight? They never told you? No. But there's a ray of light. In Yellowknife, the DC-4 is finally ready to join the river shuttle. And not a minute too soon. With its 20,000-pound hauling capacity, the DC-4 should make all the difference. It's been a couple of weeks since she's warm. Back from Delaney, Justin checks the oil and fuel levels in the DC-4's wing tanks. The 4 has no cockpit fuel gauges. 
Justin and co-pilot Sean Barry fire her up. All systems go. But suddenly, a snag. I got no pressure. Justin stops the DC-4 well short of the runway. Hang on, Justin. An oil leak from the number three engine. I'm not needed. We get the DC-4 started up, we're all ready to go, and bang, massive oil leak. Now there's another problem we have to deal with. What a bad time for this to happen. Justin has no choice but to head back to the hangar. There's still an enormous amount of freight in Hay River that needs to be flown to Yellowknife. But with time ticking and oil leaking, the DC-4 may never come to the rescue. With the Mackenzie River Ferry out of operation, Don't move all that. it's been a crazy day at Buffalo. Let me make a call, I'll be right back. Organized chaos. Organized chaos. There you go. Everyone's been going full on to airlift freight from Hay River to Yellowknife. Devon C-46 has been making runs since before dawn. I don't think too many people will starve by the amount of food we've taken up to Yellowknife today, so. But they've only moved a little over half the cargo so far. Buffalo really needs the DC-4 to get in the game. On this trip, because it's a short distance, uh, the DC-4 is more effective and efficient airplane, uh, so we need it on the job as soon as possible. I got no pressure. But just as Captain Justin Simley was set to take off, one of the four's engines sprung a leak. I got an oil leak on uh, number three engine, so boys are going to have a look at it here. Buffalo's maintenance team leaps into action. You're gonna get problems when it gets cold, man. That's just the way it is, so. Uh, we got great engineers here. They, they're doing their damnedest to get us going again. An oil leak on lots of oil. We have to wash it and run it, and we'll see where it's coming from. They wash off the excess oil, revealing the source of the leak. Oh, it's a loose rock recover. Not to keep loose on the cover, so we just got to tighten it up and check it over, make sure it's good, and we'll be good to go. An easy fix. The plane is pronounced fit to fly. So, for the second time today, the DC-4 will attempt to take off for Hay River. You ready? This time, there's no snag. With the DC-4 safely away, Rod McBrien slips out for an important appointment. He and wife Sasha are having a 3D ultrasound of their unborn baby. And like any new parents, they're nervous. Kind of a scary at first. Jake's head is right here. I think it is definitely a mother's worry or parents' worry till the baby's born. You know that everything's okay. And that's the head. That's the little head right there. The top. Does he have really large lips? That's his eyes, his nose, his full lips. Yeah. And then his lip looks like Mikey's lip. He's smiling. That's really good in there, right? That is so cute. Did you see that? Look at that big smile. I don't know if smile. Everything's looking A-OK, -okay, and their relief inspires a plan. We really wanted the DVD because we hadn't told anybody that we were going to get the 3D ultrasound. 
and the families are both pretty excited. We're going to show them these pictures and DVD. I think it's a pretty cool surprise. After a day of setbacks, Buffalo's DC-4 finally makes it to Hay River. With its cargo capacity of 20,000 pounds, it's the edge that Buffalo has desperately needed for this emergency airlift. It's all hands on deck. Even 67-year-old chief pilot Arnie Schrader pushes pallets. You need a strap in there, boys, or? Go, go, go. It's been a long day. I don't know if it's the airplane or the operator, Arnie, but OK, you're not allowed to drive anymore. <laughs> get, get, get out of the way. I'm driving. Packed to the ceiling, the DC-4 is ready to head home. With another 18-wheeler full of freight for Yellowknife, Justin will have to race back for one last load before his duty day runs out. Today was worked perfect. Everything worked perfect. So it doesn't get any better than this. But back in the Yellowknife cargo terminal. You can just separate it later. It's been a freaking gong show today. With two more massive loads of cargo still to come in on the DC-4, for Janelle, it ain't over yet. Buffalo's river shuttle is winding down. The last load of freight from Hay River is on its way to Yellowknife. But at the Yellowknife cargo terminal, Janelle Glenn is still going full tilt to try to keep up with the massive backlog. I'm fing exhausted today. She's moved mountains of cargo so far, and there's still one more plane to come. Play. Right wheel first. Not sure I'm going to no hurry to try the brake. The DC-4 is back with the last 20,000 pounds. It, it can be a nightmare, it can be a gong show, but at the end of the day, these people depend on you. It's not, it's not just something that you can be like, oh, whatever, I guess they didn't get their milk today. I think it's the first time in Buffalo history down there, it took all day and half the night to do freight. <laughs> and there's some good news about the river ferry. We just got word that the ferry's going in tomorrow. We moved 100,000 pounds in one day. That's freaking awesome for the last minute. By tomorrow, because of Buffalo, Arctic outposts will get their provisions on time. After 24 hours from hell, the McBrien clan gathers for a much needed break the next day in Hay River. Hey, sweetheart. A rare family dinner hosted by Joe's daughter, Kathy, and her husband, Fraser. No phones ringing during dinner. Yeah, everybody loves King Crab. Kathy and Fraser always put on a good dinner party. They prep, they serve, they keep the whole flow going. They don't um, make anybody do dishes. For a family that works together every day, the McBrien's don't often sit down for a meal together. Oh my god, look at that. That's why I didn't go to work this morning. I've been I up since 5 preparing. Yeah, right. The only non-family member at this gathering is Mikey's girlfriend, Gail. Gail is an amazing, amazing person. And uh, we both wonder every day why she's even with me, because it, as it, we're like the original odd couple. We have absolutely nothing in common at all. My family likes her better than they like me. Yeah, she gets invited to family dinners where they just forget to invite me. Yeah, don't scare her off. We want to keep Gail around. I just want Mikey to marry her now before she clues in and leaves. But tonight, it's all about grandchildren. With Kathy's kids in their teens, Sasha. Rod and Sasha's baby will be the first McBrien grandchild in 15 years. Yeah. Already have this. <laughs> Buffalo Joe and especially wife Sharon are anxious for the wait to be over. Sharon is pacing the floors for this baby. She she can't wait. 
we're going to have a grandchild, so we're looking forward to that. And the family will get a glimpse of the new baby sooner than they think. Well, we have a surprise video for you guys, so you want to come downstairs and watch it. Where's the popcorn? Are you still hungry? <laughs> Jasper, I may be sitting Jasper. Come on, go for the truck ride. Come on, Dad, you can do it. I'm getting a guilt thing here. Okay, here's baby Eddie. Where is it? Can you can you see him? Oh, look at the baby. Oh, it's oh Sasha. Oh, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, there. That's his, that's his nose. <laughs> yeah. There's two hands. Oh, good. <laughs> I think Joe's very excited about Rod having a baby. I think he's been waiting a long time for this. And in just over a month, the wait will be over, and the newest McBrien will meet the family. Oh, there's the smile. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Buffalo springs into action when disaster strikes Haiti. There's a lot of suffering down there. Chuck clashes with the pilots. Good trying to be up that cockpit, dude. When he tackles a problem his way. Don't f with the Chuck. And Audrey returns, but lands in the hot seat beside Joe. We're way off it again. On this episode of Ice Pilots, Buffalo springs into action when disaster strikes Haiti. There's a lot of suffering down there. Chuck clashes with the pilots. Good trying to be up that cockpit, dude. When he tackles a problem his way. Don't with the Chuck. And Audrey returns, but lands in the hot seat beside Joe. We're way up. At Buffalo Airways, they're scrambling to free a snowbound cargo plane from its cold storage. It's been on ice since work dried up six months ago. But today, Buffalo got a call about a catastrophe almost 6,000 kilometers away. As most of the population of planet Earth knows that there was a, a massive earthquake in Haiti, and we really thought we're out of the scope of being able to help. An aviation contact in Miami sent an SOS to Buffalo to help in the relief effort. Buffalo has sturdy warplanes and cargo haulers that can land on almost any airstrip. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. We're we're just a uh, little green airline, and uh, we're we're invited to the big uh, the big show. But the ideal plane is nowhere near ready to fly. This stuff always happens when you have a major like an earthquake like that. Everybody's phoning everybody for an airplane. The plan is for Buffalo to fly to Miami and then shuttle relief supplies from there 1,100 kilometers across the Caribbean Sea to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, for as many weeks as it takes. This is completely out of our normal envelope of operations. We gotta be very, very flexible and, and do what is needed at that time. And the first step is getting the L-188 Lockheed Electra out of its frigid parking spot. We should have never shut it down. The Electra's chief engineer, Chuck Adams, has to check all the components on this plane in record time. I just shoved this off a week ago. Chuck knows every bolt and rivet on Buffalo's most modern plane. The 50-year-old four-engine turboprop Electra is loaded with electronic features not found on Buffalo's older radial engine planes. You don't learn it overnight. It took me about 10 years before I actually really knew the airplane quite well. On the surface, Chuck is very uh, abrasive and uh, very uh, colorful. Some people get offended. Well, too bad. They should worry about what's going on in the world, not what Chuck's saying. But when it gets down to fixing things on a budget, Chuck is one of the best in the world. I think I'm going to try and back this out of here today, just to see if I can.
but the Electra is in no hurry to go anywhere. Its wheels are frozen square and refusing to budge. Frozen to the ground. Bucky! Chuck calls for extra power and lines up for round two. Finally, the Electra lurches forward. Oh, oh, oh. They've smacked the wing right into the side of the hangar. This fender bender has left a minor dent. Step forward! And it's a delay they just don't need. Because now, the real job begins. After months buried in the snow, every major system has to be inspected and brought up to spec to get the Electra fit to handle the relief mission to Haiti. The call Electra, it's an electrical nightmare. Look at this shit. There's wires hanging everywhere. The Electra went into service as a mid-range passenger liner in 1959. Its turboprop engines use gas turbines to drive the propellers, the same kind of turbine that creates propulsion in a jet engine. By the mid-1960s, those more advanced jets had taken over passenger travel. The Electra was out of date after just a few years in service. Production ended, and the Electra's brief heyday was over. But at Buffalo, it's the most modern and fastest plane in the fleet. Pressurized, it can fly at higher altitudes, where thinner air offers less resistance. Right now, Buffalo needs to get an Electra crew up to speed. OK, we're going to, I guess we're going to do the big shuffle here. Enter former Buffalo Electra captain Brian Harrison. Well, we're just getting the guys organized. Uh, you're going to move the C-46, you're going to move the DC-3, then we're going to pull the Electra out. He's up from his home in Edmonton to retrain the flight crew, because there's no one at Buffalo with an up-to-date Electra license. Like we have to do recurrent training every six months. We've got to do an instrument ride and a, and a pilot proficiency ride every year, and our time is up. I wanted to do this training a long time ago, because like, this is what happens. Stuff comes up, and then nobody's current. With no electric jobs in the last six months, Joe hasn't kept the pilot certified to fly it, because training runs cost big money. The airplane burns about 2,500 liters an hour. And I think the fuel cost here is around $1.70 a liter for a turbo fuel. So that means we're burning uh, 40, you know, pretty near $4,500 an hour. You know, it's inflow, outflow. If you shit more than you eat, you'll shit yourself to death. So be sure you get lots of flow coming in. Now that there is finally some potential cash flow, Brian needs to get the crew ready. He's just back from a four-month contract flying jetliners in Saudi Arabia. It sure doesn't look like a 747. The world is, is much different, you know, 747, you wear a uniform and you walk on the airplane and uh, it gets loaded for you and unloaded for you and uh, this, it's a little bit different world. You uh, do just about everything that has to be done to get the airplane going. I've flown this an awful lot, so it's kind of like riding a bicycle. <laughs> but only if the Electra is fit to fly. And that's what they're about to find out. Once the electric is ready, then we can see if we can try to get uh, the electric down for this uh, humanitarian work into Haiti. The crew does a complete system check. Start number four, please. Been cleared to the de-ice pad, is that correct? Yes. They taxi out to where they can run up the plane's engines at full throttle to make sure she's ready to fly. Your brakes are set. Okay, all right, so mid horsepower number four was what? 50? If everything checks out with the plane, they'll start retraining the crew tomorrow so they can be in Haiti as soon as possible. Shaft horsepower calculation. 3650. Torque check, you rise. Three guard power lever until RPM reaches 13820. Okay, full reverse and fuel flow and we're done. Pretty awesome for sitting there out for so long. Yeah. The verdict is in. 
the Electra is in excellent shape. Actually, I'd go do triple it right now. I might think twice about it. Oh, yeah. But Brian's about to get a nasty surprise, a problem that no mechanic can fix. a.m. at the Buffalo Hangar in Hay River. 200 kilometers southwest of Yellowknife, and winter is unleashing her worst. It's no one's idea of a perfect first day on the job. Ugly conditions for Buffalo's newest rampy, Richard Adams, straight out of Alberta and eight feet up on an icy wing. Harden him up the first day. It'll be good for him. Bill character. A rampy's life is all about backbreaking grunt work prepping planes, hauling baggage, and making deliveries in wicked cold temperatures. But Richard's baptism by blizzard is good news to senior Hay River Rampy, Chris Matheson. Uh, that's a little bit gnarly, like I told him, hey, Richard? <laughs> After slogging it out here for three of the coldest months of the year, Chris is next in line to move across the lake to Yellowknife, where Rampy can actually get a shot at flying. Justin, who's flying the skid uh, this week, came over and approached me and uh, told me some good news. He said, hey, you know what, Chris? Uh, you're moving up to Yellowknife. <laughs> and uh, you know what else? <laughs> you got about a week to figure it out. <laughs> Chris needs to make sure the new guy is trained to shoulder his share of the load before moving on, and hopefully up. So you can, if you pull back just a little bit, it'll go like millimeters at a time. Looking good, Richard. Good, you're through. The last thing you want to do is put the forks to the side of Joe's plane. <laughs> you did good. I'm impressed. But 2,000 kilometers away, there's a wild card headed straight for Yellowknife. Audrey Marchand is on her way back to Buffalo, and that could scuttle the plans of rampies like Chris, who hope to be moving up the ranks. I went back home for about three months, and uh, now I'm back, back to Buffalo again. Audrey was one of the hardest workers on the ramp last year. The reason you're here is to learn, and it's strictly up to you. And she was one of Buffalo Joe's favorite employees. But some people thought she had an unfair advantage in the rampy rally to move up to a pilot job. If there's anybody who's gonna jump somebody in line, it's a girl. Back in the fall, Audrey returned to Quebec for the birth of her new baby sister. Well, my mom had kind of um, a health problem and my sister too. The other rampies thought Audrey was gone for good. Now there's fear that she might jump them in line. Like if I come back and I'm checked out pretty much right away, for me it's fair. But I will understand that for them, it's kind of unfair, and I know that they will have a hard time dealing with that. It has to be fair for everybody, but it has to be fair for me first. With Audrey heading back to the Buffalo Ram, Chris and the other rampies could all be stuck. Keep it going. In Yellowknife, Chuck and his electro protege, Adam Smith, are tracking down some minor problems from yesterday's test. Until everything is working perfectly on the plane, it can't fly to Haiti to help in the relief effort. I see what all this crap looks like. But sometimes, small problems can be the worst kind. From a mechanical perspective, it's not too bad so far. This, From this airplane is a lot more challenging than the old ones, I'll tell you that. From an electrical perspective, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Replacing one faulty gauge is taking all day. It's on. 40-year-old wires in the thing now, and they're all getting old and brittle. So every time you move one little thing, whole, like three or four more things break. There's another broken wire right there. Chuck is a teacher, is a phenomenal person to learn from. He's got a lot of experience. He's got a semi-can-do attitude. There's more wire in here than I got pubic hairs. All Joe wants is to hey, join Justin. in the relief effort in Haiti. Have you seen Ernie? But he's hit a major snag. Are, are you okay to, to train or is there I'll a problem? Who said that? Dave Smith. He's just sending me an email now. He says, because I didn't do a loft in November, that my PPC is not valid. Give me his phone number. Well, he Simply put, number. Brian is missing a single well, one hour training session. That makes his electro license as expired as everyone else's. Yeah, I just drove me Brian Buffalo Yellowknife. 
Well, I'm trying to find out from the horse's mouth why Brian can't train my crew because it appears he's missed some uh, six months, one hour, something. Oh yeah, yeah, I understand that. Well, wave it. But government regulator Transport Canada isn't budging. Without Brian to train the crew, the entire mission to Haiti could be over before it even begins. Frustrating. That's just the worst way to put it. Recurrency. I do not have at this minute a training captain to train anybody. So I would suggest that we put everything on hold and we all go home, put the airplane back in the snowbank until I figure this out. A new day at Buffalo. The Electra is ready to go. It's been called to help airlift supplies to the millions of people suffering from a devastating earthquake in Haiti. I don't know whether we should tolerate that or not. Oh. A good engineer would have had that thing. Good time to be up in that cockpit, too. Yeah, the airplane's ready now. But there are still several issues to resolve. There's paperwork, there's uh, customs, there's, you're, you're dealing with three different countries. You got Canada, you got US, and you got Haiti. Uh, so there's a lot of ducks you had to have in your row. And the biggest obstacle is getting the Electra crew recertified right away. Fortunately, a pilot who can do the Electra proficiency rides has been found. The standard uh, IFR maneuvers, holds and approaches, and then we'll uh, integrate some the basic emergency procedures in there as well, engine failures, engine fires, all simulated, of course, just for uh, crew training purposes. It will take a few days of flying to recertify. Clear on one when you're ready. Before the Electra crew can take off from Miami to join the Haiti relief effort. Currently Yellowknife Airport, Yellowknife 1 departure, ready to taxi. Then, oh, really? News from Miami. The Haiti contract is dead. Okay, is there, uh, is there anything we can do to... Uh... A major disappointment for Mikey. Well, thank you, and uh, good luck with everything, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Bye. Well, we just received a phone call uh, from uh, the people that are organizing the relief effort for Haiti, and uh, as it turns out right now, they're, they're up to their capacity of, uh, of aircraft. They basically, every available aircraft in the world is technically there. We were uh, pushed to the back of the line, and uh, we missed out on this one, which is kind of sucks. It could have been a huge contract in a stone-cold economy. Now, Buffalo's invested in the training, and there's no payoff in sight. 15, 14, 13. Early the next morning, Ramp Hand and aspiring Buffalo pilot Audrey Marchand arrives to a warm Buffalo welcome. How are you doing there? Welcome back. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fellow rampy Chris Matheson had barely arrived at Buffalo last fall when Audrey left for home. Good morning, John. Now, she'll be tough competition for him and for fellow rampy John Martin. I know you're French, so you're But those who are already Buffalo pilots and outside the rampy rivalry are just happy to see her. Good, good. Welcome back. Audrey's a happy, very upbeat person. It's Monday morning, a lot earlier than I'd like to be awake, and uh, she's here and just has her little infectious charm to her and puts a smile on everybody's face. We missed you. Did you? We did, you little shit. <laughs> Bubbly little thing bouncing around all the time. Yeah, that was a really good day. But in rampy politics, the opinion that really matters belongs to the guy flying the sked, the daily scheduled passenger flight from Hay River. Hey. Good morning, Joe. How are you? Good, good. Stay back. <laughs> Sometimes you end up surrounded by a bunch of whiners and crabbers and bitchers. It's always nice to have one that, um, that 
It has a natural smile and, and a laugh. Welcome home. Thank you. Giving me a hug and telling me that he's happy that I'm back, well, for me, it means a lot. <laughs> but her return won't be good news for everybody. Later that morning, the electropilot proficiency rides continue. Even though there's no rush now, Joe decides to finish the training. But it's costing him $4,500 an hour in fuel alone. But Mikey might have found a way to make all that training pay off in the nick of time. If they're done training, uh, I got a customer, uh, none of it power, and they need a trip to Cambridge Bay, which will help offset the cost of training. During the Cold War, Cambridge Bay on Victoria Island was the site of a distant early warning line radar station. New line, it became. A system set up to protect North America from possible Soviet attack across the North Pole. Men had to conquer that unknown frozen wasteland and transform it into a vital outpost of Western civilization. Most dew line stations in Canada shut down in 1985. Only Cambridge Bay and seven others were transformed into part of the new, smaller North Warning System. It provides airspace surveillance of Canada's northern border. Today, this outpost of 1,500 souls needs a massive piece of equipment called a heat exchanger to keep the generators cool in the town's main power station. Uh, yeah, if the big one fits, you get the trip. The airplanes we have, the doors are on the side. So that means when an object goes in, it also has to turn a corner. So this thing was basically at the limits of the Electra. Uh, that's over six feet tall now. We can take those off. And the door is six feet. If the piece doesn't fit, we don't get the trip, which means that we're going to have to do the ride of shame and take all the equipment with our forklift down, down the first stair so it can go on the hurt. The competition's Hercules loads from behind and can take the cargo straight in. Buffalo can't afford to lose this contract. Forty-something thousand dollar trip. We had to make that trip. Keep Joe happy. Got to try. Got to make do. If you don't try, it ain't going to work now, is it, eh, hey, little brother? When the Electra rolls in, Chuck will have to make the heat exchanger fit somehow. Any hey, chainsaws? After spending thousands of dollars to recertify the Electra crew for a relief mission to Haiti that didn't end up happening, Go. Yeah. Cambridge. 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 Buffalo has lined up a contract that will cover their training costs, and then some. We got a unit that has to get to Cambridge Bay. Uh, the good news is we have a trip. Uh, the bad news is we might not know if this piece fits. But if the 3,500-pound heat exchanger doesn't fit on the Electra, Buffalo will lose the contract. We should be able to get this in this way it is without that skid. But it's going to be tight with that link. Right away, Electra captain Ray Weber has big doubts. It's going to be damn close. At over 12 feet long and 6 feet wide, the heat exchanger is almost beyond the dimensions of the Electra's cargo door. There's only one way to tell for sure if it'll fit. Buffalo's motto is, we got to try. Keep coming. OK, hang on. Oh, oh, oh. oh that's close, man. I don't know if that's going to fit. That's going to be one. Tight squeeze. Keep coming. Hold it. Take it off. Oh, no. Well, first attempt, we got it in the door. But there was no way in hell we were going to turn the thing to get it go down. Even Buffalo's hardest-headed mechanic, Chuck Adams, has to admit defeat. I don't think we're going to get her in, buddy. Myself. The way it's looking, they'll have to take the load to the competition. And the Electra back to the snowbank. Okay. Meanwhile, 
Audrey Marchand's first day back keeps getting better. Yeah, After missing that's three that's months of winter work, back on the skid. That's great. Audrey is just picking up where she left off. <laughs> as flight attendant on the skid. Oh, that's good. It may be just flight attending, but she's working on the plane her first day back. And fellow rampies Chris and John know what that means. Hey, you get to go for a ride? Yep, sir. Oh, man. She's already jumped ahead of them. Obviously, like. It's going to knock you down a bit if someone gets checked out ahead of you. But I'm just hoping to get checked out by summertime. So while they do the hard work on the ground, Audrey will be on the DC-3 with Buffalo Joe. Flight attending is one step away from every Rampy's dream, a co-pilot job. And it seems that Audrey has regained her seniority despite leaving the company last fall. And Joe hasn't lost his confidence in her. She no doubt and fly an airplane, and that, that's pretty well straight and level. I'll just have her in there just to familiarize yourself where everything is. For the rampies left behind, all they can do is keep working. I think they still don't really agree about me coming back, and they're kind of a little jealous. They're not going to show, like, what they feel, and they're not going to talk to me about it, because that's how guys act. So it's not my problem. While her work now isn't up front in the cockpit, it could lead to her flight training directly with Joe. Graham Ferguson has already passed that point. He and Andrew Vike were checked out as DC-3 co-pilots while Audrey was away. Now Audrey is intent on catching up. As Joe said, being checked out at Buffalo is like a hockey game. You have to fight for it. After a 50-minute flight across Great Slave Lake, Audrey and the DC-3 roll into Hay River Airport. On her way to the Buffalo Staff House for the night, Audrey is on top of the world. I'm really happy to be back, actually. Everybody's been so good to me today. So it's gonna happen. It's been the perfect first day. Back at the Yellowknife hangar, Chuck is still trying to salvage the Electra mission to Cambridge Bay. He's come up with a radical solution. There's only one way this is going on the airplane. That's if we split it in half. Because we're trying to put a big square box in a little round hole, it ain't gonna happen. The heat exchanger is perfectly designed for just that option. Two completely separate pieces. Okay, yeah, it's perfect. Comes with the the radiator on the bottom and the two electrical fans to blow the air through the radiator like in your car. Pieces that should be simple to split apart. Oh, there's 46 bolts all the way around. This is the fan side. See, there's two big fans up there. We split it right here. I don't think 46 bolts should stop 46 grand from coming in the door. They need to convince Mikey so he can get permission from the client. If it's in 50 inches, is the sweet spot. I kind of gathered that yesterday, brother. I had to think about all this last night, eh? Chuck's gut tells him his plan will provide just enough clearance. But Electric Captain Ray Weaver's calculations cast serious doubts. 51 inches is about here, mm -hmm. and that's where the bulge of the airplane is at its greatest. Yeah, so that's, so that's the sweet where spot. It's gonna, that's where it's going to run into it, is at that greatest home. We had two sides. We had the mechanics versus the pilots. The mechanic, uh, head of the mechanics was Chuck, head of the pilots was Ray. Ray said it wouldn't fit, Chuck said it would fit. I was on the fence. I, even though I was saying it was going to fit, I had no clue. You say you're 13 foot one and plus a little bit for clearances because you're not taking chunks off the airplane. So what you do is you lay a diagonal across here like that and then you measure from here to here. And that comes out to just under 70 inches. Why, you know, Jesus Christ, all the brains walked in. Total cluster now. Even though Chuck is sure he can make the piece fit, Ray's loading graph says it won't. Everybody's going with the computers. Now, I do ask you a question. Did they have them in the 50s? How in the hell did they load these planes in the 60s with no computers? OK, but that's what we were looking at, that if it was more than 10 feet long, it couldn't be this wide and go in the door. You have to look at that graph. Too many gigabytes, man. Everybody's all up in that shit, you know? 
Chuck was using his gut and saying it's going to fit. So who's right, a graph or your gut? I bet on the gut. Jesus Christ, man, what kind of f***ing junk do you Yeah, I get it as an air wrench. Jesus Christ, but let's get up to date here. Mikey needs Chuck's gut to be right, or else Buffalo will lose the contract. Tomorrow morning, he'll find out if Chuck's $46,000 hunch will pay off. A new morning on the Yellowknife ramp, and a last chance to save the big electric contract, hauling 20,000 pounds of cargo to Cambridge Bay. The problem? The biggest piece, a 3,500-pound heat exchanger, doesn't fit on the plane. Chuck's plan? Split the huge piece in half to get it through the door. I'll take full responsibility. But will it work? Yeah, if she doesn't fit, we don't get the trip. That simple. If the bottom fits, the top should too. But the numbers say that the bottom at over 6 by 12 feet is still too big. Ray didn't think it was going to fit. Co-pilot, I think Sean, he didn't think it was going to fit. Flight engineer was, was Luby, he didn't think it was going to fit. Nobody thought it was going to fit. But Chuck's gut thinks different. OK, come on in. Keep coming. Yep. Keep coming. Keep coming. OK. And with the Electra, getting too close is a big, big problem. See, this is the whole problem with this airplane. DC-4, you can hit it, do a little damage, and get away with that. But you can't with this airplane, because you're pressurized. Okay, hold it, hold it. With this thing, any nick and scratch uh, is considered very bad for the structure of the aircraft. I guarantee you it's going to go in, man. OK, we're just about there. There's no tux to the airplane. Easy, good. More, keep her coming, keep her coming. They've got the load through the doorway. Now comes the tricky part. If we could turn the corner, we're laughing. If not, we're uh, we're crying. So we're, it's a game of inches, and we only have a few left, so. OK, hang on. You need side shift over there. Side shift back. Millimeters at a time, they try to turn the cargo. Too rough and they could punch a hole right through the fuselage. Once it gets around, it just starts to go around the corner. If it doesn't make it around that corner, you'll never get it in. OK, where are we, Sean? I'm on the pallet now. We can just pull it over with that now. OK, in. Keep coming. Uh, before, hold it. Hold it right hold here, Hold it. Chuck, hold it. Too late here now. OK, there. OK. So we just tried and kept trying. Keep her coming. Coming. Okay, good. It's in. Hey. Woo Let's push her, boys. With the bottom half of the heat exchanger in the Electra, Chuck turns his attention to the top half. Let's push this in half. Let's get up. We need a hand here. To get the top part of the heat exchanger on board more easily, Chuck decides to split it in two as well. If Chuck would have came up to me and said, hey, Mikey, this thing is not going to fit, I would have called the customer right there and said, sorry, it won't fit in our airplane. But luckily, Chuck didn't say that. Chuck says, you know what, Mikey, bleep, 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 we'll get this thing in. No, my well, what just happened? I just pulled the impossible with everybody going fucking blah, blah, blah. It can't be done. Well, it's in there, ain't it? Brother. The thing about Chuck is, don't f with the Chuck. With all the cargo in the plane, the Electra is ready to head to Cambridge Bay tomorrow. Later that afternoon on the Yellowknife tarmac, one of Buffalo's DC-3s is set to take off. Joe needs an extra plane at Hay River to transport freight in the morning. And that's good news for Audrey. So once you get everything done, trade seats with Audrey, I'll give her to take off and get her. Joe's not wasting any time getting Audrey back up to speed. He's giving her a training run as co-pilot. 
Audrey's eager, but rusty. She's only flown the DC-3 a handful of times. And that was months ago before she went home. Okay, I'll talk you through it. You've done take us with me before, haven't you? Yeah, I did talk. You have to know like a whole bunch of different things because in case of an emergency, you don't have time to take a look at your book. You have to know your stuff. She needs to remember that training now if she's going to impress Joe. I got everything done for you, so just roll up the throttle, one hand on the wheel, heels on the floor, right? Yep. Audrey gets to fly, official co-pilot Graham enjoys a rare chance to relax in the back of the plane. Oh, I'm feeling pretty happy. If Audrey can show Joe she hasn't forgotten her flight school training, she could cement her position as the next in line for a DC-3 co-pilot checkout. It's better when you're co-pilot, it's better, well, you endure a little bit more of your job when you fly, that's for sure. Notorious for being hard on his young co-pilots, Joe's taking a more gentle approach with Audrey. What it does, always does. Okay. It all call the headings if I think you're, you're getting off the backwards. Okay. I didn't fly for three months, so yeah, being back on the DC-3, you have to feel like how strong you have to, yeah, push and pull and turn and press on the pedals and all that. But you gotta kick it over. Turn that wheel, you gotta kick that pedal, or the airplane will just twist it. Yeah. It won't turn, no. Level the wing. But as they drop towards the Hay River runway, Audrey's in for a nasty surprise. Uh, the vertical visibility is still around 600 feet. Um, the visibility has dropped to about a mile and a half now. I guess this one just moved in last couple hours. Actually, just within probably the last half hour here, it's dropped just like a stone, the visibility. They'll be approaching through a thick layer of blinding cloud. So just hold one, two, zero. For now. Just hold one, two, zero. Audrey won't be able to see the runway until they're almost on top of it. Now, she must use the dashboard instruments to gauge her altitude, direction, and rate of descent. She's flying instrument flight rules, or IFR, and she's out of practice. When you are in the real IFR conditions and when it's your job to do it, it's really, really not the same feeling in the same condition as when you're doing training in flight school. Better go back to 130. They taught you that in school. Remember that? Yeah. Okay. So 230? No, 130. Turn my way, 130 now. See the needle coming in? Yeah. We got to get over there. See that? We got to get on the localizer. Right now, the most important instrument is the localizer. Radio signals from the ground transmit the exact approach path to the runway. As long as the localizer needle lines up, they're aiming for a dead center landing. We've got to get back on that localizer. Got to is it coming back yet? Nope. Out of practice, Audrey's having trouble lining up the localizer needle. A seasoned co-pilot would have no problem. We're going to miss it all together. We're at 1,000 now. Get her down. They're about to hit the decision height, the point where they have to commit to a landing or overshoot and climb back up for another try. We're way up, and there's where at minimum. Let me see you where we are. Ah, we were not right in front of the runway, so we missed the runway. Here's the lake, the highway, runway, on the guard. Okay. Just turn to 150 and keep on climbing. Okay. They climb back up and circle around for a second attempt. But this time, Joe isn't giving Audrey a second chance. I'll get to change out with, uh, yeah. We, we screwed up here, we missed the approach. I gotta get on that both way. Somewhere beneath the low cloud lies the shrouded Hay River runway. You're not coming back at all? No. After overshooting the runway on the first attempt, 
Buffalo Joe moves trainee Audrey out of the right seat and brings co-pilot Graham back to the cockpit. We screwed up here. We missed the approach. OK, just hold that hitting until we get on that low flag. Roger. If you're driving only once every Sunday, you're going to be a lousy driver. You're a you know, Sunday driver. It's the same thing with flying. Hold that 270 until that runway comes in. Just hold that altitude. Roger. Tap the pedal a bit here aside once in a while. OK, there's the localizer coming. I'll get with that. With by the needle. Yeah. <laughs> With Audrey looking on, Joe and Graham break through the clouds and slide the DC-3 right down the middle of the runway. Right yep. A perfect landing in difficult conditions for a rookie. You're very welcome. Have a good one. Thank you. You're welcome. After the flight, Graham cuts Audrey some slack. It's like when you're coming in on the approach, like the pod was a lot thicker. You're really coming in right off the lake. Hey. There's no excuse. We missed it. We missed it. That's it. But Audrey's been reminded just how much she still has to learn. She has hours of hard work and simulator time ahead before she can move up that long aisle from the ramp to the cockpit. Oh, more practice tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You get on that Good. sim. Yeah. I have to prove them like every day when I wake up that, yeah, I earned it and I have it and I'm going to prove you tomorrow morning too that. I deserve it. The next day in Yellowknife, the Electra revs up for a flight to Cambridge Bay with a giant piece of cargo on board that almost no one thought would fit. No one but mechanic Chuck Adams. Me too. You're up. Just selected up 400 feet via yeah, flaps up, flaps up. Chuck is personally escorting the 3,500 pound heat exchanger to its destination. I want the trip just as bad too, like, just get them guys flying. Yeah, we're well, gonna be in uh, Cambridge Bay at 6 or 12. Yeah. It's 850 kilometers from Yellowknife to Cambridge Bay in Nunavut. That's just over two hours in the turboprop Electra. Runway inside, check. After all the doubts, it looks like they're going to get this job done. 30, 20, 10. They touch down. But the delivery is not yet complete, because what went into the airplane is there a pair of cutters on the forklift? must come out. Unloading? Well, it was a pain in the ass. The biggest pain and there. biggest piece is saved for last. And they have to be very careful not to damage the Electra during the offload. Try tilting it up. Hang on. So much easier to get this. It was a little bit harder coming on than it was going on, actually. Once again, it seems impossible. But by now, impossible is just part of the job. He said I wouldn't fit in the door, I wouldn't come in, just went out the door and came to me. Mission accomplished. Buffalo got the job done, and Cambridge Bay and its important North Warning System station have a reliable source of power again. The moral of the story, she's just another day at Buffalo Airways, brother. Total chaos and mayhem. Entertainment at its finest. The crew is finally on its way home, thanks to one stubborn mechanic. Take me home. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, a brand new engine gushes oil. We saw half a gallon in three minutes. Grounding a major charter. Hey, Mike. This is bullshit. Buffalo leads a pack of athletes to the Arctic Winter Games. It's hard to see. And Devin tries to get home running on empty. Play on fucking field. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, a brand new engine gushes oil. We just lost half a gallon in three minutes. Grounding a major charter. Hey, Mike. This is bullshit. Buffalo leads a pack of athletes to the Arctic Winter Games. 
Turn C. And Devin tries to get home, running on empty. Play on field. A bright, cold morning in the Northwest Territories. And a Buffalo Airway C-46 gets set for takeoff. Where is it? Where want to go? It's going on an ambitious two-day cargo haul to the high Arctic. You on that path before five zero eight, run complete, ready for takeoff. Clear takeoff runway one five. Known by its registration letters TXW, it's one of the senior citizens of Buffalo's fleet. But this 65-year-old plane isn't over the hill. It boasts a newly overhauled right engine. TXW is running really good. It had a new engine on it, and a long haul is good for a new engine. It lets everything break in really nice. All right, ready? Want we'll to go? The new engine has had a brief test flight, but that's nothing like a long-haul trip to the far north. Buffalo's director of maintenance, Rod McBrien, has done hundreds of new engine installations. 99% of the time, the engine runs fine. We rarely had a problem with the C-46 engines when they were new. Rod's younger brother, Mikey, Buffalo's general manager, is worried about the customers. He's anxious to make all the contracted deliveries on time. There's like literally probably 10 customers that are involved with this, but there's a lot of people waiting. Compared to Buffalo's regular valley run, this two-day, 2,700-kilometer round trip with stops in Norman Wells, Inuvik, and Holman Island will give the new engine a good break-in. The engine is certified for 1,500 hours of service. Departure of C-46, depart at 02, enough to go right turn out. But just minutes out of Yellowknife, Captain Devin Brooks spots a problem. Oh, we got a hole in the I don't know. Well, you should know. We noticed that the right-hand engine, which is a brand new engine, the uh, oil quantity was steadily dropping. And I just sort of started staring at the oil quantity gauge, and it continued to go down. Sometimes new engines burn a little extra oil but this was quite dramatic. With the oil level dropping this fast, the new engine could have sprung a leak. And if it runs out of oil in flight, the engine will die. Okay. I got it. Devin and engineer Adam Smith head to the back of the plane to take a look. Sure enough, right at the very trailing edge where the flaps are, uh, you can see it, the oil sort of sparkle in the sun. We knew we had a problem. If an engine runs out of oil, it's going to seize. It's just going to and you're going to kill the engine. A seized engine would force an emergency landing, and there's no proper strip in the vicinity. So it's something Devin wants to avoid at all costs. It's still going down. Oh, Christ. It's 31 and a half right now. But before making his next move, Devin needs some hard facts and figures. Do the calculations, see how much oil we're losing for the next five minutes, then we'll make a decision. Co-pilot Scott Blue calculates how much oil will be left in the tank when they get to their first stop. It's a critical bit of math. We just lost half a gallon in three minutes. Bye, oh my. At that rate, we'll be down to 11 gallons by the time we get to the well. C-46s need 11 to 12 gallons of oil to run anything below 11. You're just going to hurt the engine more and more. It's averaging about 12 gallons an hour when it's supposed to be one or two. This is about down to 30. 
We should just turn around. I'll go home, man. It's Devin's call, and now he has all the information he needs to make his decision. They're heading back to Buffalo. Go ahead, TXW. You can let me know that the uh, new engine on the right side has uh, got an oil leak. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Okay, copy. With many customers waiting, this is not the news Mikey wanted. Rod or Cliff, call 200. Rod or Cliff, 200. The C-46 makes a beeline for the Yellowknife Airport. Oh, boy. The cause of the drastic oil loss is still a mystery. The plane touches down. Its right engine still leaking oil by the gallon. In the aviation industry, a plane on the ground is a money loser. Rod and his team need to get her back in the air ASAP. We'll have to go through the oil lines, the front pump, front pump, everything, eh? Like... But even Rod, with all his experience, could find it tricky to diagnose this problem. At this point, we're not sure, right? Take a look. Could be simple. Usually it is simple. Just how long did it take you to find that simple thing? Pretty smoky, eh? Yeah. Theoretically, that engine should have been 100% good to go for 1,500 hours. That don't look good. You gotta make sure that there isn't something stupid that happened. The pilots overfilled it or anything like that. Hey, this is Mikey at Buffalo Airways. It's 20 after 11 here. Uh, we are running late uh, with the aircraft. Like his dad, Mikey likes to keep his far-flung customers happy, but now he's in damage control mode. Oh, I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Bye. Well, that's open to open up. On the tarmac, the maintenance crew examines the C-46's right engine. Checked all the lines out, made sure they were all definitely going to the right spot. We took a couple off to see if it was still puking oil out. Not a good sign. They ran it a couple times. Where do you think it is? I think it's blower seal. So do I. That's internal in the engine. <laughs> you got to pull, oh, yeah, you gotta pull the engine off? Yeah. 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 Forget it. It's done. It's done. Brand new engine, 1.4 hours on it. The blower seals all went in it. Somehow this engine had decided to inject huge amounts of oil into its air intake system. OK, she's pooched. Looks like we're going to have to unload it. There's a couple of places down in the United States that overhaul the engines for us. They take them all apart, inspect everything, make sure it's within tolerances, and put it all back together. Every part was either replaced, reboard, reground, or restored to original specs. But the overhaulers clearly missed the mark. The new right engine is a write-off. It will have to be sent back. There was an internal problem in the engine, so there's nothing we can do with it. Get the other airplane running. And that's when shit hit the fan. If this is the best we can do, I don't want to see it. We're shutting down. This is bullshit. Buffalo C-46 is grounded with one engine hemorrhaging oil. It was about three quarters of a gallon for every five minutes. So that was a little excessive. Now, they need to get the other C-46, known as AVO, ready right away to go on a two-day multi-stop cargo charter. But Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader has just discovered a major flaw with that plan. Must not have been plugged in this thing, I guess. Still. In the winter months, when the temperature dips below minus 30, AVO is always plugged in to keep it warm and ready to go. Be all yep. But somebody forgot to plug it in last night. I'm a little upset that the airplane wasn't plugged in. I'll take responsibility for it. I should have asked the co-pilot. I should have asked maintenance. I should have asked operations. I just uh, forgot about it. 
<sighs> and that leaves General Manager Mikey McBrien's carefully constructed delivery schedule in shambles. That sucks. Oh, here comes the boss, too. The boss, Mikey's father, Buffalo Joe McBrien, the sole owner of the company and a man with a short fuse. Why would we go out with a brand new engine? People are waiting for us, Bowman Island. Georgie's on the airplane. We don't even have her backup plugged in. Why do you think I got 246s? So you guys better get your shit together today because this is not going to be a good day. I can see that. Well, it was going to be a good day. Now, not so good. Every trip starts with that. The crew wheels out portable frost fighter heaters to warm up the plane. Do we have extra gas for these? Because if these run out of gas, then we're in big trouble. They want to defrost AVO as fast as possible so they can get it in the air. Where's the rest of the crew? But Joe knows they'll never defrost the plane in time with these weak heaters. You cannot go at 30 blow on frost fighters. I, I know that. All you gotta do is put water in your oil up the engines. Yep. You got to blow the f***ing frost out of it. Yes, I know. You can't do it with a frost fighter. Nobody will f***ing listen. If this is the best way you can do it, I don't want to see it. This is bullshit. I got, I got like seven quotes I got to get off right now. Bring them all in. This, this is bullshit. This ain't going to continue. What? Well, are you North waiting for DC-4 stuff? Because if we can't get that thing away, don't even think about tomorrow. There isn't even power going to the oil tanks in that airplane. There's nobody but nobody watching that. And, I'm pull and that's going to crash. Trust me. OK. You want to go along with it? You want to push it to a breaking point? You're there. Hey, Rod, come here. Joe's hit his breaking point, and he makes a decision. There's no heat going to your engines. There's no heat going to your oil. It's at noon. So just shut them down until we get organized here, get to BT-400 so people know how to run them. So Joe just made the executive decision. You're not going anywhere. Decisions like this are how Buffalo Joe has run his airline safely for over 40 years in some of the most demanding conditions on the planet. Hey, Mike. We're shutting down. Get him in here, Mike. Get him in my office right now. Oh, no. AVO won't fly until tomorrow when it's thawed. So I think you guys can... But then Joe brings up a new issue. The right engine on the plane has been burning a lot more fuel than the left. It has been burning 121 gallons on the right-hand engine per hour. On a long-haul flight to the high Arctic where fuel is scarce, it's a major concern. Yeah. This, this trip here, we got more max risk. risk everywhere we're going. Yeah. The plane could literally run out of gas in the middle of nowhere. You know, I just have to question the fact if AVO wasn't good enough to go this morning, why is it good enough to go tomorrow morning? He knows what can go on when you leave base. And now that he's a boss sending a bunch of younger guys out there, he knows there's not much fuel up in the Arctic anymore. At the end of the day, he's trying to make sure that we're OK. That airplane, if it's going to go tomorrow, it's got to be managed and monitored by one person. Well, because of the fuel burn, Joe wanted somebody to uh, take responsibility, someone back home. And Rod said he would. So we made the made the decision that I'd call them with the exact fuel burns from Yellowknife to Norman Wells. The usual fuel burn for a C-46 engine in these conditions is about 100 gallons per hour. AVO's right engine is going through over 20% more. Okay, now, it gets to Norman Wells tomorrow burning 121 gallons an hour. We're going to turn the airplane back, aren't we? Well, yeah. It will be up to Devin to minimize the right engine's excessive fuel burn. If he can't, Rod will cut the trip short. Oh. Early the next morning, Devin and the crew get the C-46 fueled and ready. Last-minute cargo is added for the two-day run to the high Arctic. 
It starts off as a normal valley run, go to Norman Wells, drop off uh, supplies in there. Then they'll head to Anubik, the last chance they'll have to top up their fuel tanks. That fuel must get them to Holman Island on the Arctic coast and back home to Yellowknife. On this leg of the trip, Devin will keep adjusting the air gas mixture in the carburetor to minimize fuel consumption. On the 46 carb, there's a mixture control. So you can rich in the carb or lean the carb out, depending on where you want it. If you put it in auto lean, it just does it all, all by itself. But in manual mode, the mixture control functions like the choke on an old car. If the mixture is rich in gas, the engine runs well, but fuel efficiency suffers. And if the mixture is too lean, the engine can become starved for fuel, sputter, and die. I pull it back another half an inch. The engine's gonna can't go. Devin has to rely on the sound of the engine to keep it just on the edge of fuel starvation. We had to get the absolute best fuel mileage we could out of it. But if Devon can't reduce the right engine's fuel burn by the time they reach their first stop in Norman Wells, they'll be forced to abort the trip, leaving Mikey's far north customers high and dry. At the Norman Wells Airport, 700 kilometers north of Yellowknife, Buffalo C-46 touches down. Now the crew will find out if Captain Devin Brooks has reduced the right engine's excessive fuel burn enough to allow them to continue their deliveries. Scotty's uh, measuring how much fuel we burnt coming from Yellowknife to Norman Wells. So we burnt too much fuel, we can't go out north. It's my job to go out on the wings and dip the tanks with the fuel stick, put it into the tank, it comes out, you can see on the gauge where the fuel line is, and you write it down, and that's how much fuel you have. Favorite part of the job. Old ladders and old planes. It all comes down to a line on the dipstick and co-pilot Scott Blue's math skills. The aircraft has fuel gauges on the dash. That's for reference only. Anybody who ever believes a fuel gauge in an aircraft, any aircraft at any time, is going to run out of fuel. Let's see what the calculations are. If it's good, we go. No good, and we're going home. So roughly 110 gallons an hour. 110 and 100. All right, I'll be back. Devin's done his part, managing to bring down the right engine's fuel consumption by over 10 gallons an hour. It's time to call the bosses. We got our fuel burn a little bit lower, but now it's their call. Good morning, uh, this is Devin. Can you page Rod for me, please? The decision on whether the trip can continue rests with Rod McBrien. Hey, Devin. We're in the wells. Uh, got some fuel burns for you. Yeah. Rod will decide if the plane will return uh, home or risk continuing on to the high Arctic. All right, we'll talk to you in a few hours. Take care. Bye. We're going. Going to the Arctic. Yeah. The cargo hall is a go. You know, we're just glorified bus drivers, man. We, we do what we're told. We go where we're told to go with the planes. Devin must still manually keep the fuel mixture as lean as he can to minimize the right engine's consumption. As they take off for Anubik, he and his crew can only hope the fuel burn rate doesn't get worse. As the C-46 heads north, 1,700 kilometers east in remote Rankin Inlet, a very different kind of mission is underway. A Buffalo DC-3 is about to become a flying kennel. Welcome to sunshine and... Maybe not. Welcome to Rankin Inlet. Justin Simley is the captain of this charter to haul dogs and mushers to the Arctic Winter Games in Grand Prairie, Alberta. Then we'll get the dogs on and we'll put the hockey bags on top. He's flying with co-pilot Sean Barry and flight attendant Audrey Marchand. I was expecting something really small, 
in the middle of nowhere. That's pretty much how it looks like. The hamlet of Rankin Inlet is a mostly Inuit community with a growing population of 3,200 and about a thousand dogs. In the old days, every community, every family had a dog team. Everything that moved in the winter moved by dog sled. Dog sled use goes back centuries, and tough, smart sled dogs were a source of pride to their musher. It wasn't until the 1970s that snowmobiles supplanted dog sleds as the primary mode of local transportation in the north. But in Rankin Inlet, dog sleds are still used for fun, and kids are taught the fine art of mushing at a young age. The tradition is now a sport. You take any survival skill when it's no longer needed as a, as a survival skill, eventually it becomes a hobby and then a sport for those that can afford it. On the tarmac, the crew loads the three Rankin Inlet teams. One, two. That's it. That's it. With all 22 dogs, sleds, gear, mushers, coaches, and chaperones on board, the DC-3 is loaded to the gills. So you guys got everything? We, well, we got Are you know. sure? We got We're not coming back. We brought you guys sandwiches and panic, so. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Great. Planning a takeoff runway 31. We're rolling. 405 rolling, g The DC-3 will travel 1,800 kilometers southwest to the Arctic Winter Games in Grand Prairie, Alberta, stopping halfway to refuel in Stony Rapids, Saskatchewan. We're in Stony Rapids. Quick stop for fuel, oil, washroom. OK, just walk them over there. The most urgent washroom break is for the dogs. Hi, the girl who have been cooped up in their kennels for hours. We got another four hours to go, so I don't think they'll hold it that long. Man, use it. Work on that. I'm not as young as him. For 14-year-old musher Tristan Diaz and his dad Tony, the Arctic Winter Games have special significance. This is my son's grandfather, my father-in-law, who uh, kind of showed him the, the way of dog mushing, and he wants to keep up his tradition. <laughs> Tristan's grandfather, Robert Taddy, passed away just a few weeks ago. In the early 1980s, he was one of Rankin Inlet's first dog sled racers, a champion in his day. He helped turn mushing into a popular sport in the tiny hamlet, and he became Tristan's role model. Fueling up the DC-3, Audrey takes Tristan under, or rather onto, her wing. Tristan is a really quiet kid. You kind of have to ask questions and get close to the kid, like to really know how he feels. Tristan has only been racing for a couple of years, so making the Arctic Winter Games team would have made his grandfather proud. His first Arctic Winter Games, so he's off to a good start. Let's do it. Let's sit right here. Let's sit out here so I can bring the dogs. Hey. Everybody's present. With the DC-3 refueled and the dogs relieved, Tristan and the rest of the rank and inlet mushers are off to the races. In the high Arctic, Captain Devin Brooks is piloting a Buffalo Airways C-46 on a two-day cargo charter. I pull it back another half an inch. The engine's gonna conk out. The right engine has been using more fuel than it should, so Devon's had to manually control its fuel burn rate all the way. Minimum power settings in descent, just to conserve fuel. They're on approach to Inuvik, located just above the Arctic Circle. That was 323, three, Roger. Remember, it's uphill, so don't get too low right away. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Devon kept the C-46's right engine fuel burn under control on the flight from Norman Wells. Hey, I am. On tomorrow's flight to Holman Island, Devon will have some new limitations. In Inuvik, we had a load of windows and doors to go to Holman Island. There was probably 20 windows, all varying sizes, and 20 doors. What was the total weight? 6,000 or something? Specially designed for the extreme temperatures of the Arctic, the quadruple pane windows are filled with insulating argon gas. Perfect for the chilly north, not so perfect for air travel. At high altitudes, the argon gas expands. If you fly above 10,000 feet, the window will, uh, will crack and it'll be ruined. Flying at high altitude helps conserve fuel. But it's a strategy Devon won't be able to use on their way to Holman Island tomorrow. And he won't be able to fuel up once he's there either. The one good thing about Inuvik is you know there's always fuel there. But not in Holman Island. So Scott fills the plane's six fuel tanks to the top. In northern Alberta, after flying over 1,700 kilometers, the DC-3 dog shuttle reaches its final destination. Lots of the Grand Prairie. Yeah. I was quite impressed. The dogs were really quiet. I was not expecting that at all. Scared. Say hello to Snazzy. Starting tomorrow, these teenage mushers will compete in the Arctic Winter Games. You gotta kick some ass or what? Yeah. yeah probably, eh? Thanks for the smooth flight. Hey, thanks, man. That was fun. That was really cool. Yeah. We'll do it again, just in order. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The Buffalo crew won't be staying to watch the races, except for Audrey. Aww. She's made different plans. I'm staying here by myself and enjoying the Arctic Winter Games and seeing the race with the mushers and stuff like that. So yeah, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Dark and very early the next morning, the C-46 crew wakes up in Inuvik to begin day two of their high Arctic trip. There is a conference going on in Inuvik at the time. So they only had one hotel room available in the whole town. So we got a couple cots. Devin took the master bed. Yeah, he's pulling rank. I'm the captain. I get to have the good sleep. This bed wasn't that good anyway. Rising at this ungodly hour is tough on co-pilot Scott. When Scott first gets up, it's like waking up a slumbering giant. Be a little groggy in the morning, but you know, they're not they're not fighting to get me out of bed or anything like that. I'm just sort of moving a little slower. A little sleepy. I'm good. Fire champions. Breakfast champions. He doesn't really wake up for the first boat, probably about two hours and he's just kinda in zombie mode. They pack up and head to the airport. You know, you try to prepare for as many issues as possible. Out. But you can't prepare for everything. We are locked out. Music airport. The airport yeah. isn't open yet. This is the pace of the day. Using his early morning zombie talents, Son of a bitch. Scott finds a side entrance. <laughs> Loaded with doors and windows, the C-46 waits in the cold on the tarmac. The plane was plugged in all night, but the crew still needs to put some heat on it before they start the engines. Buffalo 322, Inuvik Radio. Yeah, Future 3's on Charlie, uh, taxiing for runway uh, 06 for your fire flight plan. With the C-46 fuel tanks pumped full, they're headed for Holman Island and then back to Yellowknife. It's quite a trip, about 900 nautical miles. It's just nerve-wracking because you're so far away from home. Devin and his crew better be sure they'll have enough gas to make the delivery and still get all the way back home. <laughs> Captain Devin Brooks and his C-46 crew were on the lookout for their destination. 
Holman Island. Uh, it's hard to see. To the untrained eye, it just looks like a bunch more snow and ice. When you're coming in over the ocean to do the approach, you fly probably 400 yards inland and then land on a strip. I think that's a strip there. The pilots are flying VFR, visual flight rules. With no modern technology other than GPS to help them identify the Holman runway or assist them in landing on the primitive strip. Right now we're on our descent with our load of windows and doors. This is a runway I wouldn't want to come into it all the time. Holman Island is an isolated Inuit community above the 70th parallel. It's actually a really nice, beautiful place to come. It's just there's no one here, and you're in the middle of nowhere. Now the offload can begin, except for one problem. They didn't have a forklift in Holman. It was just a big bucket loader. That's a big bucket. It's huge. <laughs> It's not ideal for unloading fragile windows, but it will have to do. Well, we'll see if it's going to hold, if it holds my fan. Oh, yeah. This big puzzle and a big bucket. A little bit of art of ingenuity. Get the job done. Yeah, yeah, you got me sweating for once. <laughs> the cargo unloaded, the crew starts thinking about getting home. Scott's dipping the fuel tanks, checking out what we have in the tank, and then trying to decipher how far we can make it. It's not good news. They had to fly at a lower altitude because they were hauling pressurized windows. So the flight here has burned up a lot of precious fuel. Showed them exactly what we had, exactly what we were going through, exactly what I projected that we'd have back in Yellowknife. That's that's all for sure. That's exact as I can get it. I was worried when he gave me the calculations of gas for the right side. The left side is fine. Two drums on the right would be laughing. Because the right engine is burning more fuel, the right wing tanks now have 50 gallons less than the left. I'm trying to get a hold of these guys. See if I... Holman, there was no av gas, but there was another company in there that had a couple of its own drums. Just wondering if one of you guys could give me a lift into the hotel. I want to see if I can get a drummer to his fuel. I got a fellow take me down to the hotel where the boys were staying. Thanks. Beg for a drum of gas. Yeah, sorry, guys. We'd like to just say take one from our fuel cash is pretty tight as it is right now. The drums of Avgas are right beside the tarmac, but they're off limits to Devon. In all honesty, if we had landed there at 10 or 11.30 at night and nobody was there, we probably just would have taken one, left a note. Instead, Devon comes up with a new plan. I'm to cross feed. Cross feed and tell me when to stop. A cross feed line allows Scott to move fuel from the left wing tanks to the right so the thirstier right engine won't run dry in flight. Well, it can't change the way it's burning, but you'll equalize the time in the air that you have available in each wing. So, just yes. throw a bit of fuel from one side to the other, or even things up a little. With this clever maneuver, Devin may have bought some added flying time, and they'll need every second. It's over 900 kilometers from Holman Island to Yellowknife. And Devin will try to make it there on the ab gas he still has left in the tanks. In Grand Prairie, Alberta, the Arctic Winter Games have begun. The juvenile dog mushing event is a time trial. 14-year-old Rankin Inlet musher Tristan Diaz will be relying heavily on his five dogs and pulling the sled is programmed into their DNA. They're a sprint dog. They'll, they'll do 50 miles in a day. They're very fast, very small. They've been bred for thousands of years for this, and that's, that's what they know to do. You put a harness on one of these pups, they immediately start pulling, and they just, they just love to do it. One minute, one minute, 
Tristan is racing in the memory of his grandfather, who inspired him to become a musher. His grandfather had wanted to be here, but passed away just weeks ago. Tristan's dad, Tony, is here rooting for his son. To win any kind of medal would be an achievement for him, for sure. It would be great. And Audrey is Tristan's newest cheerleader. Good luck, Tristan. You can do it. Three, two, one. The start was good. No, he, he, looked, uh, he looked confident. He felt confident. He was really calm. We we'll hope everything goes nice and smooth through the trail of the trees, and hope we see him come through this corner here real soon. Tristan needs a very smooth ride to beat the posted best time of six minutes and 42 seconds. Second team is leading. Gonna show up soon, gonna show up soon. There he is. There he is. Push him, bud, push him. Go. All right. There you go, Tristan. Yeah, Flying, dude. Awesome. Hey, congratulations, buddy. How was the race? Good. Tristan's time is better than good. Seven minutes, 20 seconds. Fast enough to earn him a bronze medal and a place on the podium. Awesome. Good for him, like third place. He was really happy. Really, really happy. Yeah, I think he was a little proud, too. Meanwhile, in the high Arctic, the C-46 has been in the air for just over an hour. Now, Devin must make a critical decision about his route. He can detour from his flight plan and stop in the hamlet of Kugluktuk, where there's Abgas available. I want one hour out of But Devin would rather push on. The C-46 is needed back in Yellowknife for the valley run. His best chance of making it home without refueling is to climb to 11,000 feet, where the C-46 can fly faster. We should have climbed, we climbed fast, but we should get 45 minutes at I knew if we got up real high on the way home being empty, that we'd get a half-decent ground speed. But before Devin burns fuel by climbing, he wants Scott to check his calculations again. He needs to be sure there'll be enough left in the tanks to get them all the way home. There's a legal um, minimum amount of fuel you're required to have on board in case of emergencies, right? The minimum reserve is only good for 30 minutes of flying, so Scott's calculations must be extremely precise. The most accurate one you've ever did. I will. You run out of gas, the engine shut down, you know. You're several thousand feet off the ground in something that weighs 20 tons with no power to stay in the air. It's just a giant glider. Check the numbers, double check the numbers, triple check the numbers. OK, we get a nice push on the tail. We're good. Let's take her up to 11,000 feet. Devin's made his decision. They're going to bypass Kugluktuk and make a run for Yellowknife. I like the Now. There's no turning back. It's a nail biter. 600 kilometers from Yellowknife, C-46 Captain Devin Brooks is trying to make it back home with very little fuel left in the tanks. I got this thing running. Mostly on fuel. The C-46's right engine is burning more gas than the left making this final stretch nerve-wracking. I think Devin was a lot more nervous about it. I don't think Scott's experienced enough to uh, realize how nervous to be. Devin's climbing to 11,000 feet where the plane can fly faster and burn less fuel. Held a company radio. They're out of radio range, but at Buffalo HQ, all eyes are on the GPS tracking system. Just went up. 800 feet. Oh, he's climbing. OK. So if he was coming straight home, that's a, that's a flight plan he might be taking? Yeah. yeah. I think he's heading for Yellowknife is what I think he's doing right now. Uh, we're up at 11,000 feet now. 
Uh, 9500, which we usually cruise home at. At this altitude, there's less drag, so they're flying 40 knots or 70 kilometers an hour faster, giving Devon better fuel efficiency, something he desperately needs. Our ground speed was, I think, between 197 and 200 knots. But Devon still has to keep his engines running extra lean to burn as little fuel as possible. Back at Buffalo, they're glued to the screen tracking the flight. So yeah, most people go home and watch a hockey game. And we watch C-36 fly around. But this is no game. Devin's done everything he can to conserve fuel in order to make it home with the legal limits still in the tanks as reserve. Fortunately, they received a bit of help as well. I think we'll be okay here. We had a pretty good tailwind the whole way home. Buffalo K24 is five miles back. Uh, get a wind check, please. Finally, after nearly three hours in the air, the Yellowknife Airport is a welcome sight. Clear land, runway 15. Clear land, 15. Buffalo 324. Been at 11,000 feet, doing 200. Not ground speed all the way home, helped out a lot. That yeah, was a good call. They touch down with the minimum reserve left in the tanks. We're home. Yeah, it's a good thing uh, Scott graduated from grade, uh, grade 10 there with some math. <laughs> because of the winds aloft and the ground speed that we got, that enabled us to do it safely and get home with our reserves. It was a tense flight, but Devin, Scott, and Adam pulled it off. Yeah, I'm glad it's over. I think a cold beer will taste real good tonight. After a rough start three days ago, the C-46 crew managed to deliver the cargo to the high Arctic and bring the plane home. We had very close to what we projected left in the tanks when we got back to Yellowknife. Worked out beautifully. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Buffalo tricks out a DC-3 with skis to land on a frozen lake, but the ice is melting by the minute. Kelly and Arnie get drastic makeovers, and Joe and Rod clash over how to run the business. Think, think outside the box. You've told me that for 10 years. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Buffalo tricks out a DC-3 with skis to land on a frozen lake, but the ice is melting by the minute. Oh Kelly and Arnie get drastic makeovers. And Joe and Rod clash over how to run the business. Think outside the box. You've told me that for 10 years. I guess the long way is the short way. Outside the Buffalo hangar in Yellowknife, mechanic James Dojak is digging out an aviation relic. Working at Buffalo, it's not a job, it's a adventure. Skis for the legendary Douglas DC-3 aircraft, a plane that can do almost anything. Rolled out in 1935, the DC-3 popularized commercial air travel. It was the first passenger plane to fly nonstop from New York to Chicago. And equipped with skis, it could go almost anywhere, including expeditions to the North and South Poles. Buffalo hasn't flown a plane with skis in 10 years. Just bring them in and see what they're like after the snow all melts off. But now, company president Joe McBrien wants them back on fast. I tell you, it'll be a cool thing to see. Joe's promised to fly building supplies to a lakeside fishing lodge that has no road access. 
This one uh, fellow west of us here, his, his uh, tourist lodge burnt down. And uh, yes, he replenished his camp and taking a new building and all the supplies, so we're gonna fly it in for him. The lodge owner wants to rebuild for the summer season when his guests fly in by float plane. We gotta support the tourists, they support us. The only plane that can handle thousands of pounds of supplies and land on a frozen lake is a DC-3 on skis. But a sudden warm spell has sparked an early thaw. Ice is melting. Within days, landing on the lake could become too dangerous. I gotta get it done this week. The ice goes while they were finished. So I gotta get the airplane on skis right away. Easier said than done. After lying outside for a decade, the skis need a complete overhaul. Yeah, none of them are in good shape at all. They're all screwed. This one's screwed. These two over here, screwed. Maintenance supervisor Cliff Dyson has to replace the Teflon-coated shields that help the skis slide over uneven snow and ice. You can see more up front here is where the more of the damage is, eh? That's just from the rocks under the snow and that. And that's why you get Teflon on the bottom to protect the bottom of the ski, eh? The Teflon coating is just the beginning. The DC-3 needs modifications to its landing gear as well. Once attached, the ski assembly moves up and down independent of the wheel, enabling the plane to land with skis on rough snow or touch down on wheels on a cleared strip. Buffalo's maintenance team must hurry because the lake's frozen surface is melting away. Teflon coating is a relatively recent addition to the 50-year-old ski gear. The rest is like rebuilding a forgotten piece of history. It's been so long since we've done ski work that all the guys have, are trying to remember how to do it. And I found them under the... You probably never even looked at a set of skis for... Well, I was just looking at them. I didn't really know what I was looking at, really. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Joe chooses Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader and Pilot A.J. DeCoast to fly the ski plane mission. The Teflon slides a little bit, eh? A.J. has never even seen skis on a DC-3, but Arnie's been flying with skis since before A.J. was born. It's a pretty specialized skill. You learn from someone who's experienced with it, who knows what to look for on the lakes, and it's how to read the snow and conditions. Probably the most dangerous fixture you're gonna put on an airplane is skis. You want to make, give them a good walk around skis every time. I mean, it's easy to break things on the ski, like crack the tunnels and stuff if you're on hard surfaces, you know? I haven't seen them on for 10 years either, so I got to look at them too. Ski planes were once a vital lifeline in northern Canada. Since the 1930s, remote communities and mining camps depended on supply flights landing on frozen lakes. Well, I mean, we put skis on now for since Christ was a ski bunny, I guess. I don't know, I can't remember when we didn't use skis up north. But at one time up here, there was no airport, so we, were, we went skis everywhere, you know. It was every day, we put them on in the fall, we took them off in the spring. For Joe, skis were like training wheels. I flew on skis every year, for years and years, and actually, all my training was on skis, so skis are what I know. But few northern pilots have ever executed a ski landing in a fully loaded 12-ton DC-3. Joe and Arnie have, but not in a long time. To beat the thaw, Joe needs to work the mechanics through the weekend. I've been trying to decipher what the plan was all day, and then when it comes down to organizing the crew. But Joe's snap decision is stressing out his son, Rod. You never asked the maintenance department, can they have the airplane ready? No. Well, then you tell Not me two guys. Time. Adam and another guy working on if, skis. If, if I left it to maintenance, I wouldn't get it till June. Rod thinks putting all this prep work into one small contract makes no business sense. The ice is melting. We haven't used a ski plane in 10 years. Think outside the box. If I thought outside the box, why book a ski trip unless we had 50? Because you've told me that for 10 years. And then all of a sudden, we were leaving Sunday. I know, and it's all my fault. Well, it's not mine. No, it's nobody. I have no clue what's going on. <laughs> so you tell me. That's how we organize here at Buffalo Airways is we, we bring a bunch of drama in and then everybody really understands the feeling. So now we're all clear. We got one set here. But with the lake thawing, Joe's plan is literally on thin ice. <laughs> And 
there are even bigger problems looming. So this might be the last big valley load. This, I don't know. One of Buffalo's longest running contracts is in jeopardy. Buffalo flies essential food and mail to four remote villages up the Mackenzie Valley. For over 20 years, the Canadian government has subsidized these food mail shipments. They don't just feed the communities. In the winter months, they're Buffalo's bread and butter as well. We do five, six, seven, up to eight trips a week delivering these groceries. So if it weren't for that, then I'm sure they wouldn't have much need for me to be around or maybe some of the other crew. With jobs on the line, Buffalo's staff waits to hear whether the contract will be renewed or lost to one of Buffalo's competitors. There'd be no more valley runs if we don't get the food mill program, the contract. And then, like with the SCED, the stuff that we bring up from there to go to all the communities too, well, that'd be transferred to somebody else. So it'd be a little bit of this shit in FedEx, which wouldn't even be worth it. And Kelly would be among the first casualties. If Kelly got bad news saying that there was no food mail contract, she'd be out of a job. I could be royally screwed. I don't know. After a weekend of non-stop work, Buffalo's maintenance crew has mounted the skis on the DC-3. So it entailed putting on new bottoms, new internal lines, checking all the internal plumbing, repairing anything that was damaged on them. A couple of the runners had to be repaired, and the skid plates had to be put on. They had to be put back together so we could put them on the airplane. The skis add 1,200 pounds to the undercarriage, and that makes flying the DC-3 more difficult. Plus, landing on a frozen lake is always dicey. And actually snow in the barrens can be just as hard as landing on rocks. So you can imagine what a whole bunch of drifts will do to your airplane when you go bouncing over those. It's pretty hard in the airplane. Before the mission can begin, the ski assembly must be flight tested. Well, what I like to do, I like to do a circuit here and uh, back bay or something. And then come down and land, make sure that, you know. It, it, Joe and Arnie want to make sure the skis are raising and lowering properly and that they hold up and track well once they hit the snow. And they'd better hurry. The temperatures have remained above freezing, and the ice on the lake continues to melt by the hour. We got to get in and get the job done, get off days before it gets thin. Good, eh? Yep. So with one last blast, she's ready for a test flight. And it's an impressive sight. Uh, even astounds me. Uh, I'm really jaded, this, this hangar, nothing really excites me too much, but seeing a DC-3 on skis is really, really cool. Joe's like a kid with a new bike. I kind of need to ride around the block again. While some small planes are still used with skis throughout the winter in the north, at center at uh, Buffalo at 69. none are even close to a giant airliner like the 20,000 pound DC 3. Joe and Arnie will soon find out if the overhauled skis can stand up to the test. years, one of Buffalo Airways' vintage DC-3s has been outfitted with skis to land on a frozen snow-covered lake. Yeah, you on the skis, which add 1,200 pounds to the landing gear, increase drag, especially on takeoff. An airplane on skis is flown strictly by feel. It's not flown by number, so you can't paint your picture by paint by number. You've got to be able to fly your picture. Joe and Arnie are about to do a test landing on Back Bay just a few minutes from the Yellowknife Airport. Once airborne, they must reach a speed of 170 kilometers an hour before raising the gear. 
I'll take up a speed. That allows the airfoil on the back of the skis to keep them level. If not, they could smash against the oil lines located under the engines. Okay, skis up. These two old bush pilots are flexing their ski plane muscles once again. We both have a fair amount of ski time, so it was kind of neat to fly with each other. It's just kind of fun to go out there and play with it a little bit, you know? But it's not all fun and games. The real test of these antique skis and the airmanship of these veteran pilots is just minutes away. It's like two old guys trying out a new sports car. We just want to see what, what it would do if we could still do it. Buffalo still does wheel landings on cleared ice strips, but landing with skis on snow-covered lake ice is old school. And Joe wants to make sure everything is working right before the real mission begins. In no time, they're on approach to Back Bay. They lower the skis. Ice skis down. Everything looks OK. But if the skis haven't been assembled and aligned perfectly, the landing could be so rough they could lose control of the plane. As the skis near the ice, the moment of truth. through the snow, Joe and Arnie get a bumpy ride. But the old skis withstand the punishment. I'm a skier now, eh? <laughs> you need to load her tail heavy, though. She's no heavy this day. The test flight is a success. But the snow here on Back Bay is well packed by regular snowmobile use. Unlike the snow drifts they'll hit on Dog Face Lake. There's lots of conditions that you wouldn't be able to land in. Too many drifts and, and too hard or overflow, anything like that, you know. So bringing a fully loaded 25,000 pound DC-3 down onto Dog Face Lake will be a whole new game. Later, back at Buffalo, Arnie and AJ plot their course. It's right there, so yeah, it's about 120 miles at the most, maybe. The thickness of the ice on the lake will be critical. This year it's been fairly warm, so the ice was not that thick, really. Holes drilled in the ice reveal that with the early thaw, the landing site is steadily melting. There's not a lot of ice there either, because I was looking at this sucker, and this is what he measured. Here in this area, he's got 28, 28, 23. That's not much ice, eh? No, less right. than two feet of ice. Less than two feet, so you want to have them skis on in case a wheel breaks through. At least there's, you know, there's enough area to support the airplane. Eh? This is minimum ice, really. I'd like to see 30 inches all, all the way across, but... For every 1,000 pounds of airplane, you want an inch of ice. So if you've got a 25,000 pound airplane, minimum would be 25 inches, preferably a little bit more. Now, so we have to do this fairly soon. Eh? If even an inch of ice is lost, landing could be too risky. For the next one, it says... But these days, Arnie has a lot more on his mind than just melting ice. It's been a tough year for Buffalo's chief pilot. A family crisis weighs heavily on him. His 15-year-old daughter, Caitlin, is fighting cancer and will soon lose her hair from the chemo treatments. You're not going to charge me 30 bucks for this, are you? Yeah. So the other night, Arnie invited friends over to do something radical in support of Caitlin. Oh, man, Arnie. Oh. <laughs> I had a lot of bumps and scars. <laughs> one by one, everyone took their turn. I'm ready. Stop! <laughs> you Kelly's close friendship with Arnie <laughs> makes her feel like one of the family. I love you. She's beautiful! Ready? We left Caitlin till the last. So we all kind of looked the same for her, and you know, it really cheered her up. Ready? Woo! Caitlin, you're gorgeous. Give me a hug. 
It was probably one of the most memorable days of my life. I'll never forget it. Like, it's just so awesome. Rainbow! Yeah! You know, we cheered her up. Well, yours is in a ponytail, remember? Oh. Here, look! Team Bald! Oh my good God! You look so nice. Hi, honey. There you go. <laughs> Buffalo is a big family for me. It gets huge. And I think that's what's keeping me here. Oh, Weird, eh? Kidding. You just had to touch it, didn't you? God, it's like Velcro. <laughs> like, sometimes the job can suck, but you know what? So what? The people are amazing. It's a little cold in here. <laughs> But Kelly's warm and fuzzy feelings about some of the people at Buffalo are about to change. Operations manager Mike Hanley and Rod McBrien show up in the cargo terminal to check on problems with employee time cards. It seems that some cargo staff, including Kelly, haven't been punching in and out properly. They're supposed to punch in, in and out. Okay. In and out. Like, why yeah. no handwriting? Hey, Rod. Has anybody here been appointed as a supervisor for time cards? Like, as per Greg or anybody like that? I don't know. Oh, I'm here and I supervise that. Greg has me to watch them. Okay. Okay, we'll talk to you later. See ya. Bye. Yep. Rod and Mike head back to the office to discuss what they found. We might have to make some management decisions to see if we're going to bring in maybe a new manager or a new supervisor uh, to help mix things up to make things more effective and efficient. Basically, it sounded like to me, in a roundabout, huge way, they want a manager over here. Well, last thing I knew, that's what I was. So, I don't know. I don't know what to think. With the food mail contract up in the air, Kelly's already worried about her job security. And now this. Better find a new manager. Buffalo Airways DC-3 ski plane is on approach to Hay River to load up building supplies. From here, they'll fly to a lodge on an isolated lake with no road access. Hey, give me your gear now. Pilots Arnie Schrader and A.J. DeCoste are at the controls. The skis are raised so the wheels roll freely, but the skis' back edges are reinforced to withstand the inevitable scraping along the tarmac. I don't know, this stuff all going too? Just bring the plywood. The clients, who run a lodge that burned down, want building supplies flown in so they can rebuild before the summer. That'll be enough for the first trip. 4,000, 5,000, that's 6,000 pounds. Yeah, it's 6,000 pounds, Jimmy. The ice thickness on Dog Face Lake was last measured between 23 and 28 inches. Yeah. And we got a load in there, you can see. At a gross weight of over 27,000 pounds, Arnie's loaded DC-3 is almost too heavy for the ice. Uh, for every 1,000 pounds of weight, you want an inch of ice. Well, it should only be 5,000 pounds on skis, because the skis are 1,200 pounds. We all handle it. We all handle it. We go weight. We're just trying to keep it, you know, as safe as we can. Trip one, eh? Trip number one coming up here. Bulging at the seams with its heavy load, the maxed out DC-3 manages to take to the sky. It's a 50-minute flight to isolated Dogface Lake, 200 kilometers west of Hay River. Nearing their destination, Arnie and AJ start planning the landing. Right up the line like this. Yeah. He's got it all marked out down here too, maybe. Yeah. 
In many spots, the ice on Dog Face Lake is a lot thinner than it was on Back Bay for yesterday's test flight, and the surface is much rougher. How about you? 20, only 20 inches right down here. Oh, well, not good. When you do your uh, inspection of the lake, stuff you're looking for is the size of the, the drifts on the lake, the direction the drifts are in, and any signs that there could be overflow on the lake. We had the uh, benefit of having a description of the snow coverage on the lake. So it was about eight inches of granular snow underneath with a two-inch crust on top. Arnie eases the heavy DC-3 down towards a section of the frozen lake where the drifts look smaller and the ice tested thickest several days ago. But there's been more melting since then. Twelve tons of dead weight hit two feet of ice. The skis and the ice hold up. After we touched down, you could feel the little drifts really slowing down the airplane, making it hard to taxi along. But aside from that, it was a very smooth touchdown. It wasn't as violent as what I, I thought it would be like. Although he's flown the DC-3 for years, this ski landing leaves an impression on AJ. She's awesome. Very cool. Different than what I even expected, actually, yeah. But they'll have to unload fast. They want to get back to Hay River to deliver a second load before nightfall. The launch staff begin shuttling cargo to the building site on shore as the DC-3 roars away to pick up the next load. In the Yellowknife hangar, Rod McBrien is doing some touch-ups on one of Buffalo's Curtis C-46 commandos. Since shuttling cargo over the Himalayas in World War II, this plane has flown with many different colors in its 60-plus years. The wing tip has been replaced, so it just needs to be touched up to match the rest of the paint. You run old airplanes like this, uh, it's best to keep them looking fairly straight. There's no relevance in airworthiness, but we'll make it look good. As director of maintenance, Rod's job includes showing off Buffalo's colors. It's a signature Buffalo Green. You call uh, paint company and say, just send us Buffalo Green. They don't even need the number anymore. Put some lipstick on it, and then uh, everybody's happy. It's a new airplane again. While Rod knows his way around every inch of Buffalo's fleet, on the domestic front, it's a different story. I don't know where most of the stuff goes, but or even what it is. He and wife Sasha have been married for three years and are expecting their first child. You can put the teddy bear in the crib. <laughs> I know what I've been doing my whole life. Now I have to figure out what somebody else needs. I realize he's really not sure all the time, and neither am I, about what we're going to do. Um, once the baby's here. The new McBrien is going to look up at us and go, you guys are nuts, or we'll join forces. So I'm not really sure. Back in Hay River, Arnie and the crew are behind schedule. They have to fly this second load to Dogface Lake, drop the cargo, and leave before it gets too dark to take off safely. Because legally, we're supposed to take off in the daylight, not at dark on a, you know, something that's not a lighted surface. The longer the loading takes, the more impatient Arnie becomes. Let's fucking go. We're pushing it. I said 5 o'clock airborne. They take off. This time, AJ is in the captain's seat. Up, here. There we go. Up. It was a thrill to get the chance to grab the wheel, and I did want to impress Arnie, so the side of me was nervous. He, he made slight adjustments here and there. Okay. Come on. Come on. About 95. They're racing the setting sun. 
If AJ and Arnie don't get the plane unloaded and back in the air before dusk, they'll be stuck for the night on the melting ice on Dog Face Lake. Nearing Dog Face Lake, Buffalo pilot AJ DeCoast is getting ready to land a DC-3 on skis for his first time under the watchful eye of Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader. If there's uh, high drifts on the lake, then you want to go parallel with the drifts. You don't want to go perpendicular and have lots of high and low spots. But AJ has a plan to avoid the drifts altogether. Oh, I'll see the same tracks that uh, Arnie made there when he did his previous landing. And uh, try to line myself up with that there and try to end up close to where the offload spot is so we don't have to taxi around too much. These are on their way down. I'm going to have a look. Nice skis down. Up on down, all right? Now it's all up to AJ to adjust for the additional weight of the skis as he descends towards the lake. The center of gravity of the aircraft changes with skis. They're forward, so it makes the airplane more nose heavy. Then it could cause the airplane to go over on its nose. Count 65, that's guy's got one flap to go. They can get to on here now, 260, nope. Not two, there, flap to jump, nope. Pull back, pull back, on it. now step on it. We're going till you get her where you want her. AJ catches more than a few bumps as the DC-3 rushes across the snow. Take power, okay, that's good, better. If you have a rough lake, I guess it's really hard on the, on the landing gear and the skis. And uh, they all held together well, didn't damage anything. Wasn't as smooth a landing as Arnie did, that's for sure, but it was a good one. It was a good, safe landing. But they must lift off the lake before dark, so they'll have to unload in record time. That's going to be pretty solid. Now we need the plywood there, boys. A couple guys running get plywood. But unloading isn't easy. A ramp needs to be built to get the backhoe off the plane. Yeah, just tack her on there. See if we can get this thing out of here before dark. With dust creeping closer, Arnie's patience is tested. That's OK. The last thing he wants is to be stuck on the melting lake overnight. Come on, pounce nails in there, boys, so we can get the hell out of here. One will hold her, Jim. Finally, the last piece of cargo is offloaded leaving barely enough time to take off. It's not legal to take off in the dark. The lights, say so. We had to get airborne before dark. It's going to come up in a hurry, but don't push it too hard because it'll nose right over it. All right, you got to hold back pressure. Just get the tail out of the snow, OK? Yep. Here's the rattle. I'm just going to stand by with you so you don't shove it too hard. It's up right there. It's going right there. In the fading light, AJ guns it across the bumpy surface. It's like learning to fly all over again. There's 50. Just gently, just gently, because you'll get the tail and the snow again. Good, perfect. Too light on the throttle, and AJ will drag the tail in the snow. But too much power, and the nose of the plane will pitch forward. And the biggest challenge is clearing the trees on the edge of the lake. Better accelerate good, get her up to 94, and start climbing. By the time we got airborne, we were happy to be looking at that lake from out the window instead of from standing on it. <laughs> it's a narrow escape from Dog Face Lake. The next morning at Buffalo HQ, Joe is on edge. With the looming decision on the renewal of the important government food mail contract, he's focusing on every aspect of the job starting with the cargo terminal. But how could Kelly do it when I pulled her time card? She wasn't even at work yesterday. So let's get to the bottom of it. He grills Rod and Mike Hanley about how Kelly is managing her staff. There's the last time she was in. It's gonna... She says she's in. She hasn't checked out yet. She's still she came here. in on Monday. She, remember, she knows enough to write down no lunch, but she doesn't check out. So what happens is Janelle probably waits till 4 o'clock, then checks her out. She does a good job at consolidating the load with the customer but not managing it. Yep. There's a lot of difference between putting the freight on the train and driving the 
This isn't a maintenance issue, but Joe wants Rod to help Mike deal with it. So who's ever doing the discipline in the company should go over there, not me. So Rod and Mike try some gentle diplomacy with Kelly. Hypothetically, a person could come in the next morning and say they left at 6.30, when she might have left at 5.30. Ultimately, I don't think the trust is available between this department and the owner of the company. So what we're going to have to do is figure out how to make them believe. Mm -hmm. I can't promise to remember that. And so the only thing that's going to happen is I don't get paid. I don't well, clock out. Really I don't get paid. End of story. Yeah, but it's not just you. I pulled Vicky. She yeah. didn't punch out yesterday. So and do, I do, we not pay, do we not pay her for yesterday? Yeah. She takes everything very personal. Uh, she always wants to do a good job in the company, like we all do. But taking it at a very personal level, she, I think she thinks it's a direct hit to herself. The punch clock issue has pushed Kelly to the edge. I think it all came down to the fucking stupid time card bullshit. Yeah, I forgot to punch out, so now it's like this huge thing. Nobody's managing shit properly and blah, blah, blah. Then get a different fucking manager. I don't really give two fucks. Basically, that's what they're doing anyway, by the sounds of that. So good. Be better off anyway and leave. I say fucking leave so I can have a fucking cigarette. God, I need out of here. Now, even if the food mail contract is renewed, Kelly's next step could be right out the door. Sick of it. Buffalo's contract for delivering food to communities up the Mackenzie Valley is in jeopardy, and everyone at the airline has been feeling the tension. Kelly makes a call that will determine the fate of many. Hey, Greg, it's Kel. What's up? You're shitting me. So I'm out of a job. Oh, you prick. So we got the food mill contract. Freaking awesome. Awesome, buddy. Prick. Well, that makes my day. I have a job. It's a good day. It's a party weekend. Awesome. But I can't be hung over for food mill Sunday now. <laughs> Although Kelly was feeling the heat from the Buffalo brass, it seems like it's all forgotten. Their biggest contract has been renewed, and Kelly is a key reason why. I guess we were rated like top in Canada for this type of northern food operations delivery. So she uh, was able to, in my opinion, give us a good foundation to renew that contract. Kelly's position at Buffalo is secure for now. For the next 12 months, we'll, we'll be hauling food mail, just like we have for the last 20 years. You know. That's a good girl, yeah. I just want to be a good girl, yeah. And with the food mail contract nailed down for another year, Joe and Rod shift gears to a family rite of passage. How many miles did Mike even get on it? Joe's dug up Mikey's old 60cc kitty cat snowmobile. Okay, where's your truck, son? This up there. These kitty cats are in the family passed on to the whatever baby's being born. So Rod's child will be the next in line to inherit this kitty cat. It's a way of life here. The young boys and girls start off on kitty cats. And when they can waddle around outside in the snow on their own, they'll be riding one of these. If you can believe, Mikey, you see him today riding on that thing. Well, it's true, I've seen it. Shit playing out both sides of his diapers and, and he's doing good. For Joe, whether it's traditions like flying with skis or putting toddlers on tiny snowmobiles, it's what living here in the north is all about. In Hay River, Buffalo's DC-3 ski plane is being prepped for the last flight to Dogface Lake. And there's been a change in crew. Today, 24-year-old rookie co-pilot Andrew Vike replaces AJ DeCoste. I never thought in a million years I'd get the chance to fly on skis. I guess the stars kind of aligned, and I was in the right place at the right time. Somebody's got to get that end there. OK, one sec. This opportunity is so rare that Andrew may be the only co-pilot of his generation to try this. Oh, that's probably good, yeah. You got a lot of weight in there, right? Once again, the DC-3 tips the scales very near its limit. Wow, well, that's a load, Amy. Eh? I think we're going to wait too much in there is what I think. 
Okay, let's get out of here. Every minute, the ice melts more at their destination on Dogface Lake. The ice is already thinner than Arnie would like. We're worried about the ice deteriorating, you know, and uh, once you get the snow melting on top, then you, that water starts to trickle through that ice and starts to candle it and stuff. I'm gonna take it right up to 45. weight towards the back, keeping the plane level on landing will be a greater challenge for Arnie. Soon enough, they begin their descent towards the lake. Arnie manages to keep the heavy tail up as they slide along the lake's uneven surface. Now, they need to unload quickly so they can get off the melting ice as soon as possible. You guys figure you'll ever get that tractor to the cabin? It might sink. If the tractor might sink, the much heavier DC-3 could crash through the ice too. But before they can take off, Arnie is throwing a curve. This is horseshit. Arnie Schrader isn't happy. This is horseshit. He wants to get this ski plane off the melting lake ice now. But the client wants him to do one last thing, haul out a load of debris from the burned down lodge. Oh, Bert can crap. Jesus. It won't take much weight. There's anything that's all rusty and shit, they can bury the stuff, let it sink. Moving all the scrap is dirty work. Arnie didn't know he'd have to play garbage man on this mission. I'm gonna make one of a mess of this airplane. His usual patience is wearing as thin as the ice the plane is perched on. Here, pass me some of that shit. No, dump it out. We don't want that shit. We don't want that mud and shit. It's not as much fun as everybody thinks it is, eh? That's so good. Just the fact that you get to fly on skis, and it doesn't matter. I'm so young in my career here that I, I don't care, man. Like, you can pay me nothing, and I'd be happy flying. Don't tell Joe that. <laughs> Arnie takes off from Dogface Lake, relieved to finally be off the melting ice. The ice stayed well, and the airplane performed well, and everybody came away as a job well done. And there's a bonus for Andrew. And you're 95 for 80 over the ground. Arnie's letting him land the plane in Hay River. All these kids that work for Buffalo are all Arnie's kids. They're all, Arnie's their dad, and Arnie's the teacher, everything. Uh, my father's the crazy uncle that yells at everybody, technically, so. Well, you've never seen my takeoff with quarter flap, either. Oh. And these kids, you got to remember, they just come out of flying school. It's it's all brand new to them. We put them in these big old airplanes that, and to them, they're a monster, you know? Yeah, just hold it level. There, I'll give you three flaps. Roger. With the added bulk of the skis increasing drag, the plane handles more sluggishly than Andrew is used to. Nice he also has to compensate for some nasty gusts across the runway. It's not the prettiest landing. It's uh, just something that I never thought I'd be able to do. And... Uh, years down the road in my aviation career, I'll be able to say, hey, I've flown skis, and hell, I've even flown them on a DC-3. Arnie and Andrew will dump the scrap from Dogface Lake here in Hay River, then head home to Yellowknife. The job is done, the old-fashioned way. But Buffalo may never fly with skis again. It wasn't the best business choice, but definitely it raised the morale, 
Uh, it gave a young co-pilot like Andrew a chance in a lifetime uh, to pilot DC-3 on skis. He's probably the youngest DC-3 ski pilot in the world right now. And for Arnie and Joe, it was a chance to fly the DC-3 with skis one more time. Probably will be the last time it goes on skis. It's, there's just not much of that stuff going on anymore, right? There's no, no call for it, eh? I think it'll be a dying art. They're building airstrips everywhere, and there, there won't be a great need for off-strip DC-3 ski work in this area. But, you know, for one week, in the middle of winter, we, uh, we got to do something kind of cool. On the next episode of Vice Pilots NWT, oh, it's a, it's Joe loses his pilot's license. I've always been under this threat. And puts his replacements under the spotlight from the back seat. Oh. <laughs> Buffalo Airways gets Stanley Cup fever. <laughs> and Mikey swoons over the most precious cargo he's ever seen. On this episode of Vice Pilots NWT, oh, Joe loses his pilot's license I've been under this threat. and puts his replacements under the spotlight from the back seat. Oh. <laughs> Buffalo Airways gets Stanley Cup fever, <laughs> and Mikey swoons over the most precious cargo he's ever seen. of charter jobs at Buffalo Airways. The regular ones hauling freight. And the once in a lifetime jobs that no one ever forgets. And today, General Manager Mikey McBrien has some exciting news to share with his father and boss, Joe McBrien, about one of those special jobs. Quick question. Do they want to hold a Stanley Cup around? Do they want to go from Whitehorse to Yallknife? Fort McMurray, and then done. A charter opportunity to tour the Stanley Cup around the north. And it's a whole big, it's a big thing. Um... The Stanley Cup, donated in 1892 by Lord Stanley of Preston, Canada's Governor General at the time. It's the oldest and most revered professional sports trophy in North America. The grand prize awarded to the winning team at the end of the National Hockey League's annual playoffs. Now it's coming to the north on a special tour. They want to use a DC-3, so I was thinking uh, that we just charge them straight fuel. What are you taking, a cup, a Stanley Cup? In 10 guys. I think it's a chance of a lifetime to get the A bunch of men running around short pants, long stockings, eh? Huge hockey fans Mikey and Scott would love to land this contract. It's beautiful. It's a massive cup. It's the most impressive trophy in sports, in my opinion. They realize that we're a little bit overkill for what they need, but it creates a lot of free publicity for both sides. There's a lot of publicity there, but uh, let me think about it for a minute. The Stanley Cup would normally put a smile on Joe's face, but today, other things are weighing on him. Apparently, what's happening? Mikey catches up with Flight Ops Director Mike Hanley. What's going on with what? The old man, he's acting all weird. Because he's losing his license for 10 days. Jesus. I'm just finding out about this now. He, he can't fly, or what does he do? 10 days. The feds are suspending Joe's pilot's license for allegedly flying in low fog two years ago. They're taking the license on the province that I flew in fog that was below limits, but when you live beside a big lake like Great Slave Lake, fog drifts in and off the shoreline. I don't even consider the weather bad that day, but they sit in judgment from a different angle. What are you doing? Joe just told me he's got a 10 day suspension of his license. Joe's oldest son, Rod, sees the big picture. So we got to find something for him to do. You got to keep Joe flying. To maintain balance of Buffalo Airways, Joe has to be in the air. For the past 40 years, Buffalo Joe has been flying World War II era DC-3 airplanes all over the north. 
Joe, my father, has been flying literally since he's around 16 years old. He loves his old warbirds, and that's where he loves to fly. In the McBrien household, the DC-3 was like the family car. Our brother thought everyone had a DC-3. He didn't know any different. Six days a week for the past 28 years, Buffalo has operated a DC-3 passenger service called the SCED between its terminals in Hay River and Yellowknife. It has an impeccable safety record, and most of those 17,000 SCED flights have been flown by Buffalo Joe. My father is the captain of the longest and only uh, scheduled DC-3 service in the world. Um, that's pretty cool. Two, one, three, five. But tomorrow, Joe's record-breaking run will be broken with a 10-day suspension. Yeah, should be. Uh... Over the years, Joe has developed a close rapport with his passengers. He's good-hearted. Everybody knows him. He's done a lot for the community, and you know that he's made this airport into something kind of special. <laughs> now, Joe will have to hand the responsibility of flying the sked to someone else something he's never been comfortable doing. That afternoon, Joe's Yellowknife passengers board the DC-3. Right on. Graham Ferguson will co-pilot. Andrew Fike will be the flight attendant and Buffalo's young DC-3 captain, 25-year-old Gord Cooling, is Joe's chosen replacement. Gord got the chance of a lifetime. He's doing it, youngest DC-3 captain in the world. Gord will be coming along for the ride to Hay River tonight and taking over captain duties from Joe tomorrow. Joe's resigned himself to his fate. After tonight, he won't fly the sked again for 10 days. I'm not going to fight it. It's not worth fighting over it, and I got to go to that level. I don't want to go to that level. But this suspension won't be easy for him. Flying is in his bones. It says Buffalo on the side of the airplane. It really should just say Joe. He has uh, a business life, and that's what he lives 100%. Everything revolves around that, and that's what he knows. Flying is all he's ever wanted to do, ever since the day he, his first memory, I think he wanted to fly. 7324, y'all ain't one departure, 5,000 here, I think. One way, run five. Clear to go over to center. You know, they want me to turn in my license for 10 days, which is really a piece of paper. I remember when I learned to fly, I didn't even want the paper, I just wanted to fly. They'll take my paper, uh, but they won't take my ability to fly an airplane. They can't touch that. OK, now I got to put the power to it. Gotcha. Flights and passengers like to see his face. It's like a sense of uh, a sense of being comfortable. But after tomorrow, when Joe turns in his pilot's license, his passengers will see Gord as the captain and Graham and Andrew alternating as co-pilot and flight attendant. You're welcome. That is, if Andrew and Graham's airmanship passes muster with Joe. How many miles are you going in one minute? We'll be going about uh, 2.5. So uh, we're we'll I didn't figure 2.5. And the young co-pilots know meeting Joe's high standards won't be easy. Early the next morning, Joe prepares to head back to Yellowknife. Yeah, we're just chilling. I won't go every night. Inside the Hay River Terminal, where his daughter Kathy manages the sked flights, he tries not to think about what lies ahead. Jasper, where you been? Jasper, where you been? Where you been? What's this? This pocket? This one. He says, I know this is. Kathy's dog Jasper is a welcome distraction. So is the prospect of a Stanley Cup charter. But Joe's anxiety about turning in his pilot's license today is starting to surface. You know what? I don't know how to use that goddamn thing. No, you just, you don't, you, you don't have to. You just pull up and stick it on the, the pad. Just touch it to the pad. You better come with me. Come on. Hey, guys. 
I just want the wings to be as clean as they can be. Outside, yesterday's co-pilot and today's flight attendant, Graham Ferguson, preps the DC-3, aware of Joe's state of mind. I'm just trying not to get yelled at. In the left seat, Gord Cooling is where he wants to be, the captain of the sked. Joe gave me the go-ahead to fly his scheduled passengers, so it's quite the honor. Gord's co-pilot for this morning's flight is Andrew Vike. Ground power is uh, going to clear. Ten readers, uh, online. The last person to board is Joe. And though he's not flying, nothing can stop him from being a backseat pilot. He'll be keeping close watch on this flight to make sure his passengers will be in good hands during his suspension. They're following the SOPs and checklists and everything, but I got to be very alert that they don't miss anything. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard uh, Buffalo Airways DC-3. 31 will be taxi to departure 31. Buffalo 169, roger. Immediately on takeoff, there's an issue. He didn't like the power setting that we chose. And he reached up when we were taking off and was adjusting the throttles and stuff like that. I think I teach you now, but do you understand what holds those throttles up there? I think so now. Go read the book. With Joe on edge over his upcoming suspension, the young pilots are in for a rough ride. Crossing Great Slave Lake on the way from Hay River to Yellowknife, a Buffalo DC-3 passenger flight is off to a rough start. Hey, I'll tell you what, 550, what is 550? Uh, 550 is what is our maximum. First time, take off. How do you set it? Uh, okay, you don't know, okay, you don't know. Buffalo Joe is especially on edge today because his license is being suspended. He wants his young flight crew, Gord Cooling and Andrew Fike, to give his passengers a perfect ride. But so far, he's not happy. You think I'm gonna put 20 people in a airplane and have you guys plowing off you in the runway not knowing what you're doing? I think we did a good job. Yeah, well, I don't think so. For Gord and Andrew, this 50-minute flight feels like an eternity, with Joe challenging their every move. Rock, we're out with you don't know what you got for power, do you? Joe jumps on them for their uneven engine power settings. Still got one at 10, one at 20. That's why the airplane's dragging its ass. You can't feel it, can you? Gord's flying safely, but Joe wants to see airmanship even he'd find difficult. As hard as I fly today, I can never fly that airplane as well as I could when I was 25, and they're 25, 23. And they better be able to fly better than I can. A tough task. Joe's been at the helm of DC-3s for over 40 years. Gord's been a captain less than a year, and Andrew has only been in the co-pilot seat for a few months. I got more experience. I can judge better on a lot of stuff, and I can, I can forecast down the road, but the physical handling of the airplane and the instrument flying should come easy to me. By the time they touch down in Yellowknife, Joe's disappointment is off the charts. You don't know how to run them, so how the hell do you know how to control them if one fails you? Immediately after the flight, right. he no, catches that's... Andrew in the hangar. But when I see a performance like you've seen this morning, I know f***ing well you don't know. I'm not happy at all what I've seen this morning. This, this is all I have, and I put everything into this. There's well, then let's, let's see some results of it. Okay. You know, you want to go home in a box? Uh, of course not. OK. It put me in a state of mind that I have never felt before. I was stressed, I felt like crap, I was angry, I was pissed off. I was watching, oh, it's, it's, it's brutal. Later, Joe commiserates with Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader and Mike Hanley. Under ideal condition, they were making it very sloppily, very sloppily. Joe's worried that neither rookie, Andrew nor Graham, have enough experience to co-pilot the sked. Everything went the matter. They don't understand the airplane. They're too green, they're just too... Well, we did start pretty quick. Yeah. Pretty so quick, yeah. We, we, had, we, we, had, we had had green. They can barely fly yet, and we're putting them in airplanes that are very difficult to fly. And Joe's a little impatient with them. Joe thought his suspension would be a good opportunity for Andrew and Graham to fly with new DC-3 Captain Gord Cooling. But after this morning, 
he's having serious doubts about that combination. Because they need a cooler. Yeah. We don't. Yeah, exactly. So he decides to put his most experienced captains on the sked. Justin or Arnie will do the sked for me for 10 days and uh, whatever other flying they can do. And that means Gord loses his chance to captain the sked. But back in the hangar, Mikey's got some good news. Oh, he's got the Stanley Cup trip on the board. Joe's approved the Stanley Cup charter. The amount of time I've been at Buffalo, I've never seen the trip this cool. Usually it's seniority or who flew last, how I decide the next crew. Everyone's always trying to sneak their name on there for trips, so. But this one's something special, and it took a special scenario how to figure it out. The cup was born in competition, so why would we change a, a lasting tradition? Mikey's come up with a hockey-themed way of choosing the crew for this once-in-a-lifetime mission, a shootout. I got the sign-up sheet for the, the, the shootout. Yeah. Sign-up sheet for the shootout. It's in the pilot's room. <laughs> noon tomorrow. <laughs> I got the sign-up sheet for the shootout tomorrow at noon for the Stanley Cup trip. While Mikey recruits contenders, Joe has more serious business to take care of. This is the charge, and that's the license they want. He must surrender his pilot's license to Transport Canada for a two-year-old infraction flying in low fog below acceptable levels. I don't think I was guilty, but it doesn't matter. They found me guilty. I'll, uh, I'll see how it goes. I just got to get down there and get rid of it. Ugh. The inspector that uh, issued the suspension uh, told my lawyer saying I was high profile while no one in the north that didn't have to make a, a sizable suspension to use me as an example. Well, yeah, they're not even here. They've always said they'd like me not to fly people around in DC-3s anymore because we're the last one in the world doing it. And with DC-3s on a scheduled service. Next year, I've been flying 50 years. I've always been under this threat. You guys are late. You can take my license. I got to turn it in for 10 days. OK, no problem. Ugh. I guess after nearly 50 years, they have to get a, a shot at me somehow. They uh, dodge that bullet. Uh. With his wings clipped, Joe's kids are worried he'll become a terror around the hangar. Oh, I thought it was going to be bad. I thought it was going to be really bad. I, I thought it was going to hit the fan all from all levels. If Joe doesn't fly for whatever reason, he gets too much into multitasking in the little things that he shouldn't worry about and uh, things get uh, real bad then. But Joe couldn't bear to stick around Buffalo watching others fly. It's like freaking five-year prison sentence. It's like these 10 days are like the worst things ever happened to him. So he's surprising them all and getting out of town, going south to Victoria, British Columbia. I got to go see an old flying crony of mine. And actually, he's the founding president of Buffalo. He's in the hospital, so I got, I got to go down to do a pre-med on him, make sure he should be in there. He didn't get a suspension. He never would have flown down and, you know, spent some time with him. Thank you. Thank have you. a good one. Yeah, I sure will. Thanks. Joe's taking some well-deserved time off. You and John first. But when the cat's away. Sports fans, welcome to the first annual Buffalo Airways, the most illegal way to pick a co-pilot. <laughs> Mikey McBrien has transformed the Buffalo hangar into a ball hockey rink for a shootout to decide who will escort the Stanley Cup on its northern tour. Everybody in the hangar is vying to get a spot on the airplane, so yeah, it's a real fierce competition out there. The co-pilots hoping to be on one of the two DC-3 legs with the Stanley Cup are Ian Bottomley, Graham Ferguson, and Andrew Vike. I like hockey and flying are two of my favorite things, so it's pretty awesome. And flight attendants Audrey Marchand, Chris Matheson, and John Martin are set to battle it out as well. You know, growing up playing hockey, I always wanted to be the guy that is going to hoist Stanley Cup someday. I don't know, man. I heard these guys are pretty good. I'm pretty nervous. Let's see how it goes. Everyone will be trying to score on the Stanley Cup charter captain, Justin Simley. They could have done a little better. 
We couldn't afford adult stuff, uh, but we got the juvenile. You got a couple on there, bud? Nice. Yeah, that was the only part of the equipment that was absolutely mandatory. Justin is a very brave man, but he's also a very skinny man. Uh, luckily enough, he, the, the child stuff fit him. Wearing kids' equipment, the goalie is ready. Who's going first? The shootout can begin. First off, Audrey. <laughs> the next shooter is Rampy Chris. But Justin stops him, too. Hey, right, John, John, you need this one. Hey, you put the pressure on. Then it's John's turn. Justin blew me away. That guy's a pretty good goalie. We thought it would be a joke. Uh, he turned out not to be a joke. Oh. No one could score on him. He, even though he's wearing child's clothing, he's a pretty good goalie. Go T. <laughs> I've got this to happen. Oh. Eventually, the shooters start to find the back of the oh. net. Oh. John's going to White Horse. John. <laughs> Ian even has his own personal cheering section. Oh, yeah. Ian's going to White Horse. The White Horse crew is set, but the Fort McMurray leg is still up for grabs. He's coming in, doing something crazy. Oh! Andrew wins. He, Andrew's going to Fort McMurray. I heard it's nice this time of year. <laughs> then comes Audrey's last attempt. Oh, yeah. She scores and secures a spot on the plane. The lovable Audrey, I don't even think, knows what the Stanley Cup is. The shootout is over, and so is Buffalo's most unorthodox method of choosing a flight crew. Everyone wants to go fly the Stanley Cup around. I mean, even just to go see it is great, but to, you know, fly from the Yukon to the territories here, you know, it's something to be proud of. It's going to be pretty awesome just to be able to stand next to the cup and get a few pictures. Where's that ball go? It's right over here. With the crew set, Buffalo will send one of its vintage DC-3s to pick up the most precious piece of cargo ever, the Stanley Cup. But before that day comes, it's back to work for Graham and Andrew. It's Andrew's first time in the co-pilot seat since his disastrous flight with Joe. Yeah, that was a shitty fucking day. Holy crap, that was a shitty day. The one little thing about the shit list at Buffalo is it, it's always rotating, and you just got to wait your turn. Watch your feet. It's inevitable that you, put, you find your name on the top of it, and sometimes you find yourself at the bottom, and the bottom is where you want to be. Today, Andrew's hoping to work his way back down to the bottom. With Joe out of town, Andrew will be flying with captain and goaltender extraordinaire, Justin. We're taking the sked down to Hay River tonight. We've got uh, Graham and Andrew. Uh, Andrew's going to be flying with me tonight. A 10-year Buffalo veteran, Justin knows exactly what Andrew's going through. Oh, yeah, I'm in the doghouse all the time around here. Don't worry about it too much. In fact, I don't worry about it at all. Boost pumps, anti-ice, radio master radios. After a smooth takeoff, with nobody giving him the gears, Andrew settles into the flight. So what did you think of flying with Joe, Andrew? Flying with Joe is very different. He definitely yells at you a lot, being a new pilot, but uh, just wants us to be, the, I guess, the best pilots that we can be. He's got his own way. We just have to adapt to it. Yeah, that's pretty much the same way it was when I started flying with Joe. Lots of yelling, lots of learning. Just uh, sort it out as best you can. You guys are doing good. Just keep it up. Cool. Andrew, see you in a cookie. Thanks. Shall I get anything to drink? Flight attending in the cabin, Graham notices the difference in his buddy. Andrew looks pretty relaxed. He was looking pretty stressed out this last week. He's looking better now. Let's go flap. Full flap. Final check's complete. Clear to land. The flight across Great Slave Lake ends without incident. Let's go. 
The sked touches down in Hay River. Right on, side on. Right on. We did really good. He's coming along quickly, and uh, both him and Graham are pretty good to have in the seat with us. Same old learning process for, for everybody. Good job, man. Getting better every time you go flying. Yeah, man. And it will get even better when he gets to fly with the Stanley Cup and its most oh. adoring fan. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. At Buffalo, the big day has finally arrived. It's a big honor to go and pick up a Stanley Cup and uh, fly it in a DC-3. It might be the last time that cup ever flies in a three. So uh, yeah, it's a big honor for sure. Buffed and polished, this 68-year-old DC-3 is ready to pick up the 117-year-old Stanley Cup on a special tour of the North. Mikey's excited to see the cup in person. Oh, there we go. So is Scott, one of Buffalo's co-pilots, who's coming along because he helped set up the charter. fly to Whitehorse in the Yukon to pick up the Stanley Cup, then return to Yellowknife and head to Fort McMurray, Alberta a few days later. Once they're in flight, co-pilot Ian gives up the right seat to flight attendant and trainee pilot John, a bonus John wasn't expecting. Anytime I can get my hands on the controls, I'm going to take it, and Whitehorse was a great opportunity to do it. You know, I got a bit of training in. This is pretty cool, man. Yeah. Crossing into the Yukon, the DC-3 passes close above the Mackenzie Mountains. Flying through the mountains on the way up to Whitehorse is beautiful. The scenery might be breathtaking, but mountains can cause turbulence and downdrafts. Yeah, this old girl, she's scared of hikes, this one. Isn't it? Going through the mountainous regions, I did get a little bumpy there, so it's a challenge, but Justin's just there, you know, watching, keeping an eye on me and stuff. So we just kept our altitude and rode out. While John makes the most of his flying opportunity, Mikey recharges his batteries in anticipation of his first ever meeting with the Stanley Cup. Mikey, you know, it's his dream basically to pick up Stanley Cup and hold it. Mikey won't have long to wait as the DC-3 touches down in Whitehorse. That's it. That's all. That's everything. Here we are. Whitehorse. Waiting for the cup. Should be arriving any second. Now I'm pretty excited. Uh, frick. I'm going to see Lord Stanley get on the uh, vintage airplane. You know, it's kind of cool, so. Well, here it is, boys. Hey, fellas. How are you doing? How are you? Good, you? Good. Phil and Mike, better known as the Cup Cops, are eager to get going. Can we keep the briefcases handy? Yeah, you got it. So this one, I got a little red one. You got it. But Mikey's focused on one specific piece of baggage. Holy oh, smokes. This is it right here. What are we going to do? Have it out? Oh, yeah, if we can open it, that'd be pretty freaking cool. It was in this little black indiscriminate box. It didn't look anything fancy. Could have, could have had a coffee maker in it for anyone's concern. Oh, <laughs> holy smokes! It's almost embarrassing how much I like the cup. <laughs> <Right on. laughs> That's cool. Scott gets a picture with Lord Stanley's mug and his old buddy, Cup Cop Mike uh, Bolt. Luck may have it, one of the Cup Cops uh, is Scotty's friend from, uh, from camp. Just a friend of mine from uh, camp back in the day. An old friend? True enough. His job is to watch the cup as she goes around the world. Oh, man, that's awesome. Thanks, Scotty got a hold of me and said, I'm up here working for this airline up in Yellowknife, and 
I got contacted about Maybe flying the Stanley Cup around, around, and he starts telling me about the history and the World War II planes, and I go, this is awesome. And I've never been any close to these kind of planes before. I've been doing this 11 years now, and this is one of the trips I've been looking forward to for a few months. I travel 250 days a year with the greatest trophy in all the sports. No other inanimate object can make rugged, red-blooded Canadian men so giddy. <laughs> That's awesome. Here she is, eh? Holy. It's time to board. An historic moment. The cup has never been on a DC-3 before. Most of the time we fly commercial, we don't charter very often. But to be on a DC-3 going from Whitehorse to Yellowknife, it's pretty special. The, the history behind the DC-3, the history behind the Stanley Cup, it's a natural fit. Shotgun this seat. That's not going anywhere. Nope. Yeah, the Cup Cops, Phil and Mike, they were awesome. They wanted that cup out of the box at all times. Let it breathe, like it's there for people's enjoyment. have that cup on that plane going across our great country, it is a pretty spectacular moment for everybody. The, the pilots, for the attendants, for everyone involved. Two incomparable icons, the DC-3 and the Stanley Cup. Yeah. I love the idea of the history of this. Love it. Yeah. But during the flight, it's not all about the Stanley Cup. Members of the Cup's entourage are fascinated with the old warbird they're flying in. So this plane was built in 1942. Yeah, Rosie the Riveter, you can see the rivets are perfectly I've been, I've been keeping a very close eye on those rivets, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Mikey keeps the cup company on the long flight. This is when Stanley was this little, look. Is this a little guy? Issue grew since then. High five. <laughs> it certainly is much more of a celebrity than an animate object. Absolutely. It sort of becomes its own person that doesn't talk, but can you imagine if it could talk, the stories that thing could tell? My lord. <laughs> well into the five-hour flight, Ian gives up his seat again. But on this leg, it's not John getting some stick time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is your co-pilot, Lord Stanley. Uh, oh, we're no. along here at uh, an altitude of about 9,000 feet over Northwest Territories on our way to Yellowknife. Holy <laughs> smokes, what a special moment, Dave. Just hanging out, Stanley Cup. Favorite DC-3? Life's pretty good. Stanley heads back to his seat as the DC-3 heads for home. I've been on DC-3s before I was one years old, and like the novelty's worn off, and it's this is amazing. This is easily the best day at work I've ever had in my life. And this relationship seems to be taking a more serious turn. Mikey, <laughs> tell you, it's gonna be hard peeling the cup out of his hands. <laughs> but Mikey will have to share the love when Joe returns to Buffalo and catches cup fever. <laughs> a Buffalo Air DC-3 is on approach to the Yellowknife Airport carrying an MVP, most valuable passenger. You never believe who I'm sitting next to. The Stanley Cup is on a tour of the North. And it's the people's trophy, and that's the greatest thing about the NHL and the Hockey Hall of Fame have done, is bring it around to the people. And one of those people is completely love-struck. I really didn't care about anything else except that Stanley Cup. It's just amazing. It leaves me speechless. Final check, please. Final check, sir. one of those moments that will never happen again. You know, the airplane lands and what's on it? The Stanley Cup, man. What the f***, okay? Outside the Buffalo hangar, a small crowd has gathered for a peek at the oldest trophy in professional sports. There she is. 
Hey, Crosby, I want to find Crosby. Hey, right here. Right oh. here. Crosby's there. Everybody wants to be near it, to touch it, to hold it. Oh, Crosby. Put smiles on their faces. Mikey lets the cup come between him and his girlfriend, Gail. <laughs> I like the cup exactly how it is. It's bare, it's there. And that's what blew me away, is, is how real it is. Come on. Right, big smile now. Back from his suspension-induced vacation, Buffalo Joe takes a turn with Lord Stanley. Touch it, touch it. Touch it. Kiss it, kiss it. <laughs> You should have seen what your son was doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get anyone for the Hall of Fame here, please. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's pretty funny around the cup. Oh, his paws on it. What do you think, Joel? I know, I'm not even halfway through this thing yet. And I'm, this is awesome. Yeah, good, yeah. man. Our pleasure, really. It was great. Really cool. Yeah, we can just peel the cup away from friggin' Mikey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we need this thing in June, you know that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> After a day of being kissed, hugged, handled, and held, mostly by Mikey, Stanley hits the showers. A lot of times we just take like, like a wet cloth like this and just wipe it down and then give it a buff dry. Every once in a while, you put on the road for a while, you give it one shower. Okay. Where would a fill go? I imagine that disappears when the work has to be done. Who showed up? Mike did the dirty work. Now Phil tucks the cup in for the night. Tomorrow will be a busy day. It's cup day in Yellowknife. It starts with a stop on the edge of town. And then the main event. The Scotiabank celebration of hockey goes on tour. We're at 15 stops over the winter this year. We take it to small communities uh, where they may not otherwise have the opportunity to see the cup. Another cool thing I, uh, about the whole trip was, you know, getting to see the look on people's faces. Justin brings his daughter to see the cup. Knuckles. 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 <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely not. Michael, what did I tell you? Outside. I know. <laughs> what did I tell you? That's about 30 feet from the cup right now, isn't it? <laughs> Listen to the cup cops, Mikey. Listen to the cup cops. By now, Mike Bold almost needs a restraining order to deal with this Stanley Cup stalker. It was really picking on me more than anything when it came to the cup, because he saw how much I liked it. I don't know. Got a little bond with that cup over there, and it's, uh, it's my last day, so. It's bittersweet, man. You know, we get to see the cup all yesterday. We get to spend uh, most of the day with it. You know what? And it's going to be gone. And uh, come the end of the playoffs, it'll be someone else's. But at least for today, she's mine. But Mikey seems to have some competition. My father's an old school hockey fan. He talks about players that I never even heard of in, in matches I don't even know even happened. Joe understands the value of hockey in the North. It's a very good game for isolated communities, isolated settlements, camps. It brings a lot of people together. It gives them a lot of reasons to talk. It's good. Pretty good to see my father here. He's uh, running around getting to talk to people. He's usually antisocial, so this is the first time I've seen him in a social setting that wasn't a wedding or a funeral, so you know it's a big deal. Here, have a couple stickers for your, for your quad, OK? Good guy. Take care. After a few hours of group cup love, the festivities are over. The next morning, co-pilot Andrew Fike preps the DC-3 for its final stop on the Stanley Cup tour. Like Andrew, flight attendant Audrey Marchand won her spot on this flight in the shootout, but she doesn't have cup fever like everyone else. Then she gets a moment alone with Stanley. I see Montreal Canadiens in 1986. I was born in 1986. And she warms a little more to the cup. I like this part right here. Way better than this one. And now, Joe's 10-day suspension is over. He's got his license back, and he wants in on the Stanley Cup action. We're off to Fort McMurray with the Stanley Cup. and. Buffalo Joe flying us, which when we uh, originally 
uh, we're making the plans. We had no idea we'd be so lucky as to have uh, Joe flying us as well. This will be Mikey's last few hours with the cup before he has to bid adieu. As this whirlwind romance winds to an end. You know, if you love something, you gotta let it go, right? The final leg of Buffalo Air's Stanley Cup charter to Fort McMurray, Alberta, is set to depart from Yellowknife. The Fort Mac trip was the people who placed second in the shootout. So co-pilot was Andrew, and uh, flight attendant was Audrey. And of course, my father is the captain. Okay, 3333 McMurray Point Blast Road, San Lorenzo, Texas. Rookie co-pilot Andrew Fike is flying with Buffalo Joe for the first time since Joe tore a strip off him nearly two weeks ago. Can you follow for 7,000? Follow for 7,000, we can go 5. Company Yellowknife, it's uh, WZS. With his license suspension behind him, Joe's more relaxed. Well, we're on our way, we should be Fort McMurray at high noon. Okay, copy that, Joe, you guys have a good day. Yeah, okay, thank you. Have a good one, too. In the cabin, Mikey is still head over heels, monopolizing the cup. This is the first playoffs I remember watching uh, as a kid, uh, religiously. It was the 1992-93 the playoffs on what you all won. I watched every single game right from the beginning. I was 10 years old. I still remember going outside making a, a little Stanley Cup out of a five-gallon pail and running it around. For a 10-year-old, and for a 27-year-old, having the same feeling, not many objects can do that, and uh, the cup can. It's freaking amazing, man. This is awesome. It's awesome now, but Joe knows the letdown his son is in for once they land. Once we get there, we got to split, you see, so this way we, you know, it's a heartbreak, you know. Very sad, very sad. Yeah. Well, with every good romance, you know, it's got to come to an end sometime. But Mikey's not going to let go so easily. I got two and a half hours to say goodbye to the cup. And, you know, it was pretty hard. It's your last stop on the journey. On the tarmac in Fort McMurray. It feels, it's been a good trip. Mikey prepares to say his final goodbye to the cup. Don't want to see her go. As Buffalo Airways, we got to help bring a piece of history that everyone will enjoy. It's as cool to be a little, little, little fact. It's pretty cool to be part of the history. Uh, anytime the NHL needs anything, I'm a willing mascot for anything. <laughs> Thank you again. That was fantastic, okay. and your crew was amazing. And Thanks for coming. Everything was... Thanks for coming. Be sure you come back. Unbelievable experience. Never forgot it. Sure. It was a great few days. You know what? It's the people that made the trip really great. Over, Mikey. I, I don't know how we're past going to cross again, man. I don't know. You know, if you love something, you got to let it go, right? If it comes back, it's meant to be. For now, Mikey is resigned to his fate. He knows the romantic problems of one man and a shiny metal trophy don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. So you're OK there, big guy? Yeah, I'm OK. Uh, yeah, you know? Sure. For three days, it was just Buffalo Air raising the cup, and that is worth more than anything that I can think of. Mikey may not be able to spend time with the cup anymore, but he knows they'll always have yellow knife. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, the DC-3 crew tackles a hard landing on a soft sand strip. The McBrians receive a special delivery. And Chuck goes ballistic when the Electra won't start. Hang on, boys. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, the DC-3 tackles a hard landing on a soft sand strip. The McBrians receive a special delivery. 
and Chuck goes ballistic when the Electra won't start. Hang on, boys. Oh, yeah! Available body and every able plane is on the move at Buffalo Airways. We have every single pilot at Buffalo's disposal flying today. And that's a, a feat I haven't seen in about three years. So we're going to have three DC 3s, 46, and the Electra all going. So that will suck up everybody. With the ice roads closed and fire season set to start, Buffalo is stretched to the max. Okay, clear. Switch. See you guys later. Well, there's a lot of shit coming up. Yeah. It always happens about this time every year. All hell breaks loose. And that's a problem for the airline's most vocal mechanic, Chuck Adams. Oh, short, man. There's just no experience. Where are you going to hire guys to work on this old stuff? With most of Buffalo's fleet between 50 and 75 years old, the airline is thin on qualified mechanics who know these planes. Oh, yeah. Really thin. It's getting harder and harder to find experienced people for that, that stuff. They're all dead. And it won't be long before Chuck will have more to gripe about. Our APU will not light. Right, do they have any idea if they can fix it? Right at quitting time, Mikey and his brother Rod, Buffalo's director of maintenance, get a distress call about one of their electras on a contract in Manitoba. Uh, tried several attempts and they can't get it started. We are loaded, but we're not going to go anywhere from here tonight. Uh, I guess we're. It looks like we got. 1,200 kilometers away, the Electra is stuck on the tarmac. The auxiliary power unit, or APU, is dead. APU is basically uh, like the heart of the airplane that gets everything going. On turbine engine planes like the Electra, the APU sends a blast of compressed air to start the engines and power up the electrical systems. So if they couldn't get it started, it means they can't start the airplane. And the Electra in Manitoba needs to make an important delivery to a mining camp in the morning. Right now, they've tried everything they can think of, but we probably better call it a night here. Yeah, I guess so. I guess we have to do that. Buffalo has to act fast to save the Electra contract. And the man for the job is Chuck. Push it back. Arnie, push it. Down the floor. Chuck is taking the APU out of Buffalo's other Electra. If the broken APU on the Electra in Manitoba can't be fixed, Chuck will transplant this one into the grounded plane. I'm the one that's going to do all the traveling all the time. I'm getting real sick of it. In Thompson, mechanic Adam Smith is in over his head. It was my first ride in the Electra, the first time I'd even gone anywhere with it. I had no experience with the APU at all. What, what happens if I go there and flick a switch and it starts? You better f punch Adam in the <laughs> face. You know how much a DC-3 costs at midnight? On a Thursday? During playoffs? OK. They Good. load the replacement APU. Great. Keep coming. The very heavy replacement APU into the DC-3. Yeah. It tips the scale at over 1,000 pounds. Those boys are strong. Holy smokes. Oh, here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Get up there. Right there. Want to run your mind through everything else one more time, Chuck? Before no, we I'm good on? to go. Let's boogie woogie.
There's a long night ahead for Chuck and the DC-3 crew. And Chuck won't get any rest on the flight. I don't sleep in an airplane. Never have. Because I don't know what the f***ing ding-dongs up in the front are doing. It's a four-hour flight from Yellowknife to Thompson, Manitoba. By the time the DC-3 touches down on the Thompson runway, it's after 4 a.m. The Electra crew are all fast asleep in their hotel rooms. But Chuck's work is just beginning. With one attempt to start the APU, Chuck's expert ears pick out the problem. The APU is flooded. Fuel has soaked the igniter. So the igniter won't ignite no more. It's just like a spark plug on your car. You flood it, it doesn't, doesn't spark anymore. After only 10 minutes, he believes he's found the cause. Fuel isn't flowing properly through the fuel nozzle. Well, yeah, the fuel nozzle was plug solid. Well, you might as well just have a hose running in there. There is no spray pattern. It's just dripping. It's flooding out the igniter, so the igniter won't ignite no more. Carbon buildup on a fuel nozzle is common in an aging unit like this one. After carting a 1,000-pound replacement APU across the country, the solution could be as simple as cleaning out a dirty nozzle. Aren't you going to be f***ing pissed if this thing works, eh? Chuck's just going to have f***ing bragging rights for ever on the other boys. That bitter? Ready, she's going to fire up. That's it, she's good? I would say so. Oh, let's get the hell out of here. It was a red-eye flight in the DC-3 for an instant and obvious solution. Four hours for what, 15 minute fix? I'm working a bunch of twits. Wow. He knows those electrodes inside out backwards, the APUs, everything. Once again, Chuck has saved the day. Oh, this is great. This is real great. Everybody thinks I'm a hero, but it's not necessarily a hero situation here. A simple fix. So sending the spare APU on the DC-3 was all for nothing and a huge waste of money. Now, somebody has to explain it. That's it, boys. To Buffalo Joe. Just a few hours after Buffalo's DC-3 crew landed Manitoba, the sun is up. What's that, bro? And so is Chuck Adams. There were famous words on Apollo 13, eh? Houston, we have a problem. At Buffalo, it's Chuck, we got a problem. He's doing a final check that the auxiliary power unit he fixed is working and starting up the Electra's four turbine engines. Good. Everything's A-OK -okay now. Never fails. That's the difference between experience. I've got none, and he's got a ton. That's why Chuck will replace Adam on the Electra. And the crew can resume flying mining equipment to a remote site further north. Please clear. But the unnecessary emergency DC-3 flight last night to fix the Electra's APU took a big bite out of this job's profit margin. As you can imagine, flying DC-3 uh, halfway across Canada is not a cheap thing to do, especially when you're not getting paid for it. Power is yours. I'll leave you to the center line. Gears up. The final price tag for a 15-minute fix with a crescent wrench, about $30,000. But back on the ground down in Thompson. Well, we haven't had a plane like this in here for a long time for any of the lodges. Buffalo might have just caught a lucky yeah. break for the DC-3. Well, we only brought four seats, so, so we'll be able to haul passengers. But... 
I happened to spot the uh, DC-3 on the tarmac over there because I've got uh, three big pallets of uh, lumber and some uh, pigs of propane that need to go up to the lodge and been sitting waiting for three years. Cutting roof. Paneling. Yeah. Oh, it's paneling. Oh, shit. Doug Weber needs to get supplies to his fishing lodge on an isolated lake further north. Don't often get an airplane this size to come in uh, here, so we got to be ready for when it happens, and it uh, took us three years to get ready. We're patient. His lumber has been sitting on the tarmac for three years and is showing its age. But Doug's confident it can be salvaged. It's going to take a little grind out before we can use that. A huge fan of the DC-3, Doug cleared a landing strip by his lodge big enough to land just such a plane. But in two decades, no plane this size has ever landed there. It's been a dream of mine to get a three in on that strip for uh, 20 years. All those were the cargo airplanes of the day. But shortly after we got the lodge built and the strip built, the DC-3s disappeared in that part of the country. So. Well, check it out. See, uh, Doug still believes that if you build it, they will come, eventually. There's only one problem. The strip near the lakeshore is made of sand. On touchdown, the landing gear of the 25,000-pound fully loaded DC-3 could sink into the sand, causing the plane to skid out of control on the unstable surface. I got the propane and the lumber ready to go now. I just okay. uh, got to get a few. But if the DC-3 can land on the sand strip, this last-minute charter could help pay for yesterday's flight here. That one little trip would have paid for the fuel. Still there? But first, Arnie needs clearance from Buffalo Joe. The only thing is I want to know what strips are going in it. We don't know the strip. It's called Knife Lake. Back in Yellowknife, at the weekly pilots meeting, okay. Joe weighs the risks. On the land. And what do they land there in the summertime? Uh, beavers. Beavers? No, He turns to lodge owner Doug Weber for more details. Hello? Hey, Doug? I got you on speakerphone here with my father, Joe. We just got a couple of questions about your uh, strip there at uh, Knife Lake there. OK, go ahead. Yeah, Joe, here. What kind of airplanes have you used it? We've had Commander, Twin Otters, Islanders, nothing really close to the AC-3 size, but. Uh... Doug's answer isn't what Joe wants to hear. Sand is a very movable surface. So uh, if you land a DC-3 on a sandy strip that isn't you know, somewhat compact, you can lose control of the airplane and, you know, do a lot of damage. Joe needs to guarantee the safety of his crew and his DC-3. The lodge owner has an idea. Well, we'd be going in, probably check it out. You've got a crew here, we can take one of them with us, whatever. A scouting trip in a smaller plane will tell them if the strip is safe. OK. They're going to go in and do a strip check before we go in. Yeah, OK, do it. Hang on to this. I want to ask you about something. All the stress of this busy season comes at a bad time for Rod McBrien. He's already got a lot on his mind. He's smiling. He's smiling. He's smiling. Really his wife, Sasha, is due to give birth any day. The battle that I fight is between home life and work life. If you can make the industry, the aviation industry, and your home life work, that would be the key. The phones are always ringing. They're always running back to the airport. Rod doesn't have just a job, definitely. We live a lifestyle. His dad certainly doesn't take many days off, so he doesn't feel, I guess, that he should either. The new baby will throw a big wrench into the balance between home and work. And I'm kind of nervous because I know what I've been doing my whole life. Now I have to figure out what somebody else needs. <laughs> Some things are non-negotiable. Rod won't be trading in his Shelby Mustang for a minivan. I think they were built to drive, not to put in a garage. And even if it's impractical, Rod's determined to make it all fit. Yeah, I picked out a baby seat. There's actually an attachment in the back, so thanks to Ford and Shelby, they've uh, thought of that for me. But with things heating up at Buffalo, fitting parenthood into his job could be a lot harder than fitting a baby into his car. The 
The next morning, the Electra returns to Yellowknife. The job in Manitoba is done, but Chuck and the crew aren't getting any downtime. Could be a long day. Yeah, we're six hours before we're home, but with the loading and whatever, we're going to be seven hours or whatever. At least. Um, yeah, we're just uh, loading up the Electra, heading up to the high Arctic. A new grocery store is set to open in the far north of Nunavut territory. They need enough stock to fill an entire supermarket. And there's only one plane at Buffalo that can fit the last minute load. How are we looking? If we crash, we'll never starve. We won't have to eat each other's bodies. We can live on chips for about two months. Well, tell me it's over here. We got to go. But this rush job isn't rushed enough for everybody. We should have been out here two hours ago. With the Electra task to go, Chuck has been tasked to go with her. And he's happy as ever to be taking another flight. Right cranky. Well, it's like I said, the monkey's got to go with the Electra. If anything goes wrong, I got to get the APU going. Yeah, look at this. Everything put away, but the we're going flying with this, I guess. This must be like a new addition to the airplane. Somebody forgot to remove the tail pole. Some goddamn friggin' pilot. Now I gotta put my coffee down again. For sakes. But he's a hell of a good engineer. We have to tolerate a lot with that. Clear enough to hit. Work piling up on the ground, Chuck wants to get this flight behind him as soon as he can. But the Electra might have some ideas of its own. In Thompson, Manitoba, Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader taxis his DC-3 across the tarmac. He'll begin loading lumber destined for a fishing lodge further north. Arnie is taking a chance, loading before he's sure he can land on the sand strip by the lodge. Owner Doug Weber built the strip for big planes. But the sandy surface could be too soft for the heavy DC-3. 67-year-old Arnie helps get the cargo on the DC-3, which is as old as he is. Tilt forward. If you're going to fly these type of airplanes, it will Older airplanes that are freighters, you're gonna do a lot of that. Keep going. You're good. You're good. They attract not the nicest loads in the world. There's not too many chief pilots of his antiquity that are able to uh, push a big pig of propane up on a set of forks. Stature sounds better. I'll go with stature. <laughs> okay, stature. It's just got it right there. Perfect. Four days ago, I would have never believed this could happen. Doug's waited three years for the right plane to come along to move this lumber. The stress is slowly starting to dissipate. I'll be happy when I see that thing touch down at North Knife Lake. That'll be the finale. But that won't happen until Arnie confirms whether Doug's sandy strip can handle this much plane. And it's time to find out. You are, man. How Nelson Barber, how are you? Good to see you. Yep. You guys up in the back? Doug's son-in-law has arrived with a Cessna 185 so they can scout the landing strip. We're going to go yeah. scope her out, man. Moment of truth. Doug's fishing lodge is on North Knife Lake, 240 kilometers away. As they zero in, Everyone's mind is on the landing and what it will tell Arnie about Doug's sand airstrip. The dangers are they can be too soft, they can be washed out, they haven't been used. The Cessna touches down on the sand, but at 3,000 pounds, this small aircraft is only a fraction of the weight of a 25,000 pound DC-3. We taxied through the whole strip. You know, and walked over a bunch of it. And yeah, you have a good look at them. Just make sure, you know. It's got about three inches of soft, eh? That's it. 
It's a little soft up at the top there, so, but we'll be slowed down by the time we get there. Arnie makes his call. I'm gonna go get the three and come back. It's not perfect, but he's willing to try. All right, have fun, you guys. Okay, see you in about three hours. Three hours, so we have. real thrilled to see the three come in here and land on, on a strip that's uh, never seen one before. That landing will be the true test of whether this runway built for a DC-3 can actually handle a DC-3. Meanwhile, 1,500 kilometers north, high above the Arctic Circle, the Electra approaches the remote Nunavut community of Tuloyuak in the middle of the Northwest Passage. Back in the 1830s, Polar explorer Sir John Ross's ship was stuck in the ice here for four years. During that time, Ross discovered the always shifting magnetic North Pole, which at that time was right near Tuloyuak. Now the Electra crew, including reluctant mechanic Chuck Adams, is bringing a huge load of groceries to the isolated town. Co-pilot Graham Ferguson has come along to help unload, just for a chance to see the true Arctic. I don't know what to expect. This is pretty cool, though. This is crazy. I've never been north of the tree line before. <laughs> it's like literally a town in the middle of nowhere. But Chuck's seen it all before. He spent a lot of time up here back when it was called Spence Bay. All he cares about is a quick turnaround, so he can get back to the work waiting at home. By the time the crew finishes unloading, it's well into evening, and everyone's eager to take off. It's 9-11, and we'll be out of here within about, if Chuck would start number five, we could be out of here in about 10 minutes flat, but. Okay, let's go. We're gonna be. Get the fuck in the seat. Number five is the APU that Chuck just fixed in Thompson. Without a blast of compressed air from the APU, the plane's four big engines won't start. There, I'm ready to go. See, without me, they don't go nowhere. They can flick switches all fucking day. But today, even Chuck might not get them moving. It was great till the APU would start again. The APU starts turning, but it's not firing. God damn fucking shit. Engine number five is turning out to be a big zero. So I go through the exact same scenario. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. I think it's plugging up again. Once again, fixing the APU is all up to Chuck. I need this goddamn shit. Back in Thompson, Manitoba, the DC-3 crew gears up for the journey to the sand landing strip. At their destination, Doug Weber preps for the arrival he's been hoping to see for 20 years. We just kind of wait until an opportunity comes along, and this time it was a bit of a long wait, but I think it's going to be worth it. But as his dream gets closer to reality, there's still no guarantee the sand strip will provide enough traction for the mammoth DC-3. The crew won't really know until their wheels hit the sand. over North Knife Lake in northern Manitoba, DC-3 Captain Arnie Schrader hones in on his target. Hey, give me the gear down. 
a sand runway that's never seen a plane this heavy. If the sand is too soft, the wheels could dig in too deep, causing Arnie to lose control of the plane. strip holds up and lodge owner Doug Weber's dream has come true. Well I guess we built an not about DC3 strip, eh Arnie? No, it's good. That was pretty cool. It worked out just fine. I I couldn't be happier, I'll tell you. This is just a great day for me, I'll tell you. The strip has been properly christened, but the work is far from over. Yeah, I got a loader, that's how you get them off me. This is about 600 pounds. And even the 67-year-old captain has to pull his weight. That should do enough. Pretend like I'm working it. That's going to be a classic. It's a day Doug will never forget. Be in my pants here. He built a runway for a DC-3. And 20 years later, it came. Pretty cool. That airplane belongs on this runway. Thanks a lot, Arnie. You I betcha. can't tell you how much I appreciate okay, this. Well, this we enjoyed a doing real it. thrill for me. It's time to rock and roll. Good job well done. Last-minute delivery has helped Buffalo recoup the cost of sending the DC-3 to Manitoba in the first place. And it's made one lodge owner the happiest guy in the world. Oh, cool. Or at least the happiest guy on North Knife Lake. On the Buffalo ramp, Joe and his wife Sharon roll in after a flight from Hay River to Yellowknife. Here's your boy. Yes. Where their grandson Kenny has an update on one of the most important missions in Buffalo history. So you don't know if, if Rod's got in the hospital or not yet? No, they're not in the hospital. Yeah, I just called them before you guys landed. It says that it's getting harder. Well, you better take The whole McBrien family is gathering for the birth of Rod and Sasha's baby. They plan to wait with Sasha at the house until the time comes. And then the women will head with Rod to the hospital. They're basically sitting around uh, measuring contractions, waiting for it to get to some sort of critical mass. Are you guys going to Rod's right now? Yeah. Is it going to be like PG-13 or? I don't know. At least that's the plan for most of the family. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor by any means. Uh, farthest thing away from a doctor. Uh, so during that whole, the whole thing there, the, I think the best I could do is just stay away. But Mikey's girlfriend, Gail, has a different idea. Once in a lifetime thing here. There's a hockey game on right now. Well, what's more important, a hockey game or your niece or nephew? It depends how long the hockey game goes. When everybody's worrying about the baby, um, I, there's a lot of help there. There's a lot of talent in that room, so I thought, hey, I might as well just uh, go worry about what's happening in the hockey world. So while the rest of the family heads to Rod and Sasha's house, Mikey hits the bar. So I ran down to uh, the local watering hole, Surly Bob's, with a couple of my buddies. But Gail tracks him down. Hey, Gail. Uh, <laughs> I'm at Surly Bob's. You're at Surly Bob's? You know, the hockey game's on, and just, just call us if you have uh, if you have any news, OK? They like you better than they like me anyway. OK, bye. Well, uh, yeah, she's not too happy. But anyway. Up on the Arctic Ocean, the Electra is still stuck on the Toloyoak tarmac, where mechanic Chuck Adams is wrestling with a power unit that refuses to start. We got nozzles all plugged up. It's deja vu all over again for Chuck. Man, 
This time, Chuck doesn't have a spare nozzle. He's got to clean out the clogged one. How does this go together now? But cold and frazzled, getting the piece back into the right place has become a serious case of Humpty Dumpty. See, that goes like so. I don't think I was going to get it back together either. At all, we're really doomed. Which way does this fing thing go? It's going to look so. It's already almost 11 p.m. under the 24 hour sun. Hey, watch yourself. It would really be nice to be home in my hot tub. <laughs> Dinner's going to be a little while longer. <laughs> Even with a clean nozzle, the APU refuses to fire. And but if it, it can be fixed, Chuck will fix it. I have faith. The question now, can it be fixed? Spray pattern's good. I'm getting fuel, but it still won't run. It should run. Oh, for fuck's sake. Give me that goddamn screws for it. Freeze to death here. I don't want to be falling with Joe. See, I need another DZ3. Bring up another APU, because he'd go fucking ballistic. That's why I wanted to get it going. The engineer I used to work with said that sometimes that when you're trying really hard to make something happen, that if you walk away and just take a break, when you come back to it, you see it entirely different. But that engineer wasn't Chuck Adams. Jesus Christ, I'm going to need a 516 wrench, too. He says he's got coffee in here, so you might come and have a cup of coffee and then try it again. I want to get the out of here and go home. Well, I know that. Ah, this fing APU. I'm not going to stop until I get it solved. That's the way I've always been. As the night wears on, Buffalo's Electra mastermind might have finally met the problem he can't solve. At the Stanton Territorial Hospital in Yellowknife, Mikey McBrien is searching for his family. He's hoping he's not too late for the birth of his brother's baby. No one called, so we were getting kind of nervous. I just had a thought that, you know, if this is it, I have to get down there. This is Ray Wonder. Oh. I thought that was, <laughs> oh, obstetrics. Yeah, uh, Sasha McBride? They said to wait in the waiting room there, please. It's not a good time. Sasha's in labor, but Mikey won't get any closer than the waiting room. It looks like I'm locked out here, so we'll uh, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully everything's going good. And uh, according to movies, this thing takes quite a while, so uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens and uh, sit tight. I need a 516 socket. On the ramp in Toloyuak, there's another waiting game going on. When he sets himself to a project, he's pretty determined, all right. The Electra crew still hopes Chuck can get them home. But Chuck is firing blanks. He usually comes through. We have our fingers crossed here that he's going to do it again. It's after 1 a.m. Chuck's been at it for four hours, and the crew is restless. I swear the sun's coming back up right now. Like an hour ago, it was darker outside. It's coming up over the horizon again right now. Give me that 3 eighths back. And with the Arctic version of Dawn already upon him, even the man who never quits I'm going to burn this thing for 10 minutes. is hitting his wall. Basically, it was going through my head. I want to quit. I want to get on a dog sled, another airplane, and get the f out of here. My fingers are frozen. I couldn't feel anything anymore. I mean, you can't feel anything. There's no use doing it anymore. Tomorrow, they might just have to call for a rescue plane to bring them a spare APU, something Chuck doesn't want to happen again. So we're going to be able to get roost tonight or what? We'll continue on this in the morning. OK, let's see what we can do here. In the Yellowknife Hospital, Mikey's also getting ready to call it a night. You know, it's kind of funny. I was getting restless. And uh, wait before I was going to go, they, my mom came out. It's a girl. No way. Honest to God. It, it just happened? Just, just born now. 
Awesome. Wait till you see her. She's perfect. Mikey updates Joe. Still waiting back at the house. Hi. It's, uh, they had it. What is it? It's a girl. Really? Uh, is everybody okay? Uh, yeah, no, everything's good. It's crazy. She's so cute. It's crazy. It's a girl. Congratulations there, Rod. That's oh, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. That's insane. That's insane. God, Gail was there. <laughs> a couple of times almost flamed out, but she was right there. Oh, yeah. Can't flame out. <laughs> Joe and his oldest grandson, Kenny, arrive. Even Joe can't hide his happiness tonight. Congratulations, Grandpa. Oh. Thank you. Aww. <laughs> Congratulations. You had to work it out for him now. I know what it's all about. So it'll be good for them, you know. I'm happy for Rod. I'm happy for Sasha. I'm happy for this uh, new baby girl we have in her family, and hopefully she can start work on Monday. Just a few hours later in Toloyuac, Chuck's day is already beginning. You getting the rest of the guys up? All of them. But there's no more sleep for the guy who never likes to leave a job undone. Let's go. That night, he slept maybe an hour. Oh, my, my God. I just can't go home and go right to sleep. I'm too wound up. Right now, Chuck's mind seems as stalled as his APU. Where's the door? But he's their only hope for getting out of Toloyuac today. Plan is, man, we're going to get this thing going right now. But groggy as he is, Chuck's come to the ramp with a new theory, a bad switch between the battery and the igniter. He wants to bypass it with a wire directly to the battery. Then I just thought, instead of going through the starter solenoid, which is directly off the battery, I'll go directly to the battery. There we go. Found a set of small jumper cables. There we go. It's roadside assistance for a 57,000-pound turboprop airplane. Go around that. Oh, yeah! The APU's clearly firing again. more to come. Chuck's got to burn off all the fuel built up during his multiple failed attempts to start the system. Hang on, boys. Turning the APU into a flamethrower. OK. Put it all away. I was happier than a pig of shit, man. We're on our way home. Out of here. Why didn't you do this last night? <laughs> You wanted to stay here one more night, I know. I want to get out of here, because it might not fire up again. I spent a lot of time in Spence Bay. I want to make sure I can get out of there before they find out I might have some kids there. See any bald-headed, red-headed kids walking around? Don't be surprised. That's why I wanted to get out of there. As Chuck fires up the APU one final time, with one final blast, his reputation as a miracle worker still stands. I had faith that he would, but it was just getting a little longer than he normally takes to get his magic done. But he did it. <laughs> and as the Electra finally gets up in the air, the guy who never sleeps on planes is down for the count. <laughs> a new morning at the Stanton Territorial Hospital in Yellowknife, and the start of a whole new life for Sasha and Rod McBrien. It's the old ultrasounds you want, but something that happens and changes about the time you hear the first cry, you realize, holy smokes, you know? Feels awesome. It's like I waited for too long. I waited so long for you to come. 
Hey, baby, finally got here. Today, the newest member of the McBrien family is heading home. And the new father already looks like a natural. From the minute we were getting ready to leave the hospital, I, I see this side of rod coming out. Make sure she's in the seat belt. You know, get this around where her arm is. God, I'm glad you know what to do, Rod. I just felt like this is what you do, and that's what you do. Um, I don't know where that comes from. Uh, this is outside. This is what it looks like outside. Rod's instinctual. He has instincts, and they kick in, and he's not afraid. So today, Rod's decided that baby's going home in daddy's muscle car. Well, this will be nice and comfortable for baby. Shelby Mustangs aren't the easiest thing in the world, but fits nonetheless. She's good. She's doing good. But this time, Rod's not burning any rubber. You know, you can picture coming home with your new baby all you want, but then the day that it's happening is, it's, it's surreal. Oh, finally home. Hey, baby. Welcome home. She's like, geez, OK, good enough. I'm going back to bed. <laughs> we got home, and, and there it was, that moment. You, we have the name? Emma Ray. Emma Ray? Hey, Emma Ray. She says, I don't care what my name is. I'm hungry. I have trust in Rod's words a, a lot more now about how he wants to find balance from work and having a family. This is your room, baby girl. I think the bed's too big. That bed fit Mikey. <laughs> All that I thought was important before is not really important. Hi. <laughs> Balance baby first, and everything else balances itself. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Yeah, we got smoke on the edge. A mid-air emergency. She's spitting oil like a bass. He's any fire. Forces the crew down. <laughs> the newest McBrien gets her buffalo initiation. Oh, really and Scott gets a lucky break. Is this a weird dream right now? On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT. We got smoke on an inch. A mid-air emergency. She's spitting oil like a bass. He's any fire. Forces the crew down. The newest McBrien gets her buffalo initiation. Oh, there you go, he touched it. And Scott gets a lucky break. It's a weird dream right now. It may be springtime. With temperatures between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius, but that doesn't make running a northern airline any easier. A thousand kilometers west, a trough of low pressure is unleashing harsh weather on Canada's Yukon Territory. A severe storm is sweeping in from the coast, and that's a problem for Buffalo Airways Captain Justin Simley. Uh, thunderstorms are coming up on the, the, the Matar. His flight plan leads straight into the storm. Well, we have a very important charter to Whitehorse coming up. Uh, Justin just informed me that there's thunderstorms between here and Whitehorse. Uh, so he's saying that we might have some delays. Uh, you know, it's very important for these passengers to get there. It's for a conference. Uh, we can't be late. 13 civil servants headed to the Northern Bioenergy Conference in Whitehorse are already starting to board. Uh, the passengers have meetings, they have delegations, they have conferences. Once you commit to, to leave with them, your commitment is, is to make sure they arrive on time. Hey, Andrew. I think we're gonna, we're gonna delay it. But the weather around their destination forces a sudden change of plans. Hold on. Everyone can go and sit back down for a bit. <laughs> we got to look at some uh, some weather there. Hey, John. Co-pilot Andrew Vike uh, breaks the news. It just kind of went down in Whitehorse, so we might have to delay it for a bit. 
The flight isn't going anywhere until Justin likes what he sees on the weather maps. Yeah, so she's saying there's two big cells, one north and west of the airport. So this cell's like right in our track from Watson. Okay. It's, a, it's a big cell, tops are like 30,000 feet, but they're two isolated cells at this point. A storm cell is an air mass formed by powerful updrafts and downdrafts. They can unleash thunder, lightning, heavy winds, rain, or hail. Not a good idea to be flying through the hills uh, with some thunderstorms rocking and rolling. So see what happens. But Joe's pilots must always play it safe. If fly don't look good, hold for another 12, go five and one. Yeah. Won't go in there if you can't get out of it. The weather may be fine in Yellowknife, but the crew and passengers will have to wait for it to improve 1,100 kilometers away around Whitehorse. Whitehorse is so nice. you never been in. Eh? Like, downtown is like a real downtown. Nice. Yeah, like, freaking man, everything there. Even a Starbucks. If this charter gets off the ground, the Buffalo crew will wait in Cosmopolitan Whitehorse during the conference, a chance for some R&R. You're always going full tilt around here, 24-7, basically. So it'll be nice just to wake up, you know, tomorrow morning and just go for breakfast, relax, you know, maybe do a bit of fishing. That thing's bigger than my nephew. I definitely want to go fishing. I'm pumped just to be out of yellow night for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. A few hours later, Andrew checks on the Yukon weather. We had clouds at about 4,800 feet in the last hour, now they're at 6,000 feet. Uh, the winds have calmed down. The That's captain the makes his decision. I think we're okay. Sounds good, man. Okay. Weather looks to be good, so we're just going to throw a little bit more fuel in the plane, and uh, we'll be out of here in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay? I think we're good to go here, so we're on our way. The white horse again. After a shaky start, Justin can only hope the weather in Whitehorse continues to improve when they fly over the Mackenzie Mountains. Buffalo 224, line up for runway 15, copy for all runways are on. Line up only, runway 15, Buffalo 224. It's a five-hour flight to Whitehorse, 1,100 kilometers over some of the most rugged wilderness in Canada. So far, there's no sign of any bad weather up ahead. For Andrew, this is a rare chance to fly over new terrain. It's pretty nice, man. It's not flat like everything else I've done so far. There's actually eight mountains. It's all good, man. It's a change of scenery in Skypex. As clouds loom in the west, Justin checks on the weather in Whitehorse. Buffalo 224, Whitehorse radio. And uh, Whitehorse, it's Buffalo 224. We're just looking for the latest out of Whitehorse. Uh, still some thunderstorms in the air. Affirmative. Uh, there's still some uh, isolated storms. Uh, 6,000 scattered with cumulonimbus with thunderstorms and uh, lightning clouds at ground. Okay, uh, Buffalo 224, we check. Thanks very much. Not what Justin was hoping for. The storms aren't clearing out as quickly as expected. Then, 400 kilometers from Whitehorse. What's that? We got smoke on the engine here. The oil pressure in the right engine is suddenly dropping. It could be a major oil leak. She's spitting oil like a bastard out there. They could be minutes from engine failure. Uh, unless it's on the other side of the cowling. There's nothing on my side here. From the rear of the plane, John has a good look. Yeah, it's starting to smoke a little bit more there now, Justin. Do you see any fire, John? It's basically white smoke. Roger. Maybe a bit of oil or something, right? The number two engine could be failing. 
Hey, Andrew, I gotta go have a look at this thing. I want you to just hold 95 or 100 knots as best you can there. Okay, we're watching temperatures. Number two engine, pressures. Yeah, you do what you need to do, man. Justin heads to the back of the plane to take a look. The vibrations are shaking loose the bolts that hold the engine cover or cowling. Never to feed how that cowling's coming off. Andrew's a rookie in a situation he's never encountered before. Go ahead there, Justin. Yeah, I'm just saying good. Okay. They're far from home over mountains and heading into thunderstorms. Now, they have serious engine trouble and there's no landing strip in sight. She's spinning a little like a bastard out there. Buffalo's DC-3 charter to Whitehorse is in trouble. There's dangerous weather up ahead and the number two engine is smoking and could fail. Immediately, the gears start going in the brain. Uh, if we have to shut down that engine, are we going to be able to sustain level, sustain level flight? Uh, where's our closest airport? Can we get in there? Do we carry on to the destination, or do we have to land at that alternate? Captain Justin Simley has a decision to make. Go ahead there, Justin. Yeah, I'm just thinking. The DC-3 is an hour and a half from Whitehorse, but just 15 minutes from an airstrip at Watson Lake. Being 40 miles out of Watson Lake and being in mountainous terrain uh, with uh, thunderstorms around, uh, I felt it was necessary to land at uh, Watson Lake. All right, dude, let's, uh, let's start her down. I'm just going to give her a little power here and see if she'll take that throttle again. Justin doesn't want to alarm the passengers, so he ponders how to have John explain the diversion. Yeah, tell him, just let him know that the, there's some thunderstorms are around Whitehorse still. And uh, we're just going to divert to Watson uh, briefly. We'll uh, take them into the terminal and, uh, and I'll make necessary calls to the company. Okay. Okay. Altimeter 2976. With number two throttled back but still smoking, Justin has only minutes to get on to approach to the Watson Lake airstrip. 37, 33. Straight in front of us, sir. You bet you got the strip there. Two left. Uh, one more time, have a look. Thanks. Good job. Good job, guys. 224, can I get your type of aircraft, please? Uh, 224 is a DC-3. The Watson Lake Airport was built as a way station during World War II for U.S. planes being transported up to Russia. And the stormy area has a tragic history of weather-related airplane disasters. In 1942, a B-26 Marauder crash-landed on the lake. A few years later, an Avro Lincoln did the same. Safely on dry land, Justin has to plot his next move, while he and the crew examine the faulty engine. Would she piss on me? Leaking oil has left its trace on the cowling. Normally, these planes are so reliable, Buffalo doesn't send a mechanic on DC-3 flights. So, far from home, Without tools, parts, or repairman, Justin can only call back to Buffalo HQ and ask for help. She was still sh shaking and smoking pretty good. It's, I think it's jug, but I haven't taken the cowl off yet. So. Yeah, it's looking really good. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's oil leaking out of it for sure. With a possible cracked cylinder, Justin faces the fact that this normally reliable DC-3 isn't going anywhere tonight. Get some maintenance out here and uh, and some spare parts, and we'll get these guys a hotel, and uh, we'll go tomorrow when the airplane's fixed. You gotta be the bearer of bad news, right? Flight attendant John Martin breaks the news to the passengers. It's showtime. Who have to be in Whitehorse by morning for a conference. 
All right, so uh, Justin made the call. He said, we're going to stay here tonight. I'll go up and talk to the guy upstairs and um, get him to call cabs for you guys and see what the where the hotels are in town and stuff. But on the bright side, we're only an hour and a half from Whitehorse. Back in Yellowknife, Joe's already scrambling to come up with a solution. Keep an eye on that constant weather, Alex. He calls in a favor from a buddy who owns an airline in Whitehorse. We got on the phone and hired, uh, got uh, Joe Sparling and, at Air North, and within an hour he had a hawker in the air coming from Whitehorse down to Watts Lake. This is the airline business, Northern style. When one company has a problem late at night, another rushes a crew together and comes to the rescue. The backup plane, Air North's Hawker Sidley, arrives in Watson Lake. The Hawker is essentially the European DC-3. And in fact, it was designed to replace the DC-3. So actually, in this scenario, it kind of did. Buffalo Joe's connections in the north have paid off. His passengers will soon be on their way to Whitehorse in another company's plane. Gave us some breathing room to sit back and see how we're going to uh, fix our airplane. At the same time, we were able to get our passengers into Whitehorse in, in a timely fashion. This isn't about money. It's about saving face and about future business with the government. So Joe is determined to have his plane fly the passengers home after their conference in Whitehorse. Morning, sirs. Morning. Shorts. Shorts, yeah. Matching jackets. First thing in the morning, Joe arrives on the sked and springs yes, into action. Uh, can you get me Rod for a minute? We'll have a little meeting here. Yeah. What we want to do is uh, get uh, Cliff, and I'm going to send a helper with him. Joe is sending mechanic Cliff Dyson, a 14-year veteran with Buffalo, to Watson Lake. Because of the blown cylinder, we didn't want to take any risks because we're flying over mountainous terrain, so we sent our best uh, mechanic. And I don't want to jeopardize the the airplane until we've had a good test. Oh, yeah. It could do a half-hour flight around Watson Lake. On a and then we know whether or not we should be ferrying home, replacing the airplane, or continue with it. Yeah. So I would um, take as much stuff, flash up and go. Right. There's your pilot. Captain A.J. DeCoast will fly him there. So they're going to go replace the cylinder and hopefully get it serviceable by tonight to make uh, Whitehorse. Buffalo Rescue Squad sets out, with Cliff bringing along his son Travis as his assistant. They've got just one day to storm in and get the plane fit to fly to Whitehorse, or kiss any more charters for this customer goodbye. At six foot seven, Scott Blue is a big guy with a big voice. <laughs> There's one box underneath. Get out of here, media! <laughs> Scott and another Buffalo pilot, Gord Cooling, are loading the DC-4 for a run tomorrow. Scott is a C-46 co-pilot. He rarely gets to fly the big four engine DC-4, but if he wants to add it to his repertoire, he needs stick time before he can take the DC-4 pilot test. Can you come with me just to get that blast yeah. thing? Thanks. Though tomorrow, he'll be on board just to help with the cargo. Still. Going for a flight beats the hell out of hanging around the barn anytime. Over in the Yukon, Buffalo's stranded DC-3 crew has a few hours to spare until the mechanics arrive from Yellowknife. The pilots are in Watson Lake, population 1,500 the gateway to the Yukon, and kilometer 980 of the Alaska Highway. With a short cab ride, they visit Watson Lake's most famous tourist attraction, the Signpost Forest. Cool. Home to over 75,000 signs. We should have brought a buffalo sign to hang up here. In 1942, 
a homesick American working on the Alaska Highway, put up a sign showing the distance to his hometown. Others followed, and a tradition was born. Some call it the largest collection of stolen property in the world. Imagine the tax dollars that are spent just for this place to replace signs. <laughs> There's a little bit of home, man. <laughs> Someone stole a Crescent Beach Cloverdale sign. <laughs> their cultural excursion over. It's time for the crew to return to the airport to meet the repair team. Buffalo's rescue plane touches down, with pilot A.J. DeCoast and mechanics Cliff and Travis Dyson on board. Hello, folks. What you guys do now? Over the years, Cliff has earned his chops as a mobile mechanic, fixing Buffalo Airways vintage planes throughout the north. Oh, I'm just going to see how bad it is as we call it, assess the situation. If Cliff can repair this DC-3, he'll also help repair Buffalo's reputation. <laughs> but it did let right go, eh? And it, you could see it, when it let go, it hit knocked the cowling up like there was like that much of a space yeah. between the cowling on the top right-hand side. Okay. Before removing the jug, Travis strains the engine oil through a cloth for telltale signs of metal shards. Sure enough, Aluminum was sheared off when the piston scraped the cylinder wall. Luckily, there's no sign of further damage. The crew removes the engine cowling to get to the suspect cylinder. Now, Buffalo's maintenance crew can get down to work. In Yellowknife, there's a different maintenance job underway at Rod and Sasha McBrien's house. And you want to hold her body just between your elbow and your body here, like this. Oops. Emma Ray is now 12 days old, and midwife Heather Redshaw is teaching Rod the fine art of bathing a baby. Yeah. We'll just do her face first without any soap or anything, just so that she doesn't get anything in her eyes. For a guy who's spent a lot more time changing spark plugs than diapers, Rod is adapting to his new role as dad. She's not waking up from Well, she's... Hey, baby. Sasha gives her husband full marks. Rod wasn't scared of this. He wasn't nervous. And I felt she was so small and so slippery in the water. And he, he wasn't afraid at all. He did great. What's daddy doing? He's doing all this stuff that pisses me off. The moment she was born, I realized all that I thought was important before was not really important. Now with a baby, you realize nothing else really matters. Yeah, get those little creases good, dad. The minute that, that Emma Ray arrived, I don't know. It was just like something changed in Rod. He needs to be with her during the day, and that's as important as whatever's happening at work. Oh, there we up. go. There you go. Well, good job, Dad. Woo. On the tarmac in Watson Lake, mechanic Cliff Dyson has removed the cause of the DC-3 engine problem, a broken cylinder also known as a jug. Got piston inside, that's what's moving up and down. And when she blew, this thing should be one piece. That's what happened. And sure enough, we got oil pissing out, and that's what we saw over the side. And that created smoke, and from there we knew it was bad news. In the engine, friction and heat from the pounding pistons make the cylinder walls expand. Then they cool after shutdown. It's rare, but in the Arctic extremes, this can weaken a cylinder wall over time until it eventually cracks. After years of fixing planes flown in harsh northern winters, Cliff has seen a lot of jugs blown out. This is for take sweet time, eh? You know, and then shock cooling, you know, like cold, hot, cold, hot. It's not the first one I've seen, and it won't be the last one either. Installing the new cylinder is painstaking work. But the pressure's on to get this bird in the air and restore Buffalo's can-do reputation. At last, the new cylinder is snugged into place. Tomorrow morning, we'll do a test flight to determine if the plane can fly to Whitehorse and bring the passengers home. It's morning in Watson Lake in the Yukon, and the Buffalo crew is ready to go. 
but is their newly fixed DC-3. The job's all done. So go for a test flight for a half an hour, make sure everything's good, come back, pull the screen, make sure the screen is clean, and after that, we'll head to Whitehorse. Cliff will stay with the DC-3 while AJ and Travis head back to Yellowknife. So uh, get John and give Mike a call, please. Yeah. All right, thanks. With its new cylinder in place, the DC-3 is ready for a test flight. Justin does a run-up on the tarmac. The crew watches the temperature and oil pressure gauges carefully to make sure the new jug is working properly. It's all good, but the true test is getting her up in the air. We're just up for a test flight. Mechanic Cliff Dyson's work is on the line. If his repairs don't pass the test, Buffalo's reputation could be badly bruised. The charter passengers are expecting the DC-3 to fly them home from Whitehorse. And Buffalo boss Joe McBrien doesn't want to have to call on a competitor to bail him out again. She's shaking out there, she's leaking. How's she doing? No shaking, no leaking. Cliff checks out engine number two for himself. So far, everything looks okay. Coming up on uh, 10 miles from now, and spring her out, come back in. Justin gives rookie Andrew a chance to land. Pretty good. Yeah, that's all right, actually. With Cliff's seal of approval, yeah, not bad at all. engine number two is ready to go. So we've got the plane all fixed up, uh, and uh, we're on our way to wait for us. In Yellowknife, Buffalo is preparing a DC-4 to fly a load of construction materials to the Arctic town of Kukluktuk formerly known as Copper Mine. In the spring, Arctic weather can be dangerously unpredictable. Where's a uh, Copper Mine? Right here, so there's nothing now. Co-pilots Dan Catoni and Scott Blue check the latest right forecast. Earlier this morning, an ice storm over Kugluktuk delayed the DC-4's departure. We are OK. Yeah, it looks good to me. Now, things seem to be improving. Hey, Ernie. Yeah. Hey, uh, the icing's all gone in that area, so we'll load her up. We can do it today. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader will be at the throttle. It's a fair amount of shit, actually, once you start putting it into the plane. Yeah. And Scott Blue, who mostly flies the C-46, hopes Arnie will offer him a Take stint in the DC-4's co-pilot seat. Yeah, I'm going to go with you guys, too. Very cool. That's uh, Sounds That's good, man. But this isn't good oh, yeah, for Scott. AJ's already a captain on the DC-3 and C-46. He just needs a few more flying hours in the DC-4 to become a captain on this plane as well. Arnie extended the offer for me to go along with him and kind of get re-familiarized with the DC-4 a little bit. They might need another captain on it, so I'll uh, get on it any chance I can. So Scott's prospects for climbing into the cockpit just took a plunge. If there's one thing that uh, you learn at Buffalo, so you don't count your chickens before they hatch. It's a 600-kilometer trip to the Nunavut village of Kugluktuk by the Arctic Ocean. As the plane heads due north, Scott studies the DC-4 manual. Even if he doesn't get a shot in the cockpit, he's trying to learn as much as he can, brushing up on everything from hydraulic reservoirs to anti-icing equipment. 
Then, a stroke of luck. Arnie invites Scott, not AJ, up to the cockpit. He squeezes his six foot seven frame into the co-pilot seat. Hello there, Mr. Schroeder. Hello, Scotty. For you, when you get flying this thing, you can adjust those rudder pedals down forward. Eh? Oh, for sure. Need a little pad for you, Joe, guys. Need them at the fucking floor. Us lanky bastards, man. Drive away, Jose. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds like fun. It's a very cool experience flying the DC-4 because you look out and you got two radial engines spinning there. It's not something you find very often these days. Planes with four radial piston engines are rare birds indeed. And the DC-4 was one of the first big planes to feature tricycle landing gear, a small nose wheel, and two big wheel sets under the wings. If you look at the setup of this plane, tricycle landing gear, you know, wing engine, big fuselage like this, it's just, you know, one of the very first basic design of a modern airliner. And, you know, from here they went to turboprops and they went to jets on the wing. The same basic layout. I mean, this is flying history. But Scott's moment of glory gets interrupted. An hour outside of Yellowknife, they hit some rough weather. And Arnie needs Dan back in the right seat. Here we'll take her down to 2700. Arnie dips below the ice clouds, where he should be able to see the gravel strip at Kugluktuk. It's coming up from 20 miles, and we're there and get towards the runway, I should say. But the late spring melt has exposed gravel patches everywhere, making it hard to spot the gravel strip. Hard to find the runway, actually. Blends right yeah, in. Uh, it's hard to see it, Kugluktuk lies on the coast of the Arctic Ocean, at the mouth of the Copper Mine River. So Arnie tries to find the shoreline. You can see uh, it's almost like a ship on the shoreline. Oh, man. Okay. See the beacon? That yeah. tower there. Hey, we'll go gear down. Oh, wow. 105 over 87. 100. spring in Yellowknife, but here in May on the shore of the frigid Arctic Ocean, it still feels like winter. With the ice storm still threatening, the sooner they can unload and head home, the better. Let's get the hell out of here. Plane's good to go. Let's go to Whitehorse. In Watson Lake, the DC-3 crew is finally set to head to Whitehorse. Oh, yeah. It's a good town, Watson Lake. Not allowed to say anything other than that on TV. A successful test flight earlier today confirmed that the right engine with its new cylinder is running smoothly. Yes, Ritz. Be good, Buffalo 226, check you off at 2343, and have a good flight. During the 90-minute flight to Whitehorse, rookie co-pilot Andrew gets some flying time over the highest peaks he's encountered yet. And flying over mountains keeps a pilot on his toes. You're going to get a lot of uh, turbulence coming off the mountains, so you're going to have to take that into consideration. Because you get the wind and it goes on one side of the mountain, creates these they're called rotors over the other side. If you get caught in them, you can be pushed down pretty, pretty hard. Atmospheric rotors form when powerful winds sweep over a mountain ridge, creating troughs of intense turbulence along the lee side. These killer winds have been the cause of several deadly aviation disasters. And Whitehorse, it's uh, Buffalo 226. Nearing Whitehorse, Andrew still has to wrestle the gusty crosswinds. Runway 13 right, wind 120 at 10. To counter the ramp.
random blasts of wind. Andrew continually adjusts the ailerons on the wing to roll the plane into the wind as needed. At the same time, he works the pedals to move the rudder on the tail to keep the DC-3 flying straight. In modern airplanes, aileron and rudder coordination is interconnected. But on the DC-3, it's all up to the pilot's hands and feet. Looks like a bit of a gust coming over the escarpment. I'll be ready for downdraft as you come over this f***ing thing. I go up, I go down. On approach, Andrew fights one last battle with the wind. It's complete. You're good to my answer. Okay, I got her. Well done. Uh, Finally, they're in Whitehorse, 48 hours later than expected. Whitehorse, the capital of the Yukon, was founded in 1898 during the Klondike Gold Rush. Today, it's a city of 25,000 people and has a surprisingly vibrant art scene. It's also one of the best places to see the northern lights between late summer and early spring. Back on the tarmac, Andrew and John have a few hours before taking the charter passengers home to Yellowknife. Well, what do you want to do for the rest of the day? Just go drive around, man. Do some of the scenery? Yeah. Take some pictures? First stop on the sightseeing tour is a DC-3 mounted on a pedestal at the airport. They haven't cleaned the friggin' dirt off the tires. <laughs> it's one of the largest weather vanes in the world. That's awesome. The historic plane was built for wartime in 1942 and flew in India and China for the US Air Transport Command. After the war, the plane was outfitted for passengers by Canadian Pacific Airlines and later worked for two small Yukon Airlines before she retired in the late 60s. But not before this plane taught Joe his baby steps. Well, I went on the airplane in 1969, and that was the airplane I took my initial course on. I, I was trained as a DC-3 pilot on that aircraft. Everybody in the Yukon had flown on that airplane. Of course, it's, it's very fitting, and that is the gate guardian to their city. 1,200 kilometers northeast in Kugluktuk. Buffalo's DC-4 crew has delivered the building supplies and prepares for takeoff. Kugluktuk uh, Airport Radio, Buffalo 5718. Uh, for the return trip to Yellowknife, Arnie gives up the captain's seat to AJ DeCoast. So I'm on the tailor till 60 knots, right? Yeah. yeah. It's been nearly four years since AJ flew the DC-4. I'm all set, 394, sounds good. Power set. Give her a good pull and oh, yeah. there goes. Already a captain on the DC-3 and C-46, AJ is expanding the range of planes he can fly in Buffalo's fleet. Well, it seems like they got a need for, for DC-4 captains right now, so... Uh, I'm all for it. I think it'll be great. Amazing airplane. It's uh, got some uh, long legs on it. You can do some really long flights with it. And speaking of long legs, Scott is invited up to the cockpit again. For the second time today, he's getting much wanted stick time on the DC-4. He can hardly believe his good fortune. Is this a weird dream right now? All right, well, whenever you're comfortable, Scott, you can take control of her. Oh, okay, we're going to stay on the main tanks for the duration of the leg. Check. Most possible. Okay, so you have control. I have control. It's possibility number four ox tank may have a little bit of fuel in it. All right. While AJ is on the verge of becoming a captain on the DC-4, Scott is nowhere close to a checkout on this four-engine beast. There's still a lot for him to learn. Yeah, uh, fuel dump valve. Fuel dump valve right here. See that? Yep, that's the fuel dump valve. Does it operate on there? It does. It does? For Arnie, this is a rare chance to try out the passenger seating. I'm, uh, I'm having fun. Today was a fun day. You and the coolness of this machine. It's just awesome. No other way to put it. Yeah, it's pretty damn neat. You know, you got good days and bad days in Buffalo, but a day like today when you get to play with something like this, it's, uh, 
Put the smile on your face. For Scott, learning to fly a plane this big is a thrill. And even for AJ, piloting this vintage DC-4 never gets old. In Yellowknife, Rod is back at home. He spends most lunch and coffee breaks with his new daughter, Emma Ray. But today is special. She's going to visit Buffalo Airways. Baby Ray's in a kind of a first day at work and see what it's all about. So we gotta go get set up. I don't know if we should be wearing pink, but we'll give it a try. Okay, baby. You ready to wear more crap? Oh, there we are. Well, there's the baby. Okay, do this quick. Dad, quit pissing around. Do this quick. Stick your hand through. Ah, stretch. Ah. I had to dress Mikey one or two times, and he was a baby. So I don't know, I just stick a bag on him. But this is a little different. Came around an old Labatt's blue box. Time to go to the hangar. Hey. Oh, she looks great to meet everybody. Yeah. I love it, love it. Rod is needed back at the shop, so Sasha's driving Emma Ray to the hangar. There's such a great side of Rod coming out with this baby. Just a really soft, caring side that he doesn't seem to be too worried about showing, which is really nice, because I've always seen it in him, but, you know, I guess he's always been a little bit leery to, to really let it out. For Emma Ray's momentous first visit to Buffalo Airways, she's in good hands with Uncle Mikey. <laughs> hey, honey. I find babies pretty funny. I think babies are upset, and they got nothing to be upset about. You know, they sit there and they're all cuddled all day and everything. I like, oh, my life's so hard, I'm crying. Hi. Oh, oh yeah, oh. you're good. You're good, honey. Let's go see some airplanes? Oh, of sure. course. Smile. That should be good for her awesome. ears. <laughs> Mikey has a true McBrien sense of how to please a two-week-old baby. I'm going to see a C-46, Emma. Look, Emma, right? it's a C-46. There you go. Huh? Oh, there you go. He touched it. Back in Whitehorse, Buffalo's DC-3 taxis into position to pick up its passengers, who were still buzzing about their urgent landing in Watson Lake a few days earlier. Oh, it was uh, quite an adventure. We had a VIP stop at Watson Lake and had a couple of beers. <laughs> Great, other than watching smoke every once in a while. <laughs> but for a 75-year-old plane, I guess it's all right. Joe's strategy of getting his customers to their destination at any cost seems to have paid off. Are you familiar with Orange Six? And now they're flying home the way they came, on board one of Buffalo's classic DC threes. Homeward bound, it's smooth sailing for the DC three. At last. Although I didn't get to go fishing. I learned a hell of a lot from this trip, and I know that I'll take that with me uh, onto the next charter I, I go on, and uh, it's only going to be a progressive learning experience from here on out. Justin slides into final approach to the Yellowknife Airport. The charter passengers are delivered home safe and sound. We don't, at Buffalo, we don't get too much of a chance, you know, to haul passengers around. So whenever we get a government charter with government people, it's good to, to show the flag. Sometimes when you plan something, uh, the universe has a way of throwing a curveball at you. But everyone jumped in and, and helped out and got the job done.
on the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. This is my son, Mike. Joe and Mikey go shopping for a plane in England. It's a thin line between want and need. <laughs> but things get out of hand. <laughs> Scott's in trouble in the C-46. And gets stranded on an island. Is that fixable, Jimmy? On this episode of Ice Pilots and WT. This is my son, Mike. Father and son go shopping for a plane in England. It's lie between want and need. But things get out of hand. <laughs> Scott's in trouble in the C-46. And gets stranded on an island. It's June in Yellowknife Northwest Territories. Buffalo Airways boss Joe McBrien and his son Mikey are on the move to buy a plane. Me and the old man are heading down to England. Uh, there's an electric down there. I haven't seen it. Um, and it's supposedly uh, in fairly decent shape. Buffalo already owns two Electras for large-scale freight hauls. But they'll soon need to add more to their fleet for firefighting. Every summer for the past 15 years, Buffalo's been flying three Douglas DC-4s directly into the hot zones of the North's most intense wildfires. Equipped with belly tanks that hold 20,000 pounds of fire retardant, these planes are a key part of a lucrative government contract. But new regulations require faster, more maneuverable four-engine turbine aircraft like the Electra. Instead of the DC-4s and their radial piston engines. Basically, a uh, DC-4, you know, you know, brrrr, or Electra, get to the fire quicker. I tend to agree with them. The Electra will be a better airplane once it's on the fire, but you got to pay for it. So Joe and Mikey are heading to England to shop for a third Electra to convert into a water bomber. A major deal to negotiate. And Joe's bringing Mikey along to teach him the ropes. It's, it's a good experience for him to go over and learn how to deal with the people and how to, uh, how to buy and sell the parts in the airplanes. But I'm not going to be around forever. At Heathrow Airport in London, Good to see you again. Joe and Mikey meet up with American Electra expert Don Deo. <laughs> A driver takes them from London, 145 kilometers northwest, to Coventry the home of Atlantic Airlines. Don advised Joe when he purchased his first two Electras, and Joe has hired him again. Don Dale is sort of the guru of Electras. If you don't know Don Dale, don't try and operate Lockheed Electra. I've probably uh, worked with 30 to 40 of the different uh, Electras of the 170 that were built in one way or another. There she is, Don, heading number one. Yeah. Atlantic Airlines operates three Electras and has several more for sale. Joe is hoping to buy one that he can convert to a water bomber by adding a belly tank. Really sweet. Hope they're not as tired as we are. You know what I'm thinking? There's a pop machine in there. We don't have any, any pence. We don't have any pence. Well, let's find some washers. <laughs> Joe McBrien, no, Canada. No, that way. Oh, here we are. Nigel Hirons, Atlantic Airlines Director of Engineering, greets the Buffalo team. You know my son, Mike? 
This is my son, Hello. Mike. Hello. How you doing? Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. We acquired these aircraft in 2002, and we were going to convert them to the UK register, but the uh, demands of our customers changed, and uh, basically they've sat there ever since. Yeah, so they were sitting in here last time I seen it, eh? Joe knows what he's searching for. Over the years, he's developed the keen ability to spot a diamond in the rough. This airplane has sat for as long as it has here. Basically, our purpose here now is to look for any damage or corrosion issues that would have developed uh, since 2002. Like, that's corrosion if I've ever seen some. That corrosion is it, it's on an aileron. The corrosion we don't want is in this fuel bay where it, it teaks through the wing, and the fuel leaks out, and then the wing weakens like here. Right there. There, 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 all down here. Not a good sign, but electras are hard to come by. Uh, like five, six years ago, there was enough electras around that this wouldn't have been looked at. He's looking now, though. Without a third electra, Buffalo could lose its crucial firefighting contract. Meanwhile, back in Canada, Buffalo is in the middle of a big job based out of Thompson in northern Manitoba. Not Buffalo's usual territory, but the company that used to fly C-46s here has gone under. This could add up to a valuable expansion and a long-term contract in this province. They brought in Jeff Schroeder, a C-46 captain from here, to help pave the way. A little cross right now, thicker here, if you don't mind. You I've been flying the 46 for 20, 20 plus years. I can still get uh, goosebumps uh, when I fly. The past week, Jeff has been flying with Buffalo co pilot Scott Blue and mechanic Jimmy Essery. Each day, the C 46 has been shuttling cargo from Thompson to St. Teresa Point, an hour away. In winter, freight is normally trucked in on ice roads, but not this year. The ice roads this year in Manitoba were terrible. None of the supplies that the communities you know, rely on the ice road to get to them got in. Buffalo is clearing a huge backlog. It's going to take them weeks, so every day they have to get in as many runs as they can. Jeff, Scott, and Jimmy take off from Thompson with a full load. All right, 514, uh, we'll be there in one hour. Oh, way to start a day. Quick, yeah. Soon, the gravel airstrip at St. Teresa Point comes into view. We're going where? Over there? St. Teresa the runway is right there. Yeah. Buffalo 514 is five miles out, right base, runway 22, St. Teresa Point. It's short. At 3,400 feet, it's barely long enough to meet C-46 minimum specs. Plus, the plane's tall body and wide tail make it difficult to handle in crosswinds close to the ground. The C-46 is by far the most demanding aircraft that I believe anybody will ever fly. Three quarters of all the C-46s ever built to this date have been destroyed uh, during takeoff and landing. You know, that's where a pilot's uh, ability has to shine. Jeff has logged over 20,000 hours in a C-46, more than anyone else in Canada and possibly the world. Good one, Jeff. Happens once in a while. <laughs> On St. Teresa Point, the offload begins. This cargo includes much-needed building supplies for a new school. The materials are packed onto a truck, which boards a barge, and is delivered to the construction site on a First Nations reserve. With their cargo bay empty, the C-46 crew heads back to Thompson for another load. 
But they're not in the air long before. In northern Manitoba, noise from the left engine on a Buffalo C-46 has the crew on high alert. Leaving St. Teresa Point to head back to Thompson and the left engine just started doing the... Buffalo 514, what seems to be the issue? We're just assessing a few things at this time. Roger. Did you backfire to the carburetor, eh? Yeah. All Captain Jeff Schroeder has to go on are his ears, his eyes, and 20 years experience on these vintage aircraft. Uh, you make a mistake, uh, you're going to pay for it in the C-46? Yeah, we're going to pay for the sign of trouble. If they lose a lot of oil, they're headed for catastrophic engine failure and will have to land on just one engine. Jeff must get the plane on the ground fast. Come on. We're not declaring emergency this time. Roger. Buffalo 514, Thunder Bay Radio. Hey, we're heading over to uh, Island Lake, uh, 11 miles back. Uh, Less than 18 kilometers away, Island Lake is the closest place for an emergency landing. A tiny community, Island Lake has what Jeff needs most, an airstrip. Come on. They're safely on the ground. Now, they have to see how serious the problem is and whether they can get off this island. Let's get two herc straps out. Four herc straps are gonna get a loader to pull us out. Scott and Jimmy fasten straps to the wheel struts so it can be towed to the side of the tarmac. Not happy today at all. Apparently one of the vacation in Island Lake. Funny place to park, dude. Yeah. Hey, Rod, it's Scott. Scott checks in with Rod McBrien, director uh, of maintenance. Well, we, uh, we took off out of uh, St. Teresa there, and now we're just getting uh, into uh, climb power. And the uh, left engine just started banging like a son of a bitch. Oil was going down, and uh, so we shut it down. We turned around, and we're in Island Lake. Is that fixable, Jimmy, or is that done? I don't know. Can't tell until I open it up. We're just getting pulled off the runway right now. First step, pull the oil screen. Well, I'm going to still pull the screen and see if we did any damage in here. It should give a clue to what has happened in the engine. They use some fuel to wash the screen. A bad sign. The oil screen is full of metal shards. The type of metal will be the key to identifying the problem. You got us? Uh, hi, Rod. Yeah, we got real heavy, heavy metal, man. And what kind of metal? Uh, I don't have a magnet, but it looks mostly aluminum. I can't see any brass. Brass would indicate a serious engine failure. Is that it looks like aluminum. The bits of aluminum could have come from a broken cylinder or jug. They're scraped off as the piston rubs against the cylinder wall. The cylinder will need to be removed to fix the problem. Oh, jug, eh? We'll start looking for a uh, busted jug. We'll call you back. Like, it's a little greasy from the top. Huh? It's not, like, slathered in it, you it's know? It's not like a, a crack jug, eh? Scott and Jimmy don't see any signs of one. Next, to see if all the pistons are moving properly inside the 18 cylinders, Scott turns the prop to drive the pistons, but one piston is jammed. Number 14 piston is stuck right dead on top. No compression, nothing coming out of it. No, it can't be. The piston's not moving. Can you see the piston? Yeah. 
It hasn't moved. Now, they have to remove the jug to see what shape the number 14 piston is in. I can't get it moved. Another hitch. Time for some buffalo ingenuity. While Jimmy was up on a ladder, he's trying to wedge it, and I was trying to rock it back and forth and get it off. Couldn't wedge with a two by four or pry it off with a couple of big screwdrivers, so we uh, came up with the idea of uh, attaching a couple Herc straps to the cylinder, anchoring them on a pickup truck, and just start yanking on that, trying to pop it off. But the number 14 cylinder won't budge. OK, I'm going to button her up. Let's put a hook strap around it. For Rod McBrien, the timing couldn't be worse. Piston destroyed itself. A fairly rare occurrence for a C-46, believe it or not. There are still mountains of cargo to move for a new customer Buffalo does not want to lose. But I can't see a major oil leak here. But being 1,500 kilometers from Yellowknife could make this repair time consuming. At Atlantic Airlines in Coventry, England, Buffalo Joe McBrien is on the hunt for a Lockheed Electra. Joe needs another Electra to keep his summertime firefighting contract. We got a patches on this old girl, eh? Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Holy Mr. Man. And inside this airplane is the cargo interior. He knows how to look past the rust and loose wires to assess the true value of a plane. So somewhere over in the hangar to be the seats and a control wheel. These things, eh? That's what I don't like. I think they cut these things. I mean, that seems all pretty good in that. Holy shit balls. Mikey has come along to learn the fine art of airplane buying. But so far, he hasn't been much of a student. Think she'll work? Don't pull it. What? Don't pull it. <laughs> if he's supposed to be getting an education in airplane buying, can't get it off. I don't know, just off, no. He's not setting himself up for a passing grade. There we go. As Mikey rescues himself from the life jacket, Joe and Electra expert Don Deo check out one more plane. Uh had uh, a lot of experience with uh, moving these things after they've been stored for a long period of time. So I've managed to uncover uh, a lot of different things that you'll find when they sit for a while. You know, I was talking to the guy at Lockheed about, he said, if they cross over, you got to put it back on, eh? This airplane must have been uh, Air Japan at one time. Japan Airlines, I see some Japanese signals here. Yeah. You're looking for any signs of corrosion that is bubbling up in the planks, the six planks that make up the wing. Well, that type of uh, aluminum, you don't want to scratch it because it'll, it'll tend to crack. And if you have a rivet or a, a nail or something stuck in the sole of your shoe, it'll scratch that wing pretty bad. So the best just kick your shoes off. It's built to be light and go fast and, and be brittle. On a DC-3, DC-4 doesn't really matter, but these things, if you scratch them, they crack, eh? The Electra wing is designed to withstand stress, but its aluminum plank structure means even a one-inch scratch could require an eight-foot patch. One reason the Warhorse DC-4 has endured all these years is its I-beam rib structure, wrapped with a tough aluminum skin that can easily be repaired. Meanwhile, Mikey's found a new distraction. I love it when an airplane works. Uh All buttons. Hello. 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 Hey, the buffet aisle. This is kind of neat where they heated up all the meals and took them out for everybody. I don't know what that did, but it made a noise. <laughs> Holy, look at this. This is probably the safest spot to be, though, where the black box is. Mikey doesn't seem to be taking this trip too seriously, but it's serious business to his dad. I don't anticipate. A whole lot of problems. Murphy will be around. How's it doing? Are we getting some power Just, there? Just, uh, yeah, the aircraft flat at the moment. Joe may change his opinion after he gets Don's detailed report. It's my job to check it over and uh, give him a list of what I see uh, and what I think it's going to take to uh, bring it back into operational status. And then it's his, 
it is his job then to, to weigh all those facts and determine whether that's uh, the right thing for his operation and what he intends to do with the airplane. But it's quitting time at Atlantic Airlines. So a thorough inspection will have to wait until tomorrow. Only then will Joe find out if there's an Electra worth buying or if it's just 57,000 pounds of scrap metal. At a remote airstrip on Island Lake in northern Manitoba, a failed engine on a Buffalo Airways C-46 cargo plane has forced an emergency landing. Yeah, we got 31. Well, it looks like we got big problems with our engine. Connecting rod of the piston broken inside the cylinder. And until we get some heavier equipment uh, to pull the cylinder off, we won't know for sure. But at this time, it looks like possible engine damage, internal engine damage. Jeff, Jimmy, and Scott would have been stranded on Island Lake if not for their savior, Debs Burke. I just don't know what Scott's going to say. <laughs> That's my biggest problem. This should be awesome. Rescued by this you know, little 24 year old Kiwi girl. Can we get any luck here? <laughs> Dibs. Dibs. <laughs> the emergency food's in the front locker, which you can pick with anything. Um, <laughs> and there's five under my seat. Dabs is from New Zealand, but now flies an air taxi service for a small airline up here. Dabs was loving it. She was, uh, she was happy about rescuing the ice pilots. <laughs> Scott and the C-46 crew head back to their base in Thompson. The next day at Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife, mechanics load a replacement engine for the crippled C-46 on Island Lake. Well, uh, when there's a problem, then we have to basically mobilize a rescue or repair team. Buffalo Captain Devin Brooks will fly mechanics Adam Smith and James Dojak and a replacement engine to Manitoba and AVO, Buffalo's other C-46. Tilt forward, you're good. You don't have much room, just go slow. to get the new engine there fast. Buffalo can't afford a major delay in the contract. In England, Joe takes Mikey on a tour of Coventry's most famous historical landmark. The original Coventry Cathedral was built in the 14th century with red sandstone blocks. Today, it stands as a harrowing reminder of just how devastating aerial warfare can be. In World War II, a massive bombing raid, the Coventry Blitz, destroyed the cathedral's carved oak roof. Well, I've never been to a place that had been bombed out and cleaned up and left uh, so, you, so you could see the devastation of, a, of an air raid in nine, what, November 1940. They, they bombed at 500 airplanes. An initial wave of 13 German planes flew over Coventry to mark targets for the 500 bombers that followed. The German Luftwaffe dropped 500 tons of high explosives, killing an estimated 600 people and demolishing over 60,000 buildings. But miraculously, the cathedral's bell tower survived. At 300 feet, it is the third tallest spire in England. I don't get to a closer church too often. When I get there, I like to look at everything. You know? And for Joe, that means climbing the tower. All 195 steps. A perfect father and son activity. Ha ha! Holy smokes. Holy. That's a long hike. Blew the roof off, left the walls up, and they were smart enough to leave it as is so we could see it, eh? I gotta go check your altar. You wanna stay up here for a while, Mike? After taking in the sights, Joe and Mikey head back to Atlantic Airlines where he hopes to buy an Electra. But with a starting price of over a quarter million dollars, Joe needs to know if it's worth it. 
And determining that is up to Electra expert Don Deo. This is an airplane is built with a lot of aluminum, uh, so aluminum tends to uh, corrode uh, rather quickly. Eight years in, in inclement weather can uh, create uh, corrosion problems. So yeah, you can see the same thing here. She, she's beat up pretty bad. This looks like it's been skinned one time already. There are some spots that I found uh, down in the belly and uh, on the wings there that are gonna bear a real close second look. That's an add-on panel right there. That is, yeah. yeah. Don shows Joe what he's discovered. That big beam as it goes through there, See the one that comes up off the floor? Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of garbage there. Found by taking these things out, eh? Yep, they're all soaked in water. It looks like a moose nest in there. Yeah. Right in there? Where you got your flashlight. Yeah. Lay box. Yeah, that's aluminum. But that's not a showstopper, that one. Oh, no. no. That's just a nuisance one. Yeah. To people like Joe, uh, that uh, are looking at it as their next step in their business plan. Uh, it's uh, a good uh, core airplane that deserves a second chance, and uh, it's something that he can bring up to his standards and, uh, and operate uh, in his fleet. Yeah, that's, that's a changeable panel. Joe and Don are feeling positive about this Electra's potential as a firefighting water bomber. And Mikey, after his tiring walk through history, he's found a quiet place for a power nap. On Island Lake in northern Manitoba, the C-46 replacement engine has arrived for the stranded plane. Okay, back up slow. Buffalo mechanics James and Adams start removing the busted engine. I'd say this is a pretty big job for two people, especially to do it in a day and a half. They're on a tight timeline because AVO, the C-46 that brought them here, is needed back in Yellowknife tomorrow. Removing the damaged engine is simple. It's held on by just four bolts. OK, that one's gone. But step two is much more complicated. The new engine is just the bare bones, cylinders, pistons, and crankcase. All the engine's components, including fuel lines, starter, carburetor, and exhaust system, must be transferred from the old engine to the new one. I stole Chuck's magic wand before I left. So uh, we're doing pretty good here. And get to work on a tan. So when we go back, all the ladies will be all over us. <laughs> After several hours, the new engine is ready to be installed. But Adam and James are anxious about step three, testing the engine. You always got to figure in the F-up factor. I'm worried that when we first fire this up, that it just blow itself up. Yeah. <laughs> Adam and James have their hands full. And over in Coventry, England, so does Mikey. Holy On Island Lake, Manitoba, mechanics Adam Smith and James Dojak are ready to test the new engine they've mounted on the C-46. Claire? They need to get the plane shuttling cargo right away or face an angry client. Fire? But immediately on run up. Must have left something in there. You know what that is? What? That's the paint dust. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. False alarm. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. That's what it is. Hopefully, we get a satisfactory test flight. I can go home. Devin Brooks and Scott Blue will fly the test flight. Need more air? Nope, that's probably good. After an hour in the air, the crew brings the C-46 back down. It went really, really well. Everything was bang on. All is good. Takeoff RPM is perfect. The idle's uh, good at 600. Good. So three clicks was good enough. Perfect. We give it a really good test flight, and it, uh, I would fly it, so I'd say it's a go. You bet. Have a good one. I didn't break it again, so. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of kids from that show that went on to 
Someone now, Captain Jeff Schroeder and Scott can get back on the job. And with the faulty engine loaded up, Devin, Adam, and James can head back to Yellowknife in AVO. Six thousand kilometers away, at the airport in Coventry, England, Buffalo Joe has found a Lockheed Electra he wants to buy. Got some air in there, so we get yellow. Yeah. It's a thin line between want and need, but it's needed for the company to compete in the turbine world. The airplane came out of Alaska to to uh, the UK here. With that in mind, I know it'll do a very good job in the Northwest Territories, which is no different than Alaska. While Joe studies the Electra's logbook, Don Deo gives the landing gear a second look. The nose uh, landing gear, nose wheel assembly, obviously supports the entire front of the airplane when it's on the ground. And of course, during landing, uh, it takes a, a good shock loading on there. So I want to make sure that all the components down there are complete. Looking at the logbook here, made Anchorage, Alaska to Frobisher Bay in seven hours and two minutes. And then from Frobisher Bay to Coventry, England here, it was seven hours and 38 minutes. So you travel halfway around the world in 14 hours and 40 minutes. That's pretty impressive. So when you're ready to go out there, let me know and I'll go with you. Okay. With Joe and Don focused on the Electra, Mikey is on a different tack. It's World Cup playoffs, and Mikey's going to the pub with the boys from Atlantic. We were in England uh, just in time for a big uh, soccer match, which they call football. That's a whole kit, holy smokes. Yeah, drag your full face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if that's traditional. Watching the game English style means getting a paint job. <laughs> this is tradition. Looks fabulous. Who's next? You won't be the only one, I promise you. No? Perfect. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so we're, at, we're just heading out to the pub now and uh, see what kind of trouble we can get into. You got to go like that? Yeah, of course. When in Rome, right, you got to be like everyone else. It's a chance to schmooze the sellers from Atlantic Airlines and prove to Joe that he can help close the deal. But impressing the Brits is going to require all of Mikey's charms. Hang on a second. This is cool. Here we go. Here we go. In England, Joe McBrien has found a plane that could be the key to keeping Buffalo's lucrative government contract to fight forest fires. Thing is, no, I don't know if people in Germany will like me. With England's flag on his face, Mikey is going to the pub with the plane's owners to grease the wheels on the deal. He'd rather go socialize and look at stuff, so it's a good combination. <laughs> uh, my father doesn't uh, drink. He hasn't drank, I think, over like 15, 16 years. Um, sometimes deals are done in bars, so I guess technically that's my job is to go out and have fun with the boys. Hey, guys, what's happening? How's it going so far? Terrible. 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 Yep. Almost as bad as your face. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, a peen on her, that'd be an insult, right? <laughs> Turns out Mikey's the only one watching the soccer match with a face painted in England's colors. But he's not letting that phase him. <laughs> yeah, man, this is, this is awesome. Like, it, it definitely reminds me of uh, hockey back home. Like, oh. Except these people are crazy. <laughs> wins. But once the match is over, the real games begin. And everyone was happy, you know, the party moved outside and we started doing, uh, you know, traditional, I guess, English drinking games. Well, this is Mikey. He's about to partake in a, a children's activity, which is uh, strange for an hour of his age at this, uh, this time of year, really. Looking good. It's going to be a... Come on, oh. <laughs> Holy well done, sir. The balance board. Right here. Oh, yeah. You can do that with a beer. Yes. With a beer. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Beer. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
spilt his beer. Mikey's next. Oh, he's there. Yeah, for Canada! Mikey <laughs> puts Canada in the lead. But Beckham says for England. Yeah. <laughs> Get in there for England! Nothing cements an international business relationship like falling off a log. <laughs> Nothing, that is, except maybe a beer drinking challenge. Mikey, is this a drink off? No, 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 drink. Ah, my father will kill me. He legitimately. Never mind kill your me. father. We'll sort it He, he your showed father. me the knife. There's a tradition in England about drinking a yard of ale, which comes in a big tall glass with a bulbous bottom. Wait, how many pints? It's about one and a half pints, isn't it? That's not bad. The winner takes all. Takes what? National pride. I will put white on my face and a maple leaf. Oh, yeah! All Mikey has to do to be a winner is drink the Yard of Ale. I've seen one in a movie, but it was a boot. This time it was a, you know, like a big beaker. What the f is that? That's more than, how many pints is that? Four and, shit, Four and a half. Four and a half. He said it was a pint and a half. <laughs> oh, this is here awesome. we go, here 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 we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, you guys, what the f man? <laughs> Luckily, from the movies, I know that there's an air bubble. And you gotta spin the thing to uh, so the air bubble doesn't bounce back and the beer doesn't hit you in the face. Mission accomplished. Mikey has passed the test and charmed his English hosts. Spread on there, Mikey. <laughs> I suppose if you've got characters like Mikey in the background, it does make deals a little bit easier to do because you've got somebody there with a, a nice smile on his face and uh, who's not too serious with life. Is this a mate? <laughs> you feel like a good raspberry. You're my hero, man. <laughs> It's the last day of the Coventry trip. Decision day. Yeah, we don't know what's in these boxes, do we? All of them. Yeah, that's a brand new um, nose cover, the electrical prop down. Uh, so my uh, my father is right in his element right now. As you can see, he's uh, he's treasure hunting, which means he's out looking for parts. Oh yeah, we're treasure hunting. We're like ravens. If it's chrome, we'll pick it up. If it's shiny, we'll squirrel it away in our nest. Joe's been looking around the premises and he's, uh, he's been looking on every, every space we've got, roof, cabin, store, to see if there's anything he can, uh, he can acquire, because he's very interested in, in getting an inventory of stock. So what I need now... Do you see your tires? To keep his fleet of vintage planes going, Joe has been scrounging for parts for 40 years. Bit of a scavenger, yeah. But he, uh, he knows what he wants. There's a prop right there. Eh? There's three propellers there, complete ones. We need everything we can find, because sooner or later, that airplane's going to need it. With two Electras already back in Yellowknife and hopes that he'll be leaving Coventry owning another, Electra parts are gold. Always need spares for an Electra, so uh, they stopped making spares uh, 20, 30 years ago for most of the stuff, so when you can find it, uh, it's uh, always good. And Joe has hit the mother load. To an untrained eye, including myself, uh, it just looks like a bunch of scrap metal in here, um, but uh, he spent, you know, you know, lots and lots of hours. When we all went home and we're all at the pub, he stayed here and sorted this all out. These containers of parts will be shipped to Yellowknife, and Joe's ready to close the deal on the coveted Electra too. I say at this point, there's a good chance that uh, that he'll be able to get it out of here. Of course, we haven't run any of the systems yet, or the engines. That's the one condition. The plane systems must be operational, or else the deal is off. To determine if the systems are working, Electra expert Don Deo needs to get at least one of the engines started on a plane that sat idle for eight years. Yeah, Don's going to go fire the engines up, and if that's successful, uh, we might have a third uh, Electra in our fleet. 
which is exactly what Joe needs to stay in the firefighting game. It's a big moment. If there's any problems and Don can't start the engine, yeah, we won't even think that way. Joe and Mikey's flight home leaves London in just a few hours, so there's barely time for this crucial test. Best case scenario, she fires up. Worst case scenario, she starts on fire. Buffalo Joe McBrien and his son Mikey have traveled across the Atlantic hoping to buy an Electra to keep up with the demands of their crucial firefighting contracts. The only thing standing between them and a deal is one final engine test. Ready on one? Ready on one. Clear. Clear on Okay, one's in. We're just waiting for it to fire. It's just spinning on the air right now. The starter has the prop spinning, but the engine still hasn't fired. Temperature going up. Uh, I think something's wrong. The turbine is getting dangerously hot. 840, 850. But the turbine engine still hasn't ignited. Don Deo aborts. That engine just spun on the air start, which means, you know, when you're turning your car over and you can hear it going, rawr, 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 rawr. your car's not actually running, it's just running on the starter. And that's what that engine was doing. It was just running on the air. So even though it looked like it was running, it was just spinning. If the engine won't start, Joe's deal to buy the plane is off, leaving Buffalo's firefighting contracts in doubt. Hopefully they'll try it again here. Oh, we've got uh, just slightly over an hour before he wants to be on the road, so uh, we haven't got much time. <laughs> so, Go to number one again? Yeah, temperature's back down. Joe and Mikey wait anxiously on the tarmac. On they need to leave for Heathrow to catch their flight home. Ready out clear? OK. Buttons in. Success. The engine looks good now, so uh, second time, everything's a little looser, everything went a lot better. We got it up there, we're just fine. Got life in it again. She'll, uh, she'll fly another 50 years. This deal, worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, is done. After a thorough check, this Electra will cross the Atlantic in a few weeks and will fly Buffalo's colors fighting forest fires next summer. On the next episode of Ice Pilots and WT. Right, like to build it. Bombs away. Buffalo gets the drop on fire season. Okay, one sec. The McBrien's pack up a picnic table? for a family holiday like no other. Next stop, Oshkosh. And Buffalo bids farewell to beloved chief pilot Arnie Schrader. <laughs> This episode of Ice Pilots and WT. I would like to build it. Bombs away. Buffalo gets the drop on fire season. Okay, one sec. The McBrien's pack Our up table? for a family holiday like no other. Next stop, Oshkosh. And Buffalo bids farewell to beloved chief pilot Arnie Schrader. rolls up to the Yellowknife hangar. To some, it's just an old warplane, but to others, it's a superstar, worthy of a pilgrimage to the okay. Canadian North. Sir? How are you? Nice to meet you. Oh, you came down from the States? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's pretty crazy, eh? Yeah. What's your 
favorite airplane? The DC-3. I came oh, up well. here to fly on the DC-3. Right on. For 25-year-old yeah. aerospace engineer Kurt Bessel from upstate New York, this trip to Buffalo tops his bucket list. It's the airplane. It's, it's the great airplane. Several times a year, Buffalo receives visitors from around the globe. I'm trying to soak it in. Airplane buffs anxious to fly on the only daily DC-3 passenger service left in the world. Be able to see the prop spin. Oh, this is a treat. There you go. Another DC-3 fan's dream has come true. And this year is a special milestone for the DC-3. One that's on the mind of Kathy McBrien at Buffalo's Hay River Base. Yeah, hey, Dad, how's it going? Good. Hey, uh, just a quick question for you. I'm just trying to work out uh, the logistics again to Oshkosh. You, you still want to do that? In Yellowknife, Joe's not so sure. Yeah, right. Oshkosh, Wisconsin is the site of the world's biggest air show. Called Air Venture, the week-long extravaganza draws over half a million aviation fanatics. Oshkosh is a huge deal in the aviation world. Basically, it's the who's who of aviation. You can actually say it's the Super Bowl of, of the airline world. Joe's never gone, but this year, the air show is celebrating Joe's favorite plane. The DC-3, it's, it's turning 75 this year, and it's outlived uh, all the people that have designed it. 75 years ago in 1935, the DC-3, called the Douglas Sleeper Transport, made its first flight. Faster, more luxurious, and with more range than any plane before it, the three revolutionized passenger travel. But its real fame came when it got drafted into World War II. Gear laden paratroopers were transported by C-47. And... Known under the military designation C-47, the three's legendary toughness led to the expression, the only replacement for a DC-3 is another DC-3. Buffalo's been invited to bring a DC-3 for display at the Oshkosh anniversary party. And especially because we are the nostalgic, iconic DC-3 flyers in the world. So, you know, if anybody should be there, it should be us. They want us to know our arrival time. Kathy wants to make it a rare family vacation. The last trip I took with my family was Expo 86 for the 50th anniversary of the DC-3. You know, and uh, Rod and I pushed Mike around a little stroller all day. Well, you know what, Dad? Her plan starts with convincing Joe to wade into the crowds and schmooze with other proud airplane owners. That's the biggest pecker show in the world. Everybody in there showing off what they have. I got the most polished chrome of anybody, so putting a load of cargo in them and see what they can haul. That'll be the best. The least social of the McBrians, Joe would rather spend time with his dog, Sophie, than chit-chat with people. Picnic, barbecue. I don't know, <laughs> picnic, barbecue. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> did it again. Things up all the time. Gosh, you want me to go to Oshkosh? What the f do you want me down there for me, anyway? But Kathy's not easily deterred. With the show less than a week away, she needs to get Joe on side fast. I have this idea that I want to take this golf cart and bring it down, load it in DC-3, take it to Oshkosh. Because if she can make it easier for Joe to weave through the air show crowds, he might agree to go. If he had the golf cart, then he can just have the freedom just to tour around and drive to the farthest reaches of the airfields to the, the next furthest. Hey, Pistol. Hello. How's it going? And Kathy's hitting her friend's print shop because she wants to do it all in style, buffalo style. What, uh, and you'll just design the whole skin, eh? Whatever you want, yeah. Well, it's gotta be green and obnoxious. You need to have the word buffalo on there. Making the cart extra visible is another part of Kathy's grand plan, wrangling Joe. Finding Joe at an air show, you just, it's like finding Waldo. Cause I've traveled with him enough and I've lost him lots of places. So if I put him in a big bright golf cart, the big orange flag, I can find him. <laughs> so that, that's my plan. It's either that or a GPS track, and then I don't think he'll go for that. But back at the hangar in Yellowknife, Mikey's got some news that could kill the trip before it even begins. Yeah, we, uh, 
Uh, Sophie's there in the hospital right now. Joe's dog Sophie has been hit by a truck. Today was a pretty busy day, and uh, you know we're all running around. And Sophie got out, and she was in the parking lot, and she met up with a couple other dogs, and they kind of did like a pack formation. And Jacques the carpenter was coming around the corner, didn't see them, and basically I heard yelping and a bunch of smoke. And when I looked over, uh, Sophie was flopping around on the ground like a, like a fish in a boat, and I was like, holy shit. Huh? What? What happened to Sophie? Well, she was uh, in the Word backyard. spreads through the hangar. Was, uh, I was like, I was starting to pass out because by the time I got there, you know, her arm, like her skin was peeled back. And I thought her leg was broken, but it, luckily it wasn't. But you could see the bone, the tendons uh, and everything. Oh, you poor guy. <laughs> I picked her up, put her in the back of Jacques' truck, and we booted her to the animal hospital. And the doctor is just like, holy smokes, it's did three hours of surgery. Is but she strong enough for that? Who knows? Sophie might have been strong enough in her prime, but she's almost 13 now. I got her when she was uh, just a few months old. She was an animal rescue pup I picked up in a red deer. She looked like she needed a home, so I took her. She's been at Joe's side ever since. Hey, what do you think? What do you think, hey? What do you think, old dog? Hey, what do you think? Come on, sit up, dear. Used to love to sit up there all day. Now I probably can't get up there. Come on. Sophie is my father's longest running uh, co pilot. That's it. Oh, it's hard to get up there now, isn't it? Look at that. You still do it, eh? Yeah, that's a girl. She's a special dog. They develop a personality. And Sophie has a following of people because she's a happy dog. And, um, uh, but she is, um, she's an old woman, you know. Too old to survive if she has to lose her leg. It's hard news for Joe to hear. I thought she was goner. But luckily, we ran over there and, uh... Well, she can't handle that. It's like, like an old man breaking his foot. She dies, and it, it takes all her strength to recover. Right now, the vet's giving her a 50-50 chance. The doctors gave her a year to live about a year and a half ago, the same doctor. Um, so she's on borrowed time, and it's a shame that something like this uh, would bring her down when it should be old age. And if Sophie doesn't survive this emergency surgery, there's no chance Joe will be in any mood for a family holiday. No, I don't think so. I told doctor, I don't care. Just do whatever has to be done, right? Now they have to wait to find out if Joe's most loyal co-pilot has flown her last mile. It's morning on the Buffalo Airways ramp in Yellowknife, and Buffalo Joe has only one thing on his mind. Yeah, we're just heading down to the animal hospital to see how Sophie's making out with her recovery. Joe's dog Sophie's just had emergency surgery to repair her injured leg, and now he has to see whether she's going to be OK. She's had a good 12 years, so if, if she's going to suffer, we would we, have sent her off to that big dog house in the sky. Mikey meets Joe outside the clinic. They're both bracing for the worst. Hi. You, put, you put my old dog Chelsea. together again? Well, it was pretty bad this time. Hey, so. Sophie. Oh, so. Hey, so. Sophie. Hey, Sophie. What an old woman you got to be. Come on, so. Yeah, okay, okay. So. What happened to you? Sophie. Her legs stitched up and bandaged, Sophie is in surprisingly good shape. <laughs> The old lady got run over, eh? What do you think? What do you think? Look at that. How did you get both your feet under the car tire at the same time? How did you do that? How did you get them both in there? Eh? Jesus Christ, you stink like an old dog. She's as happy as a puppy to be back with her captain. Hey, let's see if we do that step in hand. You know where the door is, at least. And all she wants is to go home with Joe. She should be. First cabin all the way, front seat. Well, she's sitting in the front seat. Oh, yeah. She looks very alert, happy. She'll be OK. With Sophie on the mend, the McBrien family can now go ahead with the plans for getting to Oshkosh. But first, they have to convince Joe that it's worth going. A thousand kilometers south, 
Buffalo is gearing up for forest fire season. Every summer, they fly four CL-215 water bombers for the Northwest Territories government. A wet season across the north can keep them on standby, a dry one, and the bombers fly almost non-stop. Man getting the pilots ready and retrained on the CL-215 water bombers is Buffalo Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader. Ready to do some scoop in there, Arnie? Betcha. Right on. Training is a chance for Arnie to get out from behind the chief pilot's desk and back in the air. Paperwork, all that stuff is the most difficult part about it. Flying is relaxing. Once you get the wheels in the well, then you don't have all these problems. Eh? You forget about them for the day. Buffalo's still trying to get through some red tape to buy another water bomber they found last winter in Venezuela. But for now, training for fire season goes on. Arnie is helping rookie bomber pilot Dan Catoni approach the lake at just the right angle as he descends to scoop a load of water. Throttle it off, throttle it off. For 10 seconds, this airplane becomes a boat skimming along the surface of the water at 140 kilometers per hour. Right there. Right there. Hold it long. After scooping up over 5,000 liters of water, there's your speed. Dan has to accelerate to almost 200 kilometers an hour to get back in the air. Three, two, one, one. After dumping the water through the belly doors, Dan guns it to get through the sudden weight change. Drive it like you spilled it. That's what you're going to do if you're on a fire. Yeah. But it's not just the rookies who need to get back in shape. Oh, man, it's always a riot flying this thing. I just love it. Water bomber veteran Justin Simley is also getting a refresher from his mentor. Training pilots is not easy. There's a lot that can go wrong. You know, you need a special type of person. That for the water final check, sir. Yeah, it looks good. Drop it, sir. Come ahead now. There's hundreds of pilots out there flying for airlines that owe everything they have to Arnie for training them to be safe. Okay. Three, two, one. Bombs away now. Flight power flat. But as training winds down, Arnie has some big news for Justin. Arnie reveals that his days as trainer and chief pilot are almost over. Well, the plan is to, I got my cousin coming up. He's got a big diesel one ton, you know, so he's going to tow a trailer for me. This will be Arnie's last prep for fire season as chief pilot. After 25 years at Buffalo, he's moving south to British Columbia. We uh, received a letter from Arnie uh, stating that he's going to be uh, uh, basically retiring from Buffalo, so. We're moving to a place called Winfield. We're getting a house built there now. The climate's pretty good. It's the closest thing in California you're ever going to get in Canada. I mean, you still get a little winter, but it's so mild here. Right on. Barney's worked pretty hard for Joe for the last 20 years or something, and he's uh, he's decided to retire. Build a house in Kelowna, and uh, I think he's really looking forward to it. Holy frick, Kathy! Shit! Don't do that, Kathy! It's tipping. Are you retarded? How are you supposed to lean into the turn? <laughs> These things flip. I've seen jackass. Oh, relax. <laughs> On the tarmac in Hay River, Kathy's tricked-out Buffalo Airways golf cart is a hit. That's crazy. Just in time for the McBrien family vacation departure day. Well, that's pretty cool. To the zoo. Bowing to family pressure. Joe has agreed to fly them to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, for the aviation world's largest gathering. He's happy to put his favorite plane on display, but actually attending the Air Venture Air Show is another thing. Because it's the 75th anniversary of the DC-3, they're going to be conspicuous by my absence. So I'm only flying the airplane down there. I'm not partaking in that. Um, dog and pony show. I have no interest in that. There's no real such thing as a holiday with my father. I think he just feels guilty from being away from the hangar. We did this 25 years ago at the Expo. Uh, next time I do, I'll be 91. They can take me. The whole McBrien family is going, including Joe's wife, Sharon. Oh, we'll try. Yeah. See you, Peter. 
Okay. That's okay, baby. Everyone except Joe's son Rod, his wife Sasha, and their new baby Emma Ray. I'd rather just get the 215s up and running than uh, wander around the air show aimlessly with the newborn, so. But for everybody else, it's full steam ahead. A little overkill. We don't go light anywhere. It's a good thing that the family station wagon can hold about 7,000 pounds. I have a picnic table? Uh, where in the this f is one. this thing going? I wonder if I could be the only people with an air conditioner. Do you remember the Beverly Hillbillies? He replaced the car in a bunch of yokels who had a DC-3 with a bunch of rednecks. Well, everyone's here, my sisters, my uncle, my mom, my grandma, my grandpa, my great uncle. Pretty family oriented. But you can't have a family road trip without fighting kids. Mikey's into it with nephew Kenny. Oh, there obviously is somebody sitting there. Mom, what? There was, Did Mikey kick your knee out of his seat? There was an empty seat and I sat down. Yeah, with my pillow and everything in there. Come on. <laughs> it's starting now, isn't it? I know, that's what I said. <laughs> you should see us go fishing. <laughs> The only non McBride along for the ride, co pilot Sean Barry. Joe's right hand man all the way to Oshkosh. I think as soon as we get down there, he'll, he'll have a blast. So we're rolling. We're on our way. The McBride family adventure is up and running. In Yellowknife, Justin Simley is home from water bomber training. Trixie! Nice tail. And he's come to help his friend and mentor, Arnie Schrader, prepare for his big move. Still a couple of weeks away. Hey! OK, go! Arnie wanted to wait a few years before settling down south. But this winter, he found a compelling reason to move up the date because our daughter has uh, cancer. There's a cancer clinic right close there, so that was the major reason to move into that area. No. Look good. You feel good? Director. Yeah, good for you. You've got that big, beautiful house down there. You'd be able to just claim the whole basement. That's what you should say. It would Tell suck, Arnie, say. I was supposed to share it with my brother. And now he doesn't. Yeah. Well, you'd rather share it with your brother? Yeah. But you guys fight all the time. I don't, not anymore, now that we're big. Oh. Arnie's 15-year-old daughter, Caitlin, has been battling Hodgkin's lymphoma for the past six months. They're waiting to hear if her last round of treatment has been successful. But Arnie's already made his decision. I've been in Yellowknife a long time. I've got another daughter and four grandchildren here, so it was tough to decide to move. Oh, yeah, I'll miss the old bastard for sure. Yeah, yeah it, won't, it won't quite be the same. Buffalo will need to find a new chief pilot. There's going to be some huge boots to fill when he's gone. You just can't find people with 40,000 hours flying experience on the street, all northern time, all old airplanes. OK, we'll see you later, Arnie. Yeah. Take it easy, Matt. In the air over northern Alberta, the McBride family road trip is well on its way to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and the world's biggest air show. This seven-hour leg of the journey takes them 2,500 kilometers southeast across Canada and over the U.S. border to Grand Forks, North Dakota. They'll stay the night there and finish the trip to Oshkosh tomorrow. But as they reach Grand Forks, Joe changes the game plan. Yeah, my father really wanted to get there all in one day. Flying down there in a DC-3 was quite cozy, where, you know, once you leave the ground, uh... Uh, you're on your own for 10 hours. It's, it's a, a quite a relaxing, easy-going trip. Like all road trip dads who just want to get from A to B in record time, Joe wants to press on and finish the trip tonight, even though they'll have to spend the night in the plane when they get there. All the arrangements I made for accommodations weren't until Sunday. So, Kathy, okay, going to Oshkosh today? Joe's the pilot, the captain. He makes the decisions, and we we go by them. Our supreme oppressor. Yeah. 
That's Buffalo democracy. Joe ignores any protest and flies three hours farther south into the U.S. But as they close in on Oshkosh, they're about to find the flaw in his last minute change of plans. During the week-long air show, the Oshkosh Airport has a strict landing curfew, and it's only 10 minutes away. This is looking good uh, for you to be here by 8 o'clock. It'll be a race to the tarmac. You say I gotta be underground with my engine shut down at 8 o'clock sharp? That's correct. Attention all aircraft, Oshkosh Tower will be closing in five minutes, five minutes. And where did I go if you're a couple minutes late? Being late's not an option. He needs to be on the tarmac and parked before the strict airport cutoff. Joe tries to smooth talk his way in. He made some comment, turn your radios off, you don't need to know. Get a coffee, we're landing regardless. Uh, uh nice try. Once you get the airport down, there's nothing we can do about it. Air traffic control isn't playing, and Joe can't legally land without their say-so. Still, Joe's determined. But what will come first, clearance or curfew? Where did that runway start at? There's the markers now. Papa November Romeo, what's your position northwest of the airport now? Papa November Romeo, estimating four minutes. Joe's about to find out if the tower will give them the go-ahead or turn them away. We got in at 8 o'clock, like right on the dot. I think we're the last plane that, that got in. Hi. Hi. Uh, come on down. After a marathon day of flying, the McBrien family has made it, just under the wire. In Yellowknife, Arnie is gearing up for a DC-4 run to the high Arctic. He still has a few weeks before leaving the north. Oh, we're just hauling some fuel up to Saks, and then we're going to go to New Beacon Hall. Four trips. They're doing a survey up there for a month or so. So this will be one of Arnie's last trips as chief pilot. Justin has already declared he's not interested in the job. He'd rather stick to flying. He flies good. That leaves AJ DeCoast as the prime candidate to replace Arnie. Flying is Buffalo. More or less, most of the airplanes that Buffalo flies have had the chance to operate. Today, he'll be Arnie's co-pilot. And if this mission goes well, Arnie will greenlight AJ as a captain on the DC-4, adding another plane to his roster. This is his final checkout flight, yeah. yeah. And he'll be very happy to have that happen. <laughs> All clear. Sean has given us the signal there, so. Arnie and AJ are heading 1,500 kilometers north to Saks Harbor to deliver their load of fuel to a survey team. We might see it anyway. It looks like it's getting thinner as we go up there. All right, so looking for the shore. Okay. Let me know when you see it. Arnie will see how AJ performs landing this fully weighted DC-4 on a short strip. I can see it now. Yeah, go to 2250. All right, sir. I'm up here, so. Yeah, so we're going to get the runway inside, eh? I got our sight. Yeah. Six, everybody about full flight. Seven, one, three, turn, follow one by two, six. There's 97. There you go. AJ nails the landing. You're doing good. AJ's already a step closer to the left seat of the DC-4. 
and to being a top candidate for chief pilot. Well, still, it's a pleasure to join you up here today. It's morning in Oshkosh, and the hundreds of thousands who will participate in the air show of the year, Air Venture, are starting to file in. Yeah, rigs are off. Buffalo's plane will join nearly 50 other DC-3s to mark its 75th anniversary. And organizers have reserved a spot in the main square for Buffalo's workhorse, a huge honor. You're at the biggest air show in the world, and you're picked uh, to be on center stage is a huge honor. DC2. Never ever thought I'd see one of those. It was pretty surreal. You're in some pretty big company when you look around. There was some pretty remarkable airplanes. These DC7s, B17s, DC4s. There are 10 times more people here on the ground than the entire population of the Northwest Territories. We only have a population of 42,000 for the top half of Canada, so it's quite overwhelming that many people. Joe hoped to keep a low profile. Good morning, everyone. We're in front of the DC-3 from Buffalo Airways. But suddenly, he and his plane are in the spotlight. We got this DC-3 we stand in front of in 1978, so I guess I've been flying this airplane 32 years. Our airplane was really the only working airplane. We, we pulled on the ramp with all last week's grease and oil on it. All the trees there were museum pieces or private collection, polished, beautiful to the detail. Ours was dripping oil, dirty. Buffalo is really the blue collar airline. Um, and I think people really relate to that. Um, so when we got there, people were really excited about us. It's Nice, nice to meet you. Oh, you're right done. <laughs> when you have a museum piece right there, it's beautiful. But the plane goes to the museum, the war veterans go home. Uh, we don't go home, we go back to work. And I think that's really what people related to. Yes, sir. The working class plane and the legendary aviator are a huge hit. <laughs> so thanks for staying hi, Doug. Well, well, hey, hey. And for now at least, he's handling the DC-3 fans just fine. Right in a hurry. Look at that, look at that, look at that. What doesn't get better than that? <laughs> and then... A bunch of old guys showed up. And they're all, you know, wearing their jackets and stuff. They're the Band of Brothers. They jumped in Normandy. They jumped all over Europe. These guys are real heroes. Glenn Derber, Ed Shames, and Fred Ballow. They're the reason we don't speak German today. They're part of a legendary group of World War II paratroopers who helped immortalize the DC-3. And I was like, holy crap, like they have, like, there's a show on TV dedicated to those guys, the Band of Brothers that flew DC-3s and jumped out of them. And these are the real guys. They jumped out of C-47s all the time. This, this Stop exactly. Stop shoveling it, will you please? Come on. <laughs> and what struck me about them is they were hilarious. They were cracking jokes. Oh yeah, this is the one I jumped out of in Normandy. My footprint's right inside. <laughs> The whole McBrien family is in awe of these 86-year-old war heroes. Pleasure meeting you. Oh, pleasure meeting you. It's not so Give me your hand. Don't yourself, really. <laughs> but what impresses the veterans is the same thing that impresses everyone else. They run here every day. Every day. This, this plane itself runs every day. Runs every day. He remember to uh, oh, yell at like 700. Buffalo has earned its place of honor. And even Joe's been swept up in the spirit of Oshkosh. Now he wants to see all that this dog and pony show has to offer. He was like a little kid, you get lost in the mall. Saw something shiny and just ran. And that's exactly what Joe's family didn't want to happen. Five hundred kilometers away in the air, south of Saks Harbor, Northwest Territories, the DC-4 is on its way home to Yellowknife, with Buffalo's possible new chief pilot at the controls. Well, I'll tell you honestly, AJ, I'll be glad to get out of it. But Arnie has some words of caution about taking the job. 
feel like responsibility and every time there's a problem that gets shoved onto your shoulders. I'm not pushing him into it because, you know, he's, he really wants to fly lots and this job entails quite a bit of paperwork. And that could be a problem for a pilot who's only 29 years old. Yeah, I'll do it. That's uh, not necessarily where, where I see myself naturally. I'd be more, you know, in an airplane or operating a piece of equipment. AJ still wants to spend the next few years in a cockpit, not at a desk. But there's also a part of me that's thinking, OK, you know, this company's given me a lot of experience. Just flat out say no, kind of feel a little bit wrong about that, you know? AJ has to make a hard decision about his future, but he's not the only one with a lot on his mind. We should have some news about her uh, by Friday, I think, you know? This is the week Arnie and his family are due to receive the latest test results on Caitlin's cancer. The day we left, they went the night before to Edmonton. Yeah. She was getting her uh, x-ray and the knife, uh, a hand scan and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. The results will tell them if her most recent round of treatment has been a success. At home in Yellowknife, there it is. Arnie's wife Janet already has the news. Uh, hi, could you give me Arnie Schrader's room, please? No. Nope. No luck. But Arnie's in no position to receive it right now. It's too bad you had to be out of town while that was going on, and you know, not, yeah. not really knowing, not being able to communicate too well. Yeah. Well, let's hope the news is good. Yeah. Airways DC-4 returns to Yellowknife. Now in the co-pilot seat, Arnie Schrader doesn't know that there's important news waiting for him on the tarmac. No, that looks like my car. Well, that's Caitlin and uh, Janet. Huh? His wife Janet and daughter Caitlin have come to the ramp to give Arnie the news about Caitlin's cancer test results. So something's up. News that will make all the difference as he starts his new life. Hi. Fancy you guys meeting us. Isn't that amazing? It is. What's up? Hey, how are you doing? I have to tell you something. OK. Oh, yeah. It's gone. That's wonderful. Yeah. Are you happy? So happy. I cried like half a day yesterday. <laughs> And what about mom? Probably. She cried the yeah. <laughs> now Arnie can head south with his biggest worry out of the way and enjoy his new freedom. <laughs> Caitlin's got yeah, cancer there. You know, our priorities changed, eh? Work wasn't everything anymore. There is other things that are more important. Arnie is hoping AJ can take over as chief pilot when he leaves. Was it good for you, AJ? Oh, yeah, it was good for you. <laughs> Now AJ has to figure out if he really wants to go for the job. Yeah. Now you got a now you got a four place stroller. The next day, back at the DC3 birthday celebration at the Oshkosh Air Show, Mikey's on his way to a very important event. Well, we got uh I got, we got a big forum to go to, uh, I guess, explain stuff about Buffalo and what we do. And of course, Joe's missing. And he's not lost, which is exactly where he wants to be, but yeah. we just don't know where that is. We're just looking around here. Joe's supposed to be the star attraction at the Q&A, but he's more interested in seeing than being seen. I mean, you got 13,000 airplanes, and, and the displays were phenomenal. I mean, you couldn't see it all the time we were there. But Joe seems determined to try. I don't know, I've just been telling everybody, if you see a guy walking around with a shirt on, unbuttoned to his belly button, really red in the face, toss him some sunscreen and call Kathy. Mm -hmm. I'll be you. Sure. And a red face. Joe's grandson, Kenny, tries to pick up his trail. I guess Joe's not here. This is definitely the place to find him. No sign. Who are you looking for? <laughs> Joe. I haven't, Buffalo Joe, yeah. we haven't seen him. I would, I, I would recognize him if I saw him, but he has not been through here. Oh, OK. Can I stand there with you? Oh, uh, fantasies. I'm already, I'm having you, visions. We're putting you in the middle. Oh. 
At the forum stage, the fans are waiting and the clock is ticking. Uh, there are two golf carts out there roaming the streets looking for him. Is that neat? I think he enjoyed himself because he could disappear into the background. You know, he could he go talk to people and run around and 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 not have to worry about like anything. Like in the hangar, you know, everything's his responsibility. But at Oshkosh, he was just one of 500,000 people, and you could just kind of you know disappear. Mikey's mingling with the eager Buffalo fans, and with the Q and A due to start, it looks like he'll be flying solo on stage. Then, at the last minute, hey, big guy, what do you got me into now? Just together, please. Once again, Joe squeaks in under the wire. I was wondering how the business itself had started. I wouldn't go to school and I wouldn't listen to anybody. I had a bad attitude. So, right off the bat, you buy an airplane. <laughs> well, if you, if you look at the area we operate in, we operate at the end of the roads. The airplane is really a necessity. Maybe here to own an airplane would be a luxury. Is there a lot of competition? Is there a different? Well, there's lots of competition. There's five or six uh, companies that are doing the same type of work in the same area. And I guess at one time, they may have all had DC-3s or DC-3 type equi equipment. Uh, question for Joe. Uh, just wondering how many flying hours you have to date. I knew somebody sometime was going to ask me that. <laughs> I'd say somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 hours. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, folks. All right. Now, as far as Joe's concerned, he's fulfilled his final obligation. I'm just on a, on a mission now to get back, get something to eat, and get out of here. I got to move my airplane tonight. Joe has seen enough. He wants out of Oshkosh now. We wanted to beat the rush out. I mean, you dispatch 13,000 airplanes, you're going to be there a long time. And we've been gone long enough. He really got into it. But he'd be in short bursts, you know? He'd be like, I'm really interested. I really like it here. I want to go home. The rest of the family is just as ready. Yes, ready to go home. It's just like, you know, when you take your kids to Disneyland, you're just like so excited to get there. And after a few days, you want to just punch Goofy in the frickin' face. It's time for this rare working DC-3 to get back home and back to work. Gosh, gosh, man, it's uh, going to pop in November home, you DC-3. But after basking in the limelight, Mikey's already got his mind on next time. They said they hadn't seen a C-46 there, and if there was one there, it was been a long time ago. So we're hoping to, uh, you know, flash up the AVO and bring her there next year. Pop in November home, you know, Joe, on the other hand, is happy to wait for the next big birthday. I'll be back for the 100. Yeah. My dad's only 25 years older than I am, so another 25 years if I'm in the same, well, I'll be in the same shape he is, so I can still go. Let me take off, uh, my dad's self to seven. And the uniquely McBrien family vacation comes to a close. Back in Yellowknife, it's almost time to say goodbye to an old friend. <laughs> It's a new day in Yellowknife. The McBrien's are back home. Now it's time for an historic send-off. Mobile DC-3, wind C-4-0, 10 gusting 20, clear to land, runway 33. Clear to one, clear to land, 33. The DC-4 is on its way back from a food and mail run up the Mackenzie Valley. The delivery was routine. The flight, anything but. It's Arnie Schrader's last flight as chief pilot before he moves the family to British Columbia. So Buffalo and the airport fire crew are setting up a little surprise, a traditional salute to retiring pilots. You know, airlines down south do this thing where they park trucks out in front of uh, the taxiway and they, they spray an arc. Uh, so Arnie, uh, being the closest thing to an airline pilot that we have, uh, we try to give him the right send off. Everyone wants to pay tribute. Nobody more than Arnie's best friend at Buffalo, Kelly Jurasevich. You know, I think he's going to be very missed by a lot of people. And I think Buffalo Joe might even shed a tear. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I'm not going to bet money on it, but... <laughs> when his ass is southbound out of here, and it, it'll probably be the, um, 
the last good hands and feet you'll see in Yalne for a long, long time. I right now, Joe's in the air, but everyone else is there as Arnie taxis to the hangar, unaware of the surprise that awaits him. Get the guy fire truck there. What the is going on? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good for the freighter tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no more buffalo. No more buffalo. That's no what mo buffalo. mostly what I'm happy about. No. <laughs> maybe I'll have a husband again. Just maybe. Janet's gain will be a big <laughs> loss for Buffalo. How can they replace a guy who's irreplaceable? Yeah, I don't think he'll ever really be replaced. You know? I guess they'll have someone to fill his position. It possibly could be me. Buffalo's new chief pilot is still a big question mark, but Arnie's place in Buffalo history is carved in stone. Well, Ar Arnie is part of Buffalo. He's been here as long as I can remember. Arnie's had a long flying career, flew all different types of airplanes for a whole whack load of different companies. Um, but he found a home here at Buffalo. Me and everything to me. I'll miss the people. Yeah. Well, you know, I've enjoyed it here, right? Eh? 